Chapter One of the Cat of Bubastes, a Tale of Ancient Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty. Chapter One: The King of the Rebu. The sun was blazing down upon a city on the western shore of the Caspian. It was a primitive city, and yet its size and population rendered it worthy of the term. It consisted of a vast aggregation of buildings, which were for the most part mere huts. Among them rose, however, a few of more solid build and of higher pretensions. These were the abodes of the chiefs and great men, the temples and places of assembly. But although larger and more solidly built, these buildings could lay no claim to architectural beauty of any kind, but were little more than magnified huts, and even the king's palace was but a collection of such buildings, closely adjoining each other. The town was surrounded by a lofty wall with battlements and loopholes, and a similar but higher wall girt in the dwellings of the king and of his principal captains. The streets were alive with the busy multitude, and it was evident that although in the arts of peace the nation had made but little progress, they had in everything appertaining to war made great advances. Most of the men wore helmets closely fitting to the head, and surmounted by a spike. These were for the most part composed of hammered brass, although some of the headpieces were made of tough hide studded with knobs of metal all carried round shields, those of the soldiers of leather stiffened with metal, those of the captains of brass worked with considerable elaboration. In their belts all wore daggers, while at their backs were slung quivers of iron, painted bows hung over one shoulder, and some had at their waist a pouch of smooth flat stones and leather slings. Their chief garment was a sort of kilt falling to the knee. Above the waist some wore only a thin vest of white linen, others a garment not unlike the nightgown of modern times, but with short sleeves. The kilt was worn over this. Some had breastpieces of thick leather confined by straps behind, while in the case of the officers the leather was covered with small pieces of metal, forming a cuirass. All carried two or three javelins in the left hand and a spear some ten feet long in the right. Horsemen galloped about at full speed to and from the royal palace, while occasionally chariots, drawn sometimes by one, sometimes by two horses, dashed along. These chariots were small, the wheels not exceeding three feet in height. Between them was placed the body of the vehicle, which was but just large enough for two men to stand on. It consisted only of a small platform, with a semicircular rail running round the front some eighteen inches above it. A close observer would have perceived at once that not only were the males of the city upon the point of marching out on a military expedition, but that it was no mere foray against a neighboring people, but a war on which the safety of the city depended. Women were standing in tearful groups as they watched the soldiers making toward the gates. The men themselves had a resolute and determined look, but there was none of the light-hearted gaiety among them which betokened the expectation of success and triumph. Inside the palace the bustle of preparation was as marked as without. The king and his principal counsellors and leaders were assembled in the great circular hut which formed the audience-room and council-chamber. Messengers arrived in close succession with news of the progress and strength of the enemy, or with messages from the neighboring towns and tribes, as to the contingents they had furnished, and the time at which these had set out to join the army. The king himself was a tall and warlike figure, in the prime of life. He had led his warriors on many successful expeditions far to the west, and had repulsed with great loss the attempts of the Persians to encroach upon his territory. Standing behind him was his son, Amuba, a lad of some fifteen years of age. The king and his counsellors, as well as all the wealthier inhabitants of the city, wore, in addition to the kilt and linen jacket, a long robe highly colored and ornamented, with fanciful devices, and having a broad rich border. It was fastened at the neck with a large brooch, fell loosely from the shoulders to the ankles, and was open in front. The girdles which retained the kilts and in which the daggers were worn were highly ornamented, and the ends fell in front and terminated in large tassels. 
all wore a profusion of necklaces bracelets and other ornaments of gold many of the chiefs wore feathers in their helmets and the greater portion of all ranks had figures tattooed on their arms and legs they were fair in complexion with blue eyes their hair was for the most part golden or red and they wore their beards short and pointed the young prince amuba was attired for the field his helmet was of gold and his cuirass covered with plates of the same metal he listened with suppressed impatience to the arguments of his elders for he was eager to be off this being the first time that he had been permitted to take part in the military expeditions of his country after listening for some time and perceiving that there was no prospect of the council breaking up he retired to the large hut adjoining the council chamber this served as the dwelling-place of the ladies and their family it was divided into several apartments by screens formed of hide sewn together and hidden from sight by colored hangings in one of these a lady was seated on a low couch covered with panthers skins they have not done talking yet mother it has been a question as to where we shall assemble to give battle it does not seem to me to make much difference where we fight but they seem to think that it is most important and of course they know more about it than i do they have fixed upon a place at last it is about fifteen miles from here they say that the ground in front is marshy and can hardly be traversed by the enemy's chariots but if they cannot get at us it seems to me that we cannot get at them messengers have been sent off to order all the contingents to assemble at that spot six thousand men are to remain behind to guard the city but as we mean to beat them i do not think there can be much occasion for that for you think we shall beat them don't you mother i hope so amuba but i am very fearful but we have several times repulsed them when they have invaded our country mother why should we not do so this time they are much stronger than they have ever been before when they have come against us my boy and their king is a great warrior who has been successful in almost every enterprise he has undertaken i cannot think why he wants to conquer us mother they say the riches of egypt are immense and the splendor of their temples and buildings such as we have no idea of we have no quarrel with them if they will but let us alone no country is so rich that it does not desire more my son we have gold and are skilled in the working of it and no doubt they anticipate that they will capture much treasure in the land besides as you say their expeditions against the rebu have been several times repulsed and therefore their monarch will reap all the greater honor if he should defeat us as to their having no quarrel with us have we not made many expeditions to the west returning with captives and much booty and yet the people had no quarrel with us many of them indeed could scarcely have known us by name when our army appeared among them some day my son things may be managed differently but at present kings who have power make war upon people that are weaker than themselves spoil them of their goods and make slaves of them i hope amuba you will not expose yourself too much in the conflict you have not come to man's strength yet and remember you are my only child see that your charioteer covers you with his shield when you have entered the battle for the egyptians are terrible as archers their bows carry much further than do ours and the arrows will pierce even the strongest armor our spearmen have always shown themselves as good as theirs nay better for they are stronger in body and full of courage it is in the goodness of her archers and the multitude of her chariots that the strength of egypt lies remember that although your father as king must needs go into the thick of battle to encourage his soldiers there is no occasion why you who are yet a boy should so expose yourself it will doubtless be a terrible battle the egyptians have the memory of past defeats to wipe out and they will be fighting under the eye of their king i am terrified amuba hitherto when your father has gone out to battle i have never doubted as to the result the persians were not foes whom brave men need dread nor was it difficult to force the hordes passing up from the eastward toward the setting sun to respect our country for we had the advantage in arms and discipline but the egyptians are terrible foes and the arms of their king have been everywhere victorious my heart is filled with dread at the thought of the approaching conflict though i try to keep up a brave face when your father is with me for i would not that he should deem me cowardly i trust mother that your fears are groundless and i cannot think that our men will give way when fighting for their homes and country upon ground chosen by themselves i hope not amuba but there is the trumpet sounding it is the signal that the council have broken up and that your father is about to start 
bless you my dear boy and may you return safe and sound from the conflict the queen fondly embraced her son who left the apartment hastily as his father entered in order that the latter might not see the traces of tears on his cheeks a few minutes later the king with his captains started from the palace most of them rode in chariots the rest on horseback the town was quiet now and the streets almost deserted with the exception of the garrison all the men capable of bearing arms had gone forth the women with anxious faces stood in groups at the doors and watched the royal party as it drove out the charioteer of amuba was a tall and powerful man he carried a shield far larger than was ordinarily used and had been specially selected by the king for the service his orders were that he was not to allow amuba to rush into the front line of fighters and that he was even to disobey the orders of the prince if he wished to charge into the ranks of the enemy my son must not shirk danger his father said and he must needs go well in the fight but he is still a boy and not fit to enter upon a hand-to-hand -hand contest with the picked warriors of egypt in time i hope he will fight abreast of me but at present you must restrain his ardour i need not bid you shield him as well as you can from the arrows of the egyptians he is my eldest son and if aught happens to me he will be the king of the rebu and his life is therefore a precious one half an hour later they came upon the tail of the stragglers making their way to the front the king stopped his chariot and sharply reproved some of them for their delay in setting out and urged them to hasten on to the appointed place in two hours the king arrived at this spot where already some forty thousand men were assembled the scouts who had been sent out reported that although the advance guard of the egyptians might arrive in an hour's time the main body were some distance behind and would not be up in time to attack before dark this was welcome news for before night the rest of the forces of the rebu fully thirty thousand more would have joined the king at once set out to examine the ground chosen by his general for the conflict it sloped gently down in front to a small stream which ran through soft and marshy ground and would oppose a formidable obstacle to the passage of chariots the right rested upon a dense wood while a village a mile and a half distant from the wood was held by the left wing a causeway which led from this across the marsh had been broken up and heavy blocks of stone were scattered thickly upon it to impede the passage of chariots the archers were placed in front to harass the enemy attempting to cross behind them were the spearmen in readiness to advance and aid them if pressed the chariots were on the higher ground in the rear ready to dash in and join in the conflict should the enemy succeed in forcing their way through the marsh the visit of inspection was scarcely finished when a cloud of dust was seen rising over the plain it approached rapidly the flash of arms could be seen in the sun and presently a vast number of horses were seen approaching in even line are they horsemen father amuba asked no they are chariots amuba the egyptians do not like us fight on horseback although there may be a few small bodies of horsemen with the army their strength lies in their chariots see they have halted they have perceived our ranks drawn up in order of battle the chariots drew up in perfect line and as the clouds of dust blew away four lines of chariots could be made out ranged at a distance of a hundred yards apart there are about a thousand in each line the king said and this is but their advance guard we have learned from fugitives that there are fully fifteen thousand chariots with their army is there no other place where they can pass this swamp father not so well as here amuba the valley deepens further on and the passage would be far more difficult than here above beyond the wood there is a lake of considerable extent and beyond that the ground is broken and unsuited for the action of chariots as far as the sea besides they have come to fight us and the pride of their king would not permit of their making a detour see there is some great personage probably the king himself advancing beyond their ranks to reconnoitre the ground a chariot was indeed approaching the opposite brow of the depression there were two figures in it by the side walked numerous figures who although too far off to be distinguished were judged to be the attendants and courtiers of the king the sun flashed from the side of the chariot which appeared at this distance to be composed of burnished gold great fans carried on wands shaded the king from the heat of the sun 
he drove slowly along the edge of the brow until he reached a point opposite the wood and then turning went the other way till he reached the causeway which passed on through the village after this he rode back to the line of chariots and evidently gave a word of command for instantly the long line of figures seen above the horses disappeared as the men stepped off the chariots to the ground no movement took place for an hour then there was a sudden stir and the long lines broke up and wheeled round to the right and left where they took their position in two solid masses the main army are at hand the king said do you see that great cloud ruddy in the setting sun that is the dust raised by their advance in another hour they will be here but by that time the sun will have set and assuredly they will not attack until morning the front line were ordered to remain under arms for a time the others were told to fall out and prepare their food for the night the egyptian army halted about a mile distant and as soon as it was evident that no further movement was intended the whole of the soldiers were ordered to fall out a line of archers were placed along the edge of the swamp and ere a long party of egyptian bowmen took up their post along the opposite crest great fires were lighted and a number of oxen which had been driven forward in readiness were slaughtered for food if the egyptians can see what is going on the king said to his son they must be filled with fury for they worship the oxen as among their chief gods is it possible father that they can believe that cattle are gods amuba asked in surprise they do not exactly look upon them as gods my son but as sacred to their gods similarly they reverence the cat the ibis and many other creatures how strange amuba said do they not worship as we and the persians do the sun which as all must see is the giver of light and heat which ripens our crops and gives fertility in abundance not so far as i know amuba but i know that they have many gods who they believe give them victory over their enemies they don't always give them victory amuba said since four times they have been repulsed in their endeavors to invade our land perhaps our gods are more powerful than theirs it may be that my son but so far as i can see the gods give victory to the bravest and most numerous armies that is to say they do not interfere at all father i do not say that my son we know little of the ways of the gods each nation has its own and as some nations overthrow others it must be that either some gods are more powerful than others or that they do not interfere to save those who worship them from destruction but these things are all beyond our knowledge we have but to do our part bravely and we need assuredly not fear the bulls and the cats and other creatures in which the egyptians trust some hours were spent by the king his leaders and his captains in going about among the troops seeing that all the contingents had arrived well armed and in good order notifying to the leaders of each the position they should take up in the morning and doing all in their power to animate and encourage the soldiers when all was done the king sat down on a pile of skins which had been prepared for him and talked long and earnestly with his son giving him advice as to his conduct in future if aught should befall him in the coming fight you are my heir he said and as is customary to the country the throne goes down from father to son were i to survive for another eight or ten years you would of course succeed me but should i fall to-morrow and should the egyptians overrun the land things may happen otherwise in that case the great need of the people would be a military leader who would rouse them to prolonged resistance and lead them again and again against the egyptians until these worn out by the perpetual fighting abandon the idea of subjecting us and turn their attention to less stubborn-minded people for such work you are far too young and the people would look to amusis or one of my other captains as their leader should success crown his efforts they may choose him as their king in that case i would say amuba it will be far better for you to acquiesce in the public choice than to struggle against it a lad like you would have no prospect of success against a victorious general the choice of the people and you would only bring ruin and death upon yourself and your mother by opposing him i can assure you that there is nothing so very greatly to be envied in the lot of a king and as one of the nobles of the land your position would be far more pleasant here than as king 
a cheerful acquiescence on your part to their wishes will earn you the good will of the people and at the death of him whom they may choose for their king the next choice may fall upon you do all in your power to win the good will of whoever may take the place of leader at my death by setting an example of prompt and willing obedience to his orders it is easy for an ambitious man to remove a lad from his path and your safety absolutely demands that you shall give him no reason whatever to regard you as a rival i trust that all this advice may not be needed and that we may conquer in to-morrow's fight but if we are beaten the probability that i shall escape is very small and it is therefore as well that you should be prepared for whatever may happen if you find that in spite of following my advice the leader of the people whoever he may be is ill disposed toward you withdraw to the borders of the country collect as large a band as you can there are always plenty of restless spirits ready to take part in any adventure and journey with them to the far west as so many of our people have done before and establish yourself there and found a kingdom none of those who have ever gone in that direction have returned and they must therefore have found space to establish themselves for had they met with people skilled in war and been defeated some at least would have found their way back but so long as traditions have been handed down to us tribes from the east have poured steadily westward to the unknown land and no band has ever returned his father spoke so seriously that amuba lay down that night on his couch of skins in a very different mood to that in which he had ridden out he had thought little of his mother's forebodings and had looked upon it as certain that the rebu would beat the egyptians as they had done before but his father's tone showed him that he too felt by no means confident of the issue of the day as soon as daylight broke the rebu stood to their arms and an hour later dense masses of the egyptians were seen advancing as soon as these reached the edge of the slope and began to descend toward the stream the king ordered his people to advance to the edge of the swamp and to open fire with their arrows a shower of missiles flew through the air and fell among the ranks of the egyptian footmen who had just arrived at the edge of the swamp so terrible was the discharge that the egyptians recoiled and retreating halfway up the slope where they would be beyond the reach of the rebu in turn discharged their arrows the superiority of the egyptian bowmen was at once manifest they carried very powerful bows and standing sideways drew them to the ear just as the english archers did at crecy and therefore shot their arrows a vastly greater distance than did their opponents who were accustomed to draw their bows only to the breast scores of the rebu fell at the first discharge and as the storm of arrows continued they finding themselves powerless to damage the egyptians at that distance retired halfway up the side of the slope now from behind the lines of the egyptian archers a column of men advanced a hundred abreast each carrying a great faggot their object was evident they were about to prepare a wide causeway across the marsh by which the chariots could pass again the rebu advanced to the edge of the swamp and poured in their showers of arrows but the egyptians covering themselves with the bundles of faggots they carried suffered but little harm while the rebu were mown down by the arrows of the egyptian archers shooting calmly and steadily beyond the range of their missiles as soon as the front rank of the egyptian column reached the edge of the swampy ground the men of the front line laid down their faggots in a close row and then retired in the intervals between their comrades behind them each rank as it arrived at the edge did the same many fell beneath the arrows of the rebu but the operation went on steadily the faggots being laid down too deep as the ground became more marshy and the rebu saw with a feeling approaching dismay the gradual but steady advance of a causeway two hundred yards wide across the swamp the king himself and his bravest captains alighting from their chariots went down among the footmen and urged them to stand firm pointing out that every yard the causeway advanced their arrows inflicted more fatal damage among the men who were forming it their entreaties however were vain the ground facing the causeway was already thickly encumbered with dead and the hail of the egyptian arrows was so fast and deadly that even the bravest shrank from withstanding it at last even their leaders ceased to urge them and the king gave the order for all to fall back beyond the range of the egyptian arrows 
some changes were made in the formation of the troops and the best and most disciplined bands were placed facing the causeway so as to receive the charge of the egyptian chariots the two front lines were of spearmen while on the higher ground behind them were placed archers whose orders were to shoot at the horses and to pay no heed to those in the chariots then came the chariots four hundred in number behind these again was a deep line of spearmen on the right and left extending to the wood and village were the main body of the army who were to oppose the egyptian footmen advancing across the swamp the completion of the last portion of the causeway cost the egyptians heavily for while they were exposed to the arrows of the rebu archers these were now beyond the range of the egyptians on the opposite crest but at last the work was completed just as it was finished and the workmen had retired the king leaped from his chariot and leading a body of a hundred men carrying blazing brands dashed down the slope as soon as they were seen the egyptian archers ran forward and a storm of arrows was poured into the little band two-thirds of them fell ere they reached the causeway the others applied their torches to the fagots the egyptian footmen rushed across to extinguish the flames while the rebu poured down to repel them a desperate fight ensued but the bravery of the rebu prevailed and the egyptians were driven back their attack however had answered its purpose for in the struggle the fagots had been trodden deeper into the mire and the fire was extinguished the rebu now went back to their first position and waited the attack which they were powerless to avert it was upward of an hour before it began then the long line of egyptian footmen opened and their chariots were seen fifty abreast then with a mighty shout the whole army advanced down the slope the rebu replied with their war cry at full speed the egyptian chariots dashed down the declivity to the causeway this was the signal for the rebu archers to draw their bows and in an instant confusion was spread among the first line of chariots the horses wounded by the missiles plunged madly many stepping between the fagots fell for a moment the advance was checked but the egyptian footmen entering the swamp waist deep opened such a terrible fire with their arrows that the front line of the rebu were forced to fall back and the aim of their archers became wild and uncertain in vain the king endeavored to steady them while he was doing so the first of the egyptian chariots had already made their way across the causeway and behind them the others poured on in an unbroken column then through the broken lines of spearmen the rebu chariots dashed down upon them followed by the host of spearmen the king's object was to arrest the first onslaught of the egyptians to overwhelm the leaders and prevent the mass behind from emerging from the crowded causeway the shock was terrible horses and chariots rolled over in wild confusion javelins were hurled bows twanged and the shouts of the combatants and the cries of the wounded as they fell beneath the feet of the struggling horses created a terrible din light and active the rebu footmen mingled in the fray diving under the bellies of the egyptian horses and inflicting vital stabs with their long knives or engaging in hand-to-hand -hand conflicts with the dismounted egyptians amuba had charged down with the rest of the chariots he was stationed in the second line immediately behind his father and his charioteer mindful of the orders he had received strove in spite of the angry orders of the lad to keep the chariot stationary but the horses accustomed to maneuver in line were not to be restrained and in spite of their driver's efforts charged down the slope with the rest amuba who had hunted the lion and leopard retained his coolness and discharged his arrows among the egyptians with steady aim for a time the contest was doubtful the egyptian chariots crowded on the causeway were unable to move forward and in many places their weight forced the fagots so deep in the mire that the vehicles were immovable meanwhile along the swamp on both sides a terrible contest was going on the egyptians covered by the fire of their arrows succeeded in making their way across the swamp but here they were met by the rebu spearmen and the fight raged along the whole line then two thousand chosen men the bodyguard of the egyptian king made their way across the swamp close to the causeway while at the same time there was a movement among the densely packed vehicles a tremendous impulse was given to them from behind some were pressed off into the swamp some were overthrown or trampled under foot some were swept forward on the firm ground beyond and thus a mass of the heaviest chariots drawn by the most powerful horses forced their way across the causeway over all obstacles 
In their midst was the king of Egypt himself, the great Thotmes. The weight and impetus of the mass of horses and chariots pressed all before it, up the hill. This gave to the chariots which came on behind room to open to the right and left. The king's bodyguard shook the solid formation of the Rebu spearmen with their thick flights of arrows, and the chariots then dashed in among them. The Rebu fought with the valor of their race. The Egyptians who first charged among them fell pierced with their arrows, while their horses were stabbed in innumerable places. But as the stream of chariots poured over without a check, and charged in sections upon them, bursting their way through the mass of footmen by the force and fury with which they charged, the infantry became broken up into groups, each fighting doggedly and desperately. At this moment the officer in command of the Rebu horse, a thousand strong, charged down upon the Egyptian chariots, drove them back toward the swamp, and for a time restored the conflict. But the breaks which had occurred between the Rebu center and its two flanks had enabled the Egyptian bodyguard to thrust themselves through and to fall upon the Rebu chariots and spearmen, who were still maintaining the desperate conflict. The Rebu king had throughout fought in the front line of his men, inspiriting them with his voice and valor. Many times, when his chariot was so jammed in the mass that all movement was impossible, he leaped to the ground, and making his way through the throng, slew many of the occupants of the Egyptian chariots. But his efforts and those of his captains were unavailing. The weight of the attack was irresistible. The solid phalanx of Egyptian chariots pressed onward, and the Rebu were forced steadily back. Their chariots, enormously outnumbered, were destroyed rather than defeated. The horses fell pierced by the terrible rain of arrows, and the wave of Egyptians passed over them. The king, looking round in his chariot, saw that all was lost here, and that the only hope was to gain one or other of the masses of his infantry on the flank, and to lead them off the field in solid order. But as he turned to give orders, a shaft sent by a bowman in a chariot a few yards away struck him in the eye, and he fell back dead in his chariot. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Cat of Bubastes, A Tale of Ancient Egypt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty. Chapter 2 The Siege of the City. Amuba saw his father fall, and leaping from his chariot, strove to make his way through the mingled mass of footmen and chariots to the spot. Jethro followed close behind him. He, too, had caught sight of the falling figure, and knew what Amuba did not, that the Rebu had lost their king. He was not forgetful of the charge which had been laid on him, but the lad was for a moment beyond his control, and he, too, was filled with fury at the fall of the king, and determined, if possible, to save his body. He reached Amuba's side just in time to interpose his shield between the boy and an Egyptian archer in a chariot he was passing the arrow pierced the shield and the arm that held it jethro paused an instant broke off the shaft at the shield and seizing the point which was projecting two inches beyond the flesh pulled the arrow through the wound it was but a moment's work but short as it was it almost cost amuba his life for the archer leaning forward dropped the end of his bow over the lad's head a trick common among the egyptian archers and in a moment dragged him to the ground while his comrade in the chariot raised his spear to dispatch him Jethro sprang forward with a shout of rage, and with a blow of his sword struck off the head of the spear as it was descending. Then shortening his sword, he sprang into the chariot, ran the man holding the bow through the body, and grappled with the spearman. The struggle was a short one. Leaving his sword in the body of the archer, Jethro drew his dagger and speedily dispatched his foe. Then he jumped down, and lifting Amuba, who was insensible from the sharp jerk of the bowstring upon his throat and the violence of his fall, carried him back to his chariot. This with the greatest difficulty he managed to draw out of the heat of the conflict, which was for the moment raging more fiercely than before. The Rebu who had seen the fall of their king had dashed forward to rescue the body and to avenge his death. They cleared a space round him, and as it was impossible to extricate his chariot, they carried his body through the chaos of plunging horses, broken chariots, and fiercely struggling men to the rear. 
then it was placed in another chariot and the driver started with it at full speed for the city jethro on emerging from the crowd paused for a moment to look round he saw at once that the battle was lost the centre was utterly broken and the masses of the egyptians who had crossed the swamp were pressing heavily on the flanks of the rebu footmen who were still opposing a firm stand to those attacking them in front for the moment the passage of the egyptian chariots was arrested so choked was the causeway with chariots and horses which were embedded in the mire or had sunk between the faggots that further passage was impossible and a large body of footmen were now forming a fresh causeway by the side of the other this would soon be completed for they were now working undisturbed by opposition and jethro saw that as soon as it was done the egyptian host would sweep across and fall upon the rear of the rebu jethro ran up to two mounted men badly wounded who had like himself made their way out of the fight see he said in a quarter of an hour a new causeway will be completed and the egyptians will pour over in that case resistance will be impossible and all will be lost do one of you ride to each flank and tell the captains that the king is dead that there are none to give orders here and that their only chance to save their troops is to retreat at full speed but keeping good order to the city the horsemen rode off immediately for jethro as the king's own charioteer was a man of some impatience after dispatching the messengers he returned to his chariot and at once drove off amuba was now recovering and the rough motion of the vehicle as it dashed along at full speed aroused him what is it jethro what has happened the battle is lost prince and i am conveying you back to the city you have had a rough fall and a narrow escape of your life and can do no more fighting even if fighting were of any good which it is not and the king my father amuba said struggling to his feet what of him did i not see him fall i know not of him for certain jethro replied there was a terrible fight raging and as i had you to carry out i could take no share in it besides i had an arrow through my left arm if i had been a moment later it would have gone through your body instead and now if you do not mind taking the reins i will bandage it up i have not had time to think about it yet but it is bleeding fast and i begin to feel faint this was indeed true but jethro had called amuba's attention to his wound principally for the sake of diverting his thoughts for a moment from his fear for his father as amuba drove he looked back the plain behind him was covered with a mass of fugitives i see that all is lost he said mournfully but how is it that we are not pursued we shall be pursued before long jethro answered but i fancy that few of the egyptian chariots which first passed are in a condition to follow most of them have lost horses or drivers numbers were broken to pieces in the melee but they are making a fresh causeway and when that is completed those who cross will take up the pursuit as for their footmen they have small chance of catching the rebu surely our men ought to retreat in good order jethro scattered as they are they will be slaughtered in thousands by the egyptian chariots they could not oppose much resistance to them anyhow jethro replied on a plain footmen cannot withstand a chariot charge as it is many will doubtless fall but they will scatter to the right and left numbers will reach the hills in safety some will take refuge in woods and jungles while many will outrun the chariots the new causeway is narrow and a few only can cross abreast and thus though many of our men will be overtaken and killed i trust that the greater part will escape let us draw up here for a short time jethro i see there are several chariots and some horsemen behind and as they are with the main body of the fugitives they are doubtless friends let us join them and proceed in a body to the town i should not like to be the first to enter with the news of our defeat you are right prince as our horses are good we need not fear being overtaken we can therefore wait a few minutes a score of chariots presently came up and all halted on seeing amuba one of them contained Amusis, the chief captain of the army. He leaped from his chariot when he saw Amuba and advanced to him. Prince, he said, why do you delay? I rejoice at seeing that you have escaped in the battle, for I marked you bravely fighting in the midst. But let me beg you to hasten on. A few minutes and the host of Egyptian chariots will be upon us. I am ready to proceed, Amusis, since you have come. Have you any news of my father? 
the king has been sorely wounded the general said and was carried off out of the battle but come prince we must hasten on our presence will be sorely needed in the city and we must get all in readiness for defence before the egyptians arrive the chariots again started and reached the city without seeing anything of the egyptians who did not indeed arrive before the walls until an hour later having been delayed by the slaughter of the fugitives as the party entered the town they found confusion and terror prevailing the arrival of the body of the king was the first intimation of disaster and this had been followed by several horsemen and chariots who had spread the news of the defeat of the army the cries of women filled the air some in their grief and terror ran wildly here and there some sat at their doors with their faces hidden by their hands wailing loudly others tore their garments and behaved as if demented on their way to the palace they met the troops who had been left behind to guard the city moving down stern and silent to take their places on the wall during the drive amusis who had driven in amuba's chariot had broken to the boy the news that his father was dead and amuba was prepared for the loud lamentation of women which met him as he entered the royal enclosure i will see my mother he said to amusis and then i will come down with you to the walls and will take whatever part you may assign me in the defence it is to your experience and valour we must now trust i will do all that i can prince the walls are strong and if as i hope the greater part of our army find their way back i trust we may be able to defend ourselves successfully against the egyptian host assure your royal mother of my deep sympathy for her in her sorrow and of my devotion to her personally the general now drove off and amuba entered the royal dwellings in the principal apartment the body of the king was laid upon a couch in the middle of the room the queen stood beside it in silent grief while the attendants raised loud cries wrung their hands and filled the air with their lamentation mingled with praises of the character and bravery of the king amuba advanced to his mother's side she turned and threw her arms round him thank the gods my son that you are restored to me but what a loss what a terrible loss is ours it is indeed mother no better father ever lived than mine but i pray you mother lay aside your grief for a while we shall have time to weep and mourn for him afterward we have need of all our courage in a few hours the egyptian hosts will be before our walls and every arm will be needed for their defence i am going down to take my place among the men to do what i can to encourage them but the confusion in the city is terrible none know whether they have lost husbands or fathers and the cries and lamentations of the women cannot but dispirit and dishearten the men i think mother that you might do much if you would and i am sure that my father in his resting place with the gods would far rather see you devoting yourself to the safety of his people than to lamentations here what would you have me do i should say mother mount a chariot and drive through the streets of the town bid the women follow the example of their queen and defer their lamentation for the fallen until the foe has been repelled bid each do her part in the defence of the city there is work for all stones to be carried to the walls food to be cooked for the fighting men hides to be prepared in readiness to be carried to the ramparts where the attack is hottest to shield our soldiers from arrows in these and other tasks all can find employment and in thus working for the defence of the town the women would find distraction from their sorrows and anxieties your advice is wise amuba and i will follow it order a chariot to be brought down my maidens shall come with me and see that two trumpeters are in readiness to precede us this will ensure attention and silence and my words will be heard as we pass along how did you escape from the conflict the faithful jethro bore me off mother or i too should have fallen and now with your permission i will go to the wall do so amuba and may the gods preserve you you must partake of some food before you go for you will need all your strength my son amuba hastily ate the food that was placed before him in another apartment and drank a goblet of wine and then hurried down to the wall the scene was a heart-rending one all over the plain were scattered groups of men hurrying toward the city while among them dashed the egyptian chariots overthrowing and slaying them but not without resistance the rebu were well disciplined and as the chariots thundered up little groups gathered together shield overlapping shield and spears projecting while those within the circle shot their arrows or whirled stones from their slings 
the horses wounded by the arrows often refused to obey their drivers but rushed headlong across the plain others charged up only to fall pierced with the spears while the chariots were often empty of their occupants before they broke into the phalanx thus although many fell many succeeded in gaining the gates of the town and the number of men available for the defence had already largely increased when amuba reached the walls although the egyptian chariots came up in great numbers night fell without the appearance of the main body of the egyptian army after darkness set in great numbers of the rebu troops who had escaped to the hills made their way into the town the men of the contingents furnished by the other rebu cities naturally made their way direct to their homes but before morning the six thousand men left behind to guard the city when the army set out had been swelled to four times their numbers although this was little more than half the force which had marched out to battle the return of so large a number of the fugitives caused a great abatement of the panic and misery that had prevailed the women whose husbands or sons had returned rejoiced over those whom they had regarded as lost while those whose friends had not yet returned gained hopes from the narratives of the fresh comers that their loved ones might also have survived and would ere long make their way back the example of the queen had already done much to restore confidence all knew the affection that existed between the king and her and the women felt that if she could lay aside her deep sorrow and set such an example of calmness and courage at such a time it behooved all others to set aside their anxieties and to do their best for the defence of the town amusis gave orders that all those who had returned from battle should rest for the night in their homes the troops who had remained in the city keeping guard upon the walls in the morning however all collected at the trumpet call and were formed up according to the companies and battalions to which they belonged of some of these which had borne the brunt of the combat there were but a handful of survivors while of others the greater portion were present weak battalions were joined to the strong fresh officers were appointed to take the place of those who were missing the arms were examined and all deficiencies made good from the public stores ten thousand men were set aside as a reserve to be brought up to the points most threatened while to the rest were allotted those portions of the wall which they were to occupy as soon as morning broke the women recommenced the work that had been interrupted by night making their way to the walls in long trains carrying baskets of stones on their heads disused houses were pulled down for the sake of their stones and timber parties of women with ropes dragging the latter to the walls in readiness to be hurled down upon the heads of the enemy even the children joined in the work carrying small baskets of earth to those portions of the wall which amusis had ordered to be strengthened the position of the city had been chosen with a view to defence it stood on a plateau of rock raised some fifty feet above the plain the caspian washed its eastern face on the other three sides a high wall composed of earth roughly faced with stones ran along at the edge of the plateau above it at distances of fifty yards apart rose towers the entire circuit of the walls was about three miles since its foundation by the grandfather of the late king the town had never been taken although several times besieged and the rebu had strong hopes that here when the chariots of the egyptians were no longer to be feared they could oppose a successful resistance to all the efforts of the enemy at noon the egyptian army was seen advancing and confident as the defenders of the city felt they could not resist a feeling of apprehension at the enormous force which was seen upon the plain the egyptian army was over three hundred thousand strong it moved in regular order according to the arms or nationality of the men here were nubians sardinians etruscans oscans dauni maxies kahaka a race from iberia and bodies of other mercenaries from every tribe and people with whom the egyptians had any dealings the sardinians bore round shields three or four spears or javelins a long straight dagger and a helmet surmounted by a spike with a ball at the top the etruscans carried no shields and instead of the straight dagger were armed with a heavy curved chopping knife their head-dress resembled somewhat in shape that now worn by the armenians the dauni were greek in the character of their arms carrying a round shield a single spear a short straight sword and a helmet of the shape of a cone the egyptians were divided according to their arms there were regiments of archers who carried for close combat a slightly curved stick of heavy wood 
other regiments of archers carried hatchets the heavy infantry all bore the egyptian shield which was about three feet long it was widest at the upper part where it was semicircular while the bottom was cut off straight the shields had a boss near the upper part some regiments carried in addition to the spears heavy maces others axes their helmets all fitted closely to the head most of them wore metal tassels hanging from the top the helmets were for the most part made of thick material quilted and padded these were preferred to metal being a protection from the heat of the sun each company carried its own standard these were all of religious character and represented animals sacred to the gods sacred boats emblematic devices or the names of the king or queen these were in metal and were raised at the ends of spears or staves the standard bearers were all officers of approved valor behind the army followed an enormous baggage train and as soon as this had arrived on the ground the tents of the king and the principal officers were pitched what a host jethro said to amuba who after having his arm dressed on his arrival at the palace had accompanied the young prince to the walls it seems a nation rather than an army i do not wonder now that we were defeated yesterday but that we so long held our ground and that so many escaped from the battle it is wonderful truly jethro look at the long lines of chariots moving in as regular order as the footmen it is well for us that they will now be forced to be inactive as to the others although they are countless in numbers they cannot do much against our walls no towers that they can erect upon the plains will place them on a level with us here and the rock is so steep that it is only here and there that it can be climbed it would seem impossible for them to take it prince but we must not be too confident we know that many towns which believed themselves impregnable have been captured by the egyptians and must be prepared for the most daring enterprises the gates have been already fastened and so great a thickness of rocks piled against them that they are now the strongest part of the wall those parts of the roads leading up to them that were formed of timber have been burned and they cannot now reach the gates except by climbing as at other points we have provisions enough to last for well nigh a year for all the harvest has been brought in from the whole district round together with many thousands of cattle of wells there are abundance yes i heard the preparations that were being made jethro and i doubt not that if we can resist the first onslaught of the egyptians we can hold out far longer than they can for the difficulty of victualling so huge an army will be immense in what way do you think they will attack for my part i do not see any method which offers a hope of success that i cannot tell you we know that to us and to the peoples around our cities seem impregnable but the egyptians are skilled in all the devices of war they have laid siege to and captured great numbers of cities and are doubtless full of plans and expedients of which we know nothing however to-morrow morning will show us something nothing will be attempted to-day the generals have first to inspect our walls and see where the assault is to be delivered and the army will be given a day's rest at least before being called upon to assault such a position in the afternoon a cortege of chariots made the circuit of the walls from the shore of the sea round the great plateau to the sea again keeping just beyond the range of arrows if we had but a few of their archers here jethro said the egyptian king would not be so overbold in venturing so near it is wonderful how strongly they shoot their arrows have fully double the range of ours and their power is sufficient to carry them through the strongest shields even when strengthened with metal had i not seen it i should have thought it impossible that living men and those no bigger or stronger than we could have sent their arrows with such power they stand in a different attitude to that of our archers and though their shafts are fully a foot longer than ours they draw them to the head i regarded myself as a good bowman till i met the egyptians and now i feel as a child might do when watching a man perform feats of strength of which he had not even imagined a possibility in the evening the great council met it included all the principal officers of the army the priests the royal councillors and the leading men in the state after a discussion it was determined that in the present crisis it were best to postpone taking any steps to appoint a successor to the late king but that so long as the siege lasted amusis should be endowed with absolute powers in order that there should be no loss of time for the necessity of consulting any one amuba was present with his mother at the council though neither of them took any active part in it 
but at its commencement an announcement was made in their name that they were willing to abide by whatever the council should decide and that indeed both mother and son desired that while this terrible danger hung over the state the supreme power should be placed in the hands of whomsoever the general voice might select as the person best fitted to take the command in such an extremity that night the body of the king was consumed on a great funeral pile under ordinary occasions the ceremony would have taken place on a narrow promontory jutting out into the sea about five miles from the city here the previous monarchs had been consumed in sight of a multitude of their people and had been buried beneath great mounds of earth the priests had long ago pronounced this place the most sacred in the kingdom and had declared that the anger of the gods would fall upon any who ventured to set foot upon the holy ground but it was impossible for the present to lay the ashes of the king by the side of those of his forefathers and the ceremony was therefore conducted within the royal enclosure only the officiating priests and the wife and son of the deceased being present when all was over the ashes were collected and were placed in a casket which was destined when better times returned to be laid in the sight of the whole people in the sacred enclosure on the promontory early next morning the trumpets of the guards on the walls called all the troops to arms as soon as amuba reached his post he saw the egyptian army marching against the city when they arrived within bowshot the archers who formed the front lines opened fire upon the defenders on the walls their arrows however for the most part fell short while those of the besieged rained down upon them with effect they were therefore withdrawn a short distance and contracting their ranks a vast number of footmen poured through and in irregular order ran forward to the foot of the rock where they were sheltered from the arrows of those on the wall what can they be going to do now amuba exclaimed laying aside his bow jethro shook his head they are working with a plan he said we shall see before very long listen even above the din caused by so vast a multitude a sharp metallic sound was presently heard like that of innumerable hammers striking on steel surely amuba exclaimed they can never be thinking of quarrying the rock away that is too great a task even were the whole people of egypt here it certainly is not that jethro agreed and yet i cannot think what else can be their intentions it was nigh an hour before the mystery was solved then at the blast of a trumpet sounded at the post where the egyptian king had placed himself and taken up along the whole of the line a great number of heads appeared along the edge of rock at the foot of the walls the egyptians had been employed in driving spikes in the crevices of the rock standing on the first so driven they then inserted others three feet higher and so had proceeded until a number of men had climbed up the face of the rock these let down ropes and ladders had been hauled up the steepest places great numbers of ropes were hung down to assist those who followed in the ascent and the men who first showed themselves over the brow were followed by a stream of others until the ledge which was in most cases but a few feet wide was crowded with soldiers the ladders were now hauled up and placed against the wall and the egyptians swarmed up in great numbers but the rebu were prepared for the assault and a storm of stones beams of wood arrows javelins and other missiles rained down on the egyptians many of the ladders in spite of the number of men upon them were thrown back by the defenders and fell with a crash over the edge of the rock to the plain below here and there the egyptians gained a footing on the wall before the rebu had recovered from their first surprise at their daring manner of attack but so soon as they rallied they attacked the egyptians with such fury that in every case the latter were slain fighting or were thrown over the embattlements for several hours the egyptians continued their efforts but after losing vast numbers of men without obtaining any success they were recalled by the sound of the trumpet that has not been very serious jethro amuba said wiping the perspiration from his forehead for he had been encouraging the men by assisting in the lifting and casting over the massive stones and beams of wood it was not difficult to repulse them under such conditions jethro said but the manner of their attack was a surprise indeed to us and they have fought with the greatest bravery you will see that the next time they will have benefited by the lesson and that we shall have some new device to cope with now that they have once found a way to scale the rock we may expect but little rest the fight was not renewed until evening when just as darkness fell a large number of the egyptians again ascended the rock 
as before the rebu poured missiles down upon them but this time only a sufficient number had climbed up to be able to stand along close to the foot of the wall where they were to a great extent sheltered from the missiles from above the night was a dark one and all night long the rebu continued to shower down missiles upon their invisible foe of whose continued presence they were assured by the sounds from which time to time were heard when daylight enabled the defenders to see what was going on at the foot of their walls they raised a shout of surprise and dismay during the night the egyptians had hoisted up by ropes a quantity of the timber brought with them for the construction of shelters for those who were engaged on siege operations the timbers were all cut and prepared for fitting together and were easily jointed even in the dark thus then when the besiegers looked over they saw forty or fifty of these shelters erected against the foot of their walls they were so formed that they sloped down like a penthouse and were thickly covered with hides the besieged soon found that so solid were these constructions that the beams and great stones which they dropped upon them simply bounded off and leaped down into the plain ladders fastened together had been fixed by the egyptians from each of these shelters to the plain below so that the men at work could be relieved or reinforced as the occasion required in vain the besieged showered down missiles in vain poured over the cauldrons of boiling oil they had prepared in readiness the strength of the beams defied the first the hides lapping over each other prevented the second from penetrating to those below truly these are terrible foes prince jethro said i told you that we might expect new plans and devices but i did not think that the very day after the siege began we should find that they had overcome all the difficulties of our natural defences and should have established themselves in safety at the foot of our walls but what is to be done jethro the men working in those shelters will speedily dislodge these stones facing the walls and will then without difficulty dig through the earthwork behind the matter is serious jethro agreed but as yet there is no reason to alarm ourselves the greater portion of our troops will be assembled behind the wall and should the egyptians gain a way through we should pour in at the openings and as they can be only reinforced slowly would speedily hurl them all over the edge of the cliff it is not that i fear what is it that you do fear jethro i fear prince because i do not know what it is i have to fear we are as children in a struggle of this kind as opposed to the egyptians already they have wholly overthrown all our calculations and it is just because i do not know what they will do next that i am afraid it must be as plain to them as it is to us that if they dig through the walls we shall rush in and overpower them perhaps they intend to work right and left and to undermine the walls until large portions of them tumble over and breaches are made jethro shook his head that would destroy the egyptian shelters and bury their workmen or even did they manage to retire before the walls fell they would gain nothing by it in fact i wish that we ourselves would tumble the walls over for in that case the heap of earth and stones would rise from the very edge of the rock and as the egyptians could only climb up in small numbers at a time we could destroy them without difficulty i see now that our builders made a mistake in surrounding the city with a high wall it would have been best to have built a mere breastwork at the very edge of the cliff all round here comes amusis we shall hear what his opinion of the matter is amusis looked flushed and anxious although when he saw the prince he assumed an expression of carelessness the egyptians are going to burrow through our walls he said but when they do so we will drive them like rats out of the holes do you not think so jethro i do not know jethro said gravely if they dig through our walls we shall certainly as you say drive them out of their holes but i cannot believe that that is what they are going to do what do you think they are going to do amusis asked roughly i have no idea amusis i wish that i had but i am quite sure that they haven't taken all this trouble for nothing End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of The Cat of Bubastes, A Tale of Ancient Egypt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty. Chapter 3 Captive so confident were the rebu that if the egyptians dug through their walls or even threw them down by undermining them they could repel their assault 
that they took but little heed to the huts established at the foot of the wall except that a strong body of men were stationed behind the walls half of whom were always to be under arms in readiness to repel the egyptians should they burrow through this confidence proved their ruin the egyptians were thoroughly accustomed to mining operations and were fully aware that were they to pierce the wall the rebu could at once overwhelm the small working parties they therefore after penetrating a considerable distance into the embankment drove right and left making an excavation of considerable size the roof being supported by beams and planks hauled up at night the number of those employed in the work was increased as fast as there was room for them and while the rebu thought that there were at most a dozen men in each of the sheltered places there were at the end of twenty-four hours fully two hundred men at work in the heart of the embankment at each point the egyptian king had ordered the chief of his engineers to have everything in readiness for the capture of the city by the end of the third day each night the numbers of workmen increased while the excavations were carried in further and further no picks were used in the work the earth being cut away with wide daggers absolute silence was enjoined among the workers and they were thus enabled to extend their excavations close to the surface without the defenders having an idea of their proximity the distance that they were from the inner face was ascertained by boring through at night time with spears by the end of the third day the excavations had been carried so far that there was but a foot or so of earth remaining this being kept from moving on pressure from the outside by a lining of boards supported by beams thus at twenty points the egyptians were in readiness to burst through among the unsuspecting defenders as soon as it was dark the preparations for the assault began great numbers of stagings of vast length had been prepared together with an immense number of broad and lofty ladders these last were brought forward noiselessly to the foot of the cliff and great numbers of the egyptians mounted before the alarm was given by those on the walls but by this time the excavations were all crowded with men the egyptian army now advanced with shouts to the assault the great stages were brought forward by the labor of thousands of men and placed against the cliff the besieged had now rushed to defend the walls and volleys of missiles of all sorts were poured down upon the egyptians as they strove to mount the ladders and stages no one thought of any possible danger from the little shelters lying at the foot of the wall and the den was so great that the work of digging through the remaining wall of earth was unheard the troops who had been specially told off to watch these points had joined their comrades on the walls and none marked the stream of dark figures which presently began to pour from the embankment at twenty different points at last the besieged whose hopes were rising as the egyptians appeared to falter under the showers of missiles poured down were startled by the sound of a trumpet in their rear a sound which was answered instantly from a score of points rushing with cries of dismay to the back of the rampart they saw dark bodies of footmen drawn up in regular order and a rain of arrows was opened upon them the rebu without a moment's hesitation rushed down to attack the foes who had gained a footing they scarce knew how in their fortress but each of the egyptian companies was four hundred strong composed of picked troops and these for a time easily beat off the irregular attacks of the rebu amusis and the other leaders of the rebu strove to get their men into solid order for so alone could they hope to break the phalanxes of the egyptians but the confusion was too great in the meantime the egyptians outside had taken advantage of the diversion created by the attack within and poured up their ladders and stagings in vast numbers some dragging up ladders after them planted them against the walls others poured through by the passages which had been dug and these as soon as they were numerous enough ascended the embankments from behind and fell upon the rebu still defending the wall never did the tribesmen fight with greater bravery but the completeness of the surprise the number of egyptians who had established themselves in their rear the constant pushing in of reinforcements both through and over the wall rendered it impossible for them to retrieve their fortunes and in the confusion and darkness they were unable to distinguish friend from foe the various battalions and companies were hopelessly mixed together the orders of their leaders and officers were unheard in the den upon the egyptian side everything had been carefully planned 
one of the companies which first entered had made their way quietly along the foot of the wall and were not noticed until they suddenly threw themselves upon defenders of one of the gates as soon as they had obtained possession of this great fires were lighted and a large body of egyptian troops headed by engineers carrying beams and planks advanced the gaps across the roadway were bridged over and the egyptians poured in at the gate before the rebu could dislodge the party which had taken possession of it every moment added to the confusion of the scene to the rebu it seemed as if their foes were springing from the very earth upon them and despairing of regaining the ground that had been lost they began to break away and make some for their homes some for the water face of the city the only one which was open to them for the egyptians were now pressing forward from the three other faces of the town the boats lying along the sand were quickly crowded with fugitives and pushed off from shore and those who arrived later found all means of escape gone some threw down their arms and made their way to their homes others ran back to meet the egyptians and die fighting it was some hours before the conflict ceased for the egyptians too were confused with the darkness and many desperate fights took place between different battalions before they discovered they were friends light was gained by firing numbers of the houses lying nearest to the walls but as soon as the egyptians advanced beyond the arc of light they were fiercely attacked by the rebu and at last the trumpet sounded the order for the troops to remain in the positions they occupied until daylight as soon as morning broke a vast crowd of women were seen advancing from the centre of the town as they neared the egyptians they threw themselves on the ground with loud cries for mercy there was a pause and then some egyptian officers advanced and bade a score of the women follow them to the presence of the king thotmes had entered with the troops who made their way into the city by the gate but yielding to the entreaties of the officers that he would not expose himself to be killed in the confusion perhaps by an arrow shot by his own soldiers he had retired to the plain and had just returned to take part in the occupation of the city the rebu women were led to him over ground thickly covered with dead fully half the defenders of the city had fallen while the loss of the egyptians had been almost as large the women threw themselves on their faces before the great monarch and implored mercy for themselves their children and the remnant of the men of the city thotmes was well satisfied he had captured a city which was regarded as impregnable he had crushed the people who had inflicted defeats upon his predecessors he had added to his own glory and to the renown of the egyptian arms the disposition of the egyptians was lenient human sacrifices were unknown to their religion and they do not appear at any time to have slain in cold blood captives taken in war human life was held at a far higher value in egypt than among any other nation of antiquity and the whole teaching of their laws tended to create a disposition toward mercy an interpreter translated to the king the words of the women as all resistance ceased the king asked have all the men laid down their arms the women exclaimed that there was not now an armed man in the city all the weapons having been collected during the night and placed in piles in the open space in front of the entrance to the palace did i give to all their lives the king said graciously when i fight with cowards i have little mercy upon them for men who are not brave are unfit to live but when i fight with men i treat them as men the rebu are a valiant people but as well might the jackal fight with the lion as the rebu oppose themselves to the might of egypt they fought bravely in the field and they have bravely defended their walls therefore i grant life to all in the city men women and children where is your king he died in the battle four days since the women replied where is your queen she drank poison last night preferring to join her husband than to survive the capture of the city thotmes had now ordered the whole of the inhabitants to be taken out to the plain and kept there under a guard the town was then methodically searched and everything of value brought together the king set aside a certain portion of the golden vessels for the services of the temple some he chose for himself and after presenting others to his generals ordered the rest to be divided among the troops he then ordered a hundred captives fifty young men and fifty maidens of the highest rank to be selected to be taken to egypt as slaves and then fixed the tribute which the rebu were in future to pay 
the army then evacuated the city, and the inhabitants were permitted to return. The next day messengers arrived from the other Rebu towns. The fall of the capital, which had been believed to be impregnable, after so short a siege had struck terror into the minds of all, and the messengers brought offers of submission to the king, with promises to pay any tribute that he might lay upon them. The king, well satisfied with his success and anxious to return to Egypt, from which he had been absent nearly two years, replied graciously to the various deputations, informing them that he had already fixed the tribute that the nation was to pay annually, and ordered a contribution to be sent at once by each city in proportion to its size. In a few days the required sums, partly in money, partly in vessels of gold, embroidered robes, and other articles of value, were brought in. When the full amount had been received, the camp was struck, and the army started on their long march back to Egypt, an officer of high rank being left as governor of the newly captured province, with ten thousand men as a garrison. Amuba was one of the fifty selected as slaves. Amusis had escaped in the confusion, as had many others. Jethro was also one of the selected band. Amuba was for a time careless of what befell him. The news of the death of his mother, which had met him as, after fighting to the last, he returned to the palace, had been a terrible blow, following as it did so closely upon the loss of his father and the overthrow of the nation. His mother had left the message for him that although, as life had no longer a charm for her, she preferred death to the humiliation of being carried a prisoner to Egypt, she trusted that he would bear the misfortunes which had fallen on him and his people with submission and patience. He was young, and there was no saying what the future had in store for him. "'You will doubtless, my son,' were the words of her message, "'be carried away captive into Egypt, but you may yet escape some day and rejoin your people, or may meet with some lot in which you may find contentment or even happiness there. At any rate, my last words to you are, bear patiently whatever may befall you. Remember always that your father was king of the Rebu, and whatever your station in life may be, try to be worthy of the rank to which you were born.' there is no greater happiness on a throne than in a cottage men make their own happiness and a man may be respected even though only a slave may the gods of your country preside over and protect you always the message was delivered by an old woman who had been with the queen since her birth and struck down with grief as amuba was at his mother's death he yet acknowledged to himself that even this loss was less hard to bear than the knowledge that she who had been so loved and honored by the people should undergo the humiliation of being dragged a slave in the train of the conquering egyptians he was however so prostrate with grief that he obeyed with indifference the order to leave the city and was scarcely moved when the egyptian officer appointed to make the selection chose him as one of the party that were to be taken as slaves to egypt prostrate as he was however he felt it to be a satisfaction and comfort when he found that jethro was also of the party set aside it is selfish jethro he said for me to feel glad that you too are to be dragged away as a slave but it will be a great comfort to have you with me i know almost all the others of the party but to none shall i be able to talk of my father and mother and my home here as i should to you whom i have known so long i am not sorry that i have been chosen jethro said for i have no family ties and now that the rebu are a conquered people i should have little satisfaction in my life here when we get to egypt we shall probably be separated but there is a march of months duration before us and during that time we may at least be together since then my being with you is as you say prince a comfort to you i am well content that i have been chosen i thought it a hard thing when my wife died but a few weeks after our marriage now i rejoice that it was so and that i can leave without any one's heart being wrung at my departure you and i prince perhaps of all those chosen will feel the least misery at the fate that has befallen us most of those here are leaving wives and children behind some of the youngest are still unmarried but they have fathers and mothers from whom they will be separated therefore let us not bemoan our lot for it might have been worse and our life in egypt may not be wholly unbearable that is just what my dear mother said jethro amuba replied repeating the message the queen had sent him 
my dear mistress was right jethro said we may find happiness in egypt as elsewhere and now let us try to cheer up our companions for in cheering them we shall forget our own misfortunes jethro and amuba went among the rest of the captives most of whom were prostrated with grief and did their best to rouse them from their stupor the egyptians have seen that the rebu are men in the field amuba said to some of them let them see that we can also bear misfortune like men grieving will not mitigate our lot nay it will add to its burden if the egyptians see that we bear our fate manfully they will have far more compassion upon us than if they see we bemoan ourselves remember we have a long and toilsome journey before us and shall need all our strength after all the hardship of our lot is as nothing to that of the women yonder we are accustomed to exercise and toil but the journey which we can support as well as the egyptians will be terrible to them delicate in nature as they are let us therefore set them an example of courage and patience let us bear ourselves as men whose suffering is unmerited who have been conquered but not disgraced who are prepared to defy fate and not to succumb to it amuba's words had a great effect upon the captives they regarded him with respect as the son of their late king and as one who would have been king himself had not this misfortune befallen them and his calmness and manly speech encouraged them to strive against their grief and to look their fate more hopefully in the face as long as the army remained in camp the hands of the captives were tied behind them but when the march was begun they were relieved of their bonds and were placed in the centre of an egyptian regiment it was a long and tedious journey on the way the train of captives was very largely increased by those who had been taken in the earlier conquests of the army and who had been left in charge of the troops told off to the various provinces brought into subjection by the egyptians until the army passed through on its homeward march provisions had been everywhere collected to supply it on its progress and as the distance traversed each day was small the captives suffered but little until they entered upon the passage of the desert tract between the southern point of syria and the mouth of the nile here although vast quantities of water were carried in the train of the army the supply given to the captives was extremely small and as the sun blazed down with tremendous heat and they were half suffocated by the dust which rose in clouds under the feet of the vast body of men their sufferings were very severe the rebu captives had gained the respect of the troops who escorted them by their manly bearing and the absence of the manifestations of grief which were betrayed by most of the other captives the regiment was composed of libyan mercenaries hardy active men inured alike to heat and fatigue during the three months which the march had occupied amuba and jethro and indeed most of the captives had acquired some knowledge of the egyptian language jethro had from the first impressed upon the young prince the great advantage this would be to them in the first place it would divert their thoughts from dwelling upon the past and in the second it would make their lot more bearable in egypt you must remember he said that we shall be slaves and masters are not patient with their slaves they give them orders and if the order is not understood so much the worse for the slaves it will add to our value and therefore obtain for us better treatment if we are able to converse in their tongue amuba was thankful indeed when the gray monotony of the desert was succeeded by the bright verdure of the plains of egypt as they entered the land the order in which they had marched was changed and the long line of captives followed immediately after the chariot of the king each of them was laden with a portion of the spoil taken from their native country amuba bore on his head a large golden vase which had been used in the ceremonies of the temple jethro carried a rich helmet and armor which had belonged to the king the first city they entered amuba was astonished at the massive splendor of the buildings and at the signs of comfort and wealth which everywhere met his eye the streets were thronged with people who bending to the ground shouted their acclamations as the king passed along and who gazed with interest and surprise at the long procession of captives representing the various nations who had been subjected to his arms most of all he was surprised at the temples with their long avenues of sphinxes the gigantic figures representing the gods the rows of massive pillars the majesty and grandeur of the edifices themselves how were they built jethro he exclaimed over and again 
how were these massive stones placed in order how did they drag these huge figures across the plains what tools could they have used to carve them out of the solid granite i am afraid amuba jethro said grimly for the lad had positively forbidden him to address him any longer as prince saying that such title addressed to a slave was no better than mockery we are likely to learn to our cost before long how they manage these marvels for marvels they assuredly are it must have taken the strength of thousands of men to have transported even one of these strange figures and although the people themselves may have aided in the work you may be sure the slaves bore the brunt of it but what is the meaning of these figures jethro surely neither in this country nor in any other are there creatures with the faces of women and the bodies of lions and great wings such as these have some too have the faces of men and the bodies of bulls while others have heads like birds and bodies like those of men assuredly there can be no such creatures amuba and i wonder that a people so enlightened and wise as the egyptians should choose such strange figures for their gods i can only suppose that these figures represent their attributes rather than the gods themselves do you see the human head may represent their intelligence the bodies of the lions or bulls their strength and power the wings of the bird their swiftness i do not know that it is so but it seems to me that it is possible that it may be something of this sort we cannot but allow that their gods are powerful since they give them victory over all other people but no doubt we shall learn more of them and of many other things in time the journey was continued for another three weeks and was the cause of constant surprises to the captives the extraordinary fertility of the land especially struck them cultivation among the rebu was of a very primitive description and the abundance and variety of the crops that everywhere met their eye seemed to them absolutely marvellous irrigation was not wholly unknown to the rebu and was carried on to a considerable extent in persia but the enormous works for the purpose in egypt the massive embankments of the river the network of canals and ditches the order and method everywhere apparent filled them with surprise and admiration many of the cities and temples greatly surpassed in magnificence and splendor those they had first met with and amuba's wonder reached its climax when they arrived at memphis till lately the capital of egypt the wealth and contents of the city astonished the captives but most of all were they surprised when they saw the enormous bulk of the pyramids rising a few miles distant from the town and learned that these were some of the tombs of the kings the country had now altered in character on the left a range of steep hills approached the river and as the march proceeded similar though not so lofty hills were seen on the right at last after another fortnight's travelling a shout of joy from the army proclaimed that thebes the capital of egypt the goal of the long and weary march was in view thebes stood on both sides of the nile on the eastern bank the largest portion of the population was gathered but this part of the city was inhabited principally by the poorer class there was too a large population on the libyan side of the nile the houses being densely packed near the bank of the river behind these were numbers of temples and palaces while the tombs of the kings and queens were excavated in a valley further back whose precipitous sides were honeycombed with the rock sepulchres of the wealthy as the dwelling-houses were all low the vast piles of the temples palaces and public buildings rose above them and presented a most striking appearance to those approaching the city which lay in a great natural amphitheatre the hills on both sides narrowing toward the river both above and below it the march of the royal army from memphis had been on the western bank of the river and it was the great libyan suburb with its palaces and temples that they were approaching as they neared the city an enormous multitude poured out to welcome the king and the returning army shouts of enthusiasm were raised the sound of trumpets and other musical instruments filled the air religious processions from the great temples moved with steady course through the dense crowd which separated at once to allow of the passage of the figures of the gods and of the priests and attendants bearing their emblems 
indeed jethro amuba exclaimed with enthusiasm it is almost worth while being made a slave if it is only to witness this glorious scene what a wonderful people are these what knowledge and power and magnificence why my father's palace would be regarded as a mere hut in thebes and our temples of which we thought so much are pygmies by the side of these immense edifices all that is true enough amuba and i do not say that i too am not filled with admiration and yet you know the rebu several times drove back their forces and man for man are more than a match for their soldiers our people are taller than they by half a head we have not so much luxury nor did we want it all this must make people effeminate perhaps so amuba assented but you must remember it is not so very long ago that we were a people living in tents and wandering at will in search of pasture and we have not i think become effeminate because we have settled down and built towns no one can say that the egyptians are not brave certainly it is not for us to say so though i agree with you that physically they are not our equals see how the people stare and point at us jethro i should think they have never seen a race like ours with blue eyes and fair hair though even among them there are varying shades of darkness the nobles and upper classes are lighter in hue than the common people the surprise of the egyptians was indeed great at the complexion of their captives and the decoration of their walls has handed down in paintings which still remain the blue eyes and fair hair of the rebu the rejoicings upon the return of the king went on for several days at the end of that time the captives were distributed by the royal order some were given to the generals who had most distinguished themselves many were assigned to the priests while the great bulk were sent to labor upon the public works the rebu captives whose singular complexion and fairness caused them to be regarded with special interest were distributed among the special favorites of the king many of the girls were assigned to the queen and royal princesses others to the wives of the priests and generals who formed the council of the king the men were for the most part given to the priests for service about the temples to his great delight amuba found that jethro and himself were among the eight captives who were assigned to the service of the priests of one of the great temples this was scarcely the effect of chance for the captives were drawn up in line and the number assigned to each temple were marched off together in order that there might be no picking and choosing of the captives but that they might be divided impartially between the various temples and as jethro always placed himself by amuba's side it naturally happened that they fell to the same destination on reaching the temple the little band of captives were again drawn up and the high priest ameres a grave and distinguished-looking man walked along the line scrutinizing them he beckoned to amuba to step forward henceforth he said you are my servant behave well and you will be well treated he again walked down the line and amuba saw that he was going to choose another and threw himself on his knees before him will my lord pardon my boldness he said but may i implore you to choose yonder man who stood next beside me he has been my friend from childhood he covered me with his shield in battle he has been a father to me since i have lost my own do not i implore you my lord separate us now you will find us both willing to labor at whatsoever you may give us to do the priest listened gravely it shall be as you wish he said it is the duty of every man to give pleasure to those around him if it lies in his power and as your friend is a man of thews and sinews and has a frank and honest face he will assuredly suit me as well as another do you therefore both follow me to my house the other captives saluted amuba as he and jethro turned to follow the priest observed the action and said to the lad were you a person of consequence among your people that they thus at parting salute you rather than your comrade who is older than you i am the son of him who was their king amuba said he fell in action with your troops and had not our city been taken and the nation subdued by the egyptians i should have inherited the throne is it so the priest said truly the changes and fortunes of life are strange i wonder that being the son of their king you were not specially kept by thotmes himself i think that he knew it not 
amuba said we knew not your customs and my fellow captives thought that possibly i might be put to death were it known that i was a son of their king and therefore abstained from all outward marks of respect which indeed would to one who was a slave like themselves have been ridiculous perhaps it is best so the priest said thoughtfully you would not have been injured for we do not slay our captives taken in war still maybe your life will be easier to bear as the servant of a priest than in the household of the king you had better however mention to no one the rank you have borne for it might be reported to the king and then you might be sent for to the palace unless indeed you would rather be a spectator of the pomp and gaiety of the court than a servant in a quiet household i would far rather remain with you my lord amuba said eagerly you have already shown the kindness of your heart by granting my request and choosing my comrade jethro as my fellow-slave and i feel already that my lot will be a far happier one than i had ventured to hope judge not hastily by appearances the priest said at the same time here in egypt slaves are not treated as they are among the wild peoples of nubia and the desert there is a law for all and he who kills a slave is punished as if he took the life of an egyptian however i think i can say that your life will not be a hard one you have intelligence as is shown by the fact that you have so rapidly acquired sufficient knowledge of our tongue to speak it intelligibly can you too speak our language he asked jethro i can speak a little jethro said but not nearly so well as amuba my lips are too old to fashion a strange tongue as rapidly as can his younger ones you speak sufficiently well to understand the priest said and doubtless will in time acquire our tongue perfectly this is my house the priest entered an imposing gateway on each side of which stretched a long and lofty wall at a distance of fifty yards from the gate stood a large dwelling compared to which the royal abode which amuba had been brought up in was but a miserable hut enclosed within the walls was a space of ground some three hundred yards square which was laid out as a garden avenues of fruit trees ran all round it a portion was laid out as a vineyard while separated from the rest by an avenue of palm trees was a vegetable garden in front of the house was a large piece of water in which floated a gaily painted boat aquatic plants of all kinds bordered its edges graceful palms grouped their foliage over it the broad flat leaves of lilies floated on its surface while the white flowers which amuba had seen carried in all the religious processions and by large numbers of people of the upper rank and which he heard were called the lotus rose above them the two captives were struck with surprise and admiration at the beauty of the scene and forgot for a moment that they were slaves as they looked round at a vegetation more beautiful than they had ever beheld a smile passed over the countenance of the priest perfect happiness is for no man he said and yet methinks that you may in time learn at least contentment here End of chapter three Chapter four of the Cat of Bubastes A Tale of Ancient Egypt This Librivox recording is in the public domain The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty Chapter four An Easy Servitude Just as the priest finished speaking, a lad of about the same age as Amuba appeared on the portico of the house, and ran down to his father oh father he exclaimed have you brought two of those strange captives home we saw them in the procession and marveled greatly at the color of their hair and eyes mysa and i particularly noticed this lad whose hair is almost the color of gold as usual chebron your tongue outruns your discretion this youth understands enough egyptian to know what you are saying and it is not courteous to speak of a person's characteristics to his face the lad flushed through his olive cheeks pardon me he said courteously to amuba i did not think for a moment that one who had but newly arrived among us understood our language do not apologize amuba replied with a smile doubtless our appearance is strange to you and indeed even among the peoples of lydia and persia there are few whose hair and eyes are as fair as ours even had you said that you did not like our appearance i should not have felt hurt for all people i think like that to which they are accustomed 
in any case it is good of you to say that you regret what you said people do not generally think that captives have feelings chebron's apology was right his father said among us politeness is the rule and every egyptian is taught to be considerate to all people it is just as easy to be polite as to be rude and men are served better for love than for fear and are they to stay here father chebron asked or have you only brought them for to-day they are to stay here my son i have chosen them from those set aside for our temple i selected the younger because he was about your age and it is good for a man to have one near him who has been brought up with him and is attached to him who although circumstances may not have made them equal in condition can yet be a comrade and a friend and such i hope you will find in amuba for such he tells me is his name i have said whom circumstances have placed in an inferior position for after all circumstances are everything this youth in his own country held a position even higher than you do here for he was the son of the king and since his father fell in battle would now be the king of his people had they not been subjected to us therefore chebron bear it always in mind that although misfortune has placed him a captive among us he is in birth your superior and treat him as you yourself would wish to be treated did you fall a captive into the hands of a hostile nation i will gladly treat you as my friend the young egyptian said frankly to amuba although you are so different from me in race i can see in your face that you are true and loyal besides he added i am sure that my father would not have bade me so trust you had he not read your character and been certain that you will be a fit friend for me you and your father are both good amuba replied i know how hard is the lot of captives taken in war for we rebu had many slaves whom we took in various expeditions and i was prepared to suffer you can judge then how grateful i feel to our gods that they have placed me in hands so different from those i had looked for and i swear to you chebron that you shall find me faithful and devoted to you so too will you find my friend here who in any difficulty would be far more able to render you service than i could he was one of our bravest warriors he drove my chariot in the great battle we fought with your people and saved my life several times and should you need the service of a strong and brave man jethro will be able to aid you and have you been in battle chebron asked in surprise that was the first time i had ever fought with men amuba said but i had often hunted the lion and he is almost as terrible an enemy as your soldiers i was young to go to battle but my father naturally wanted me to take my place early among the fighting men of our nation by the way chebron ameres said i would warn you mention to no one the rank that amuba held in his own country were it known he might be taken away from us to serve in the palace his people who were taken captives with him said nothing as to his rank fearing that ill might befall him were it known and it was therefore supposed that he was of the same rank as the other captives who were all men of noble birth among the rebu therefore tell no one not even your mother or your sister mysa if there is a secret to be kept the fewer who know it the better while this conversation had been going on amuba had been narrowly examining the lad who had promised to treat him as a friend like his father he was fairer in complexion than the majority of the egyptians the lighter hue being indeed almost universal among the upper class he was much shorter and slighter than the young rebu but he carried himself well and had already in his manner something of the calm and dignity that distinguished egyptians born to high rank he was disfigured as amuba thought by the custom general throughout egypt of having his head smoothly shaven except one lock which fell down over the left ear this as amuba afterward learned was the distinguishing sign of youth and would be shaved off when he attained man's estate married or entered upon a profession at present his head was bare but when he went out he wore a close-fitting cap with an orifice through which the lock of hair passed out and fell down to his shoulder he had not yet taken to the custom general among the upper and middle classes of wearing a wig this general shaving of the head had to amuba a most unpleasant effect until he became accustomed to it it was adopted doubtless by the egyptians for the purpose of coolness and cleanliness 
but amuba thought that he would rather spend any amount of pains in keeping his hair free from dust than to go about in the fantastic and complicated wigs that the egyptians wore the priest now led them within the house on passing through the entrance they entered a large hall along its side ran a row of massive columns supporting the ceiling which projected twelve feet from each wall the walls were covered with marble and other colored stones the floor was paved with the same material a fountain played in the middle and threw its water to a considerable height for the portion of the hall between the columns was open to the sky seats of a great variety of shapes stood about the room while in great pots were placed palms and other plants of graceful foliage the ceiling was painted with an elaborate pattern in colors a lady was seated upon a long couch it had no back but one end was raised as a support for the arm and the ends were carved into the semblance of the heads of animals two nubian slave girls stood behind her fanning her and a girl about twelve years old was seated on a low stool studying from a roll of papyrus she threw it down and jumped to her feet as her father entered and the lady rose with a languid air as if the effort of even so slight a movement was a trouble to her oh papa the girl began but the priest checked her with a motion of his hand my dear he said to his wife i have brought home two of the captives whom our great king has brought with him as trophies of his conquest he has handed many over for our service and that of the temples and these two have fallen to my share they were of noble rank in their own country and we will do our best to make them forget the sad change in their position you are always so peculiar in your notions Amaris, the lady said more pettishly than would have been expected from her languid movements they are captives and i do not see that it makes any matter what they were before they were captives so that they are captives now by all means treat them as you like so that you do not place them about me for their strange colored hair and eyes and their white faces make me shudder oh mamma i think it is so pretty misa exclaimed i do wish my hair was gold-colored like that boy's instead of being black like every one else's the priest shook his head at his daughter reprovingly but she seemed in no way abashed for she was her father's pet and knew well enough that he was never seriously angry with her i do not propose placing them near you amensi he said calmly in reply to his wife indeed it seems to me that you have already more attendants about you than you can find any sort of employment for the lad i have specially allotted to chebron as to the other i have not exactly settled as to what his duties will be won't you give him to me papa misa said coaxingly fatina is not at all amusing and dolma the nubian girl can only look good-natured and show her white teeth but as we can't understand each other at all i don't see that she is of any use to me and what use do you think you could make of this tall rebu the priest asked smiling i don't quite know papa misa said as with her head a little on one side she examined jethro critically but i like his looks and i am sure he could do all sorts of things for instance he could walk with me when i want to go out he could tow me round the lake in the boat he could pick up my ball for me and could feed my pets when you are too lazy to feed them yourself the priest put in very well misa we will try the experiment jethro shall be your special attendant and when you have nothing for him to do which will be the best part of the day he can look after the waterfowl zonbo never attends them properly do you understand that he asked jethro jethro replied by stepping forward taking the girl's hand and bending over it until his forehead touched it there is an answer for you misa you indulge the children too much Amaris, his wife said irritably i do not think in all egypt there are any children so spoiled as ours other men's sons never speak unless addressed and do not think of sitting down in the presence of their father i am astonished indeed that you who are looked up to as one of the wisest men in egypt should suffer your children to be so familiar with you perhaps my dear Amaris said with a placid smile it is because i am one of the wisest men in egypt my children honor me in their hearts as much as do those who are kept in slave-like subjection how is a boy's mind to expand if he does not ask questions and who should be so well able to answer his questions as his father 
there children you can go now take your new companions with you and show them the garden and your pets we are fortunate indeed jethro amuba said as they followed chebron and mysa into the garden when we pictured to ourselves as we lay on the sand at night during our journey hither what our life would be we never dreamed of anything like this we thought of tilling the land of aiding to raise the great dams and embankments of quarrying stones for the public buildings of a grinding and hopeless slavery and the only thing that ever we ventured to hope for was that we might toil side by side and now see how good the gods have been to us not only are we together but we have found friends in our masters a home in this strange land truly it is wonderful amuba this priest ameres is a most excellent person one to be loved by all who come near him we have indeed been most fortunate in having been chosen by him the brother and sister led the way through an avenue of fruit trees at the end of which a gate led through the high paling of rushes into an enclosure some fifty feet square it was surrounded by trees and shrubs and in their shade stood a number of wooden structures in the centre was a pool occupying the third of the area and like the large pond before the house bordered with aquatic plants at the edge stood two ibises while many brilliantly plumaged waterfowl were swimming on its surface or cleaning their feathers on the bank as soon as the gate closed there was a great commotion among the waterfowl the ibises advanced gravely to meet their young mistress the ducks set up a chorus of welcome those on the water made for the shore while those on land followed the ibises with loud quackings but the first to reach them were two gazelles which bounded from one of the wooden huts and were in an instant beside them thrusting their soft muzzles into the hands of chebron and mysa while from the other structures arose a medley of sounds the barking of dogs and the sounds of welcome from a variety of creatures this is not your feeding time you know chebron said looking at the gazelles and for once we have come empty-handed but we will give you something from your stores see jethro this is their larder and he led the way into a structure somewhat larger than the rest along the walls were a number of boxes of various sizes while some large bins stood below them here you see he went on opening one of the bins and taking from it a handful of freshly cut vetches and going to the door and throwing it down before the gazelles this is their special food it is brought in fresh every morning from our farm which lies six miles away the next bin contains the seed for the waterfowl it is all mixed here you see wheat and peas and pulse and other seeds mysa do give them a few handfuls for i can hardly hear myself speak from their clamour in this box above you see there is a pan of sopped bread for the cats there is a little mixed with the water but only a little for it will not keep good those cakes are for them too those large plain hard-baked cakes in the next box are for the dogs they have some meat and bones given them two or three times a week these frogs and toads in this cage are for the little crocodile he has a tank all to himself all these other boxes are full of different food for the other animals you see there's a picture of the right animal upon each so there is no fear of making a mistake we generally feed them ourselves three times a day when we are here but when we are away it will be for you to feed them and please mysa said above all things be very particular that they have all got fresh water they do love fresh water so much and sometimes it is so hot that the pans dry up in an hour after it has been poured out you see the gazelles can go to the pond and drink when they are thirsty but the others are fastened up because they won't live peaceably together as they ought to do but we let them out for a bit while we are here the dogs chase the waterfowl and frighten them and the cats will eat up the little ducklings which is very wrong when they have plenty of proper food and the ichneumon even when we are here would quarrel with the snakes if we let him into their house they are very troublesome that way though they are all so good with us the houses all want making nice and clean of a morning the party went from house to house inspecting the various animals all of which were most carefully attended the dogs which were chebron said of a nubian breed were used for hunting while on comfortable beds of fresh rushes three great cats lay blinking on large cushions but got up and rubbed against mysa and chebron in a token of welcome a number of kittens that were playing about together rushed up with upraised tails and loud mewings 
amuba noticed that their two guides made a motion of respect as they entered the house where the cats were as well as toward the dogs the ichneumon and the crocodile all of which were sacred animals in thebes many instructions were given by mysa to jethro as to the peculiar treatments that each of her pets demanded and having completed their rounds the party then explored the garden and amuba and jethro were greatly struck by the immense variety of plants which had indeed been raised from seeds or roots brought from all the various countries where the egyptian arms extended for a year the time passed tranquilly and pleasantly to amuba in the household of the priest his duties and those of jethro were light in his walks and excursions amuba was chebron's companion he learned to row his boat when he went out fishing on the nile when thus out together the distinction of rank was altogether laid aside but when in thebes the line was necessarily more marked as chebron could not take amuba with him to the houses of the many friends and relatives of his father among the priestly and military classes when the priest and his family went out to a banquet or entertainment jethro and amuba were always with the party of servants who went with torches to escort them home the service was a light one in their case but not so in many others for the egyptians often drank deeply at these feasts and many of the slaves always took with them light couches upon which to carry their masters home even among the ladies who generally took their meals apart from the men upon these occasions drunkenness was by no means uncommon when in the house amuba was often present when chebron studied and as he himself was most anxious to acquire as much as he could of the wisdom of the egyptians chebron taught him the hieroglyphic characters and he was ere long able to read the inscriptions upon the temple and public buildings and to study from the papyrus scrolls of which vast numbers were stowed away in pigeon-holes ranged round one of the largest rooms in the house when chebron's studies were over jethro instructed him in the use of arms and also practised with amuba a teacher of the use of the bow came frequently for egyptians of all ranks were skilled in the use of the national weapon and the rebu captives already skilled in the bow as used by their own people learned from watching his teaching of chebron to use the longer and much more powerful weapon of the egyptians whenever mysa went outside the house jethro accompanied her waiting outside the house as she visited until she came out or going back to fetch her if her stay was a prolonged one greatly they enjoyed the occasional visits made by the family to their farm here they saw the cultivation of the fields carried on watched the plucking of the grapes and their conversion into wine to extract the juice the grapes were heaped in a large flat vat above which ropes were suspended a dozen barefooted slaves entered the vat and trod out the grapes using the ropes to lift themselves in order that they might drop with greater force upon the fruit amuba had learned from chebron that although he was going to enter the priesthood as an almost necessary preliminary for state employment he was not intended to rise to the upper rank of the priesthood but to become a state official my elder brother will no doubt some day succeed my father as high priest of osiris he told amuba i know that my father does not think that he is clever but it is not necessary to be very clever to serve in the temple i thought that of course i too should come to high rank in the priesthood for as you know almost all posts are hereditary and though my brother as the elder would be high priest i should be one of the chief priests also but i have not much taste that way and rejoiced much when one day saying so to my father he replied at once that he should not urge me to devote my life to the priesthood for that there were many other offices of state which would be open to me and in which i could serve my country and be useful to the people almost all the posts in the service of the state are indeed held by the members of priestly families they furnish governors to the provinces and not infrequently generals to the army some he said are by disposition fitted to spend their lives in ministering in the temples and it is doubtless a high honour and happiness to do so but for others a more active life and a wider field of usefulness is more suitable engineers are wanted for the canal and irrigation works judges are required to make the law respected and obeyed diplomatists to deal with foreign nations governors for the many peoples over whom we rule therefore my son if you do not feel a longing to spend your life in the service of the temple by all means turn your mind to study which will fit you to be an officer of the state 
be assured that i can obtain for you from the king a post in which you will be able to make your first essay and so if deserving rise to high advancement there were few priests during the reign of thotmes the third who stood higher in the opinion of the egyptian people than ameres his piety and learning rendered him distinguished among his fellows he was high priest in the temple of osiris and was one of the most trusted of the counsellors of the king he had by heart all the laws of the sacred books he was an adept in the inmost mysteries of the religion his wealth was large and he used it nobly he lived in a certain pomp and state which were necessary for his position but he spent but a tithe of his revenues and the rest he distributed among the needy if the nile rose to a higher level than usual and spread ruin and destruction among the cultivators ameres was ready to assist the distressed if the rise of the river was deficient he always set the example of remitting the rents of the tenants of his broad lands and was ready to lend money without interest to tenants of harder or more necessitous landlords yet among the high priesthood ameres was regarded with suspicion and even dislike it was whispered among them that learned and pious as he was the opinions of the high priest were not in accordance with the general sentiments of the priesthood that although he performed punctiliously all the numerous duties of his office and took his part in the sacrifices and processions of the god yet he lacked reverence for him and entertained notions widely at variance with those of his fellows ameres was in fact one of those men who refuse to be bound by the thoughts and opinions of others and to whom it is a necessity to bring their own judgment to bear on every question presented to them his father who had been high priest before him for the great offices of egypt were for the most part hereditary while he had been delighted at the thirst for knowledge and the enthusiasm for study in his son had been frequently shocked at the freedom with which he expressed his opinions as step by step he was initiated into the sacred mysteries already at his introduction to the priesthood ameres had mastered all there was to learn in geometry and astronomy he was a skilful architect and was deeply versed in the history of the nation he had already been employed as supervisor in the construction of canals and irrigation works on the property belonging to the temple and in all these respects his father had every reason to be proud of the success he had attained and the estimation in which he was held by his fellows it was only the latitude which he allowed himself in consideration of religious questions which alarmed and distressed his father the egyptians were the most conservative of peoples for thousands of years no change whatever took place in their constitution their manners customs and habits it was the fixed belief of every egyptian that in all respects their country was superior to any other and that their laws and customs had approached perfection all from the highest to the lowest were equally bound by these the king himself was no more independent than the peasant his hour of rising the manner in which the day should be employed the very quantity and quality of food he should eat were all rigidly dictated by custom he was surrounded from his youth by young men of his own age sons of priests chosen for their virtue and piety thus he was freed from the influence of evil advisers and even had he so wished it had neither means nor power of oppressing his subjects whose rights and privileges were as strictly defined as his own in a country then where every man followed the profession of his father and where from time immemorial everything had proceeded on precisely the same lines the fact that ameres the son of the high priest of osiris and himself destined to succeed to that dignity should entertain opinions differing even in the slightest from those held by the leaders of the priesthood was sufficient to cause him to be regarded with marked disfavor among them it was indeed only because his piety and benevolence were as remarkable as his learning and knowledge of science that he was enabled at his father's death to succeed to his office without opposition indeed even at that time the priests of higher grade would have opposed his election but ameres was as popular with the lower classes of the priesthood as with the people at large and their suffrages would have swamped those of his opponents the multitude had indeed never heard so much as a whisper against the orthodoxy of the high priest of osiris they saw him ever foremost in the sacrifices and processions they knew that he was indefatigable in his services in the temple and that all his spare time was devoted to works of benevolence and general utility 
and as they bent devoutly as he passed through the streets they little dreamed that the high priest of osiris was regarded by his chief brethren as a dangerous innovator and yet it was on one subject only that he differed widely from his order versed as he was in the innermost mysteries he had learned the true meaning of the religion of which he was one of the chief ministers he was aware that osiris and isis the six other great gods and the innumerable divinities whom the egyptians worshipped under the guise of deities with the heads of animals were in themselves no gods at all but mere attributes of the power the wisdom the goodness the anger of the one great god a god so mighty that his name was unknown and that it was only when each of his attributes was given an individuality and worshipped as a god that it could be understood by the finite sense of man all this was known to ameres and the few who like him had been admitted to the inmost mysteries of the egyptian religion the rest of the population in egypt worshipped in truth and in faith the animal-headed gods and the animals sacred to them and yet as to these animals there was no consensus of opinion in one no more division of the kingdom the crocodile was sacred in another he was regarded with dislike and the ichneumon that was supposed to be his destroyer was deified in one the goat was worshipped and in another eaten for food and so it was throughout the whole of the list of sacred animals which were regarded with reverence or indifference according to the gods who were looked upon as the special tutelary deities of the gnome it was the opinion of ameres that the knowledge confined only to the initiated should be more widely disseminated and without wishing to extend it at present to the ignorant masses of the peasantry and laborers he thought that all the educated and intelligent classes of egypt should be admitted to an understanding of the real nature of the gods they worshipped and the inner truths of their religion he was willing to admit that the process must be gradual and that it would be necessary to enlarge gradually the circle of the initiated his proposals were nevertheless received with dismay and horror by his colleagues they asserted that to allow others besides the higher priesthood to become aware of the deep mysteries of their religion would be attended with terrible consequences in the first place it would shake entirely the respect and reverence in which the priesthood were held and would annihilate their influence the temples would be deserted and losing the faith which they now so steadfastly held in the gods people would soon cease to have any religion at all there are no people they urged on the face of the earth so moral so contented so happy and so easily ruled as the egyptians but what would they be did you destroy all their beliefs and launch them upon a sea of doubt and speculation no longer would they look up to those who have so long been their guides and teachers and whom they regard as possessing a knowledge and wisdom infinitely beyond theirs they would accuse us of having deceived them and in their blind fury destroy alike the gods and their ministers the idea of such a thing is horrible ameres was silenced though not convinced he felt indeed that there was much truth in the view they entertained of the matter and that terrible consequences would almost certainly follow the discovery by the people that for thousands of years they had been led by the priests to worship as gods those who were no gods at all and he saw that the evil which would arise from a general enlightenment of the people would outweigh any benefit that they could derive from the discovery the system had as his colleagues said worked well and the fact that the people worshipped as actual deities imaginary beings who were really but the representatives of the attributes of the infinite god could not be said to have done them any actual harm at any rate he alone and unaided could do nothing only with the general consent of the higher priesthood could the circle of initiated be widened and any movement on his part alone would simply bring upon him disgrace and death therefore after unburdening himself in a council composed only of the higher initiates he held his peace and went on the quiet tenor of his way enlightened as he was he felt that he did no wrong to preside at the sacrifices and take part in the services of the gods he was worshipping not the animal-headed idols but the attributes which they personified he felt pity for the ignorant multitude who laid their offerings upon the shrine and yet he felt that it would shatter their happiness instead of adding to it were they to know that the deity they worshipped was a myth 
he allowed his wife and daughter to join with the priestesses in the service at the temple and in his heart acknowledged that there was much in the contention of those who argued that the spread of the knowledge of the inner mysteries would not conduce to the happiness of all who received it indeed he himself would have shrunk from disturbing the minds of his wife and daughter by informing them that all their pious ministrations in the temple were offered to non-existent gods that the sacred animals they tended were in no way more sacred than others save that in them were recognized some shadow of the attributes of the unknown god his eldest son was he saw not of a disposition to be troubled with the problems which gave him so much subject for thought and care he would conduct the services consciously and well he would bear a respectable part when on his accession to the high priesthood he became one of the counsellors of the monarch he had common sense but no imagination the knowledge of the inmost mysteries would not disturb his mind in the slightest degree and it was improbable that even a thought would ever cross his mind that the terrible deception practised by the enlightened upon the whole people was anything but right and proper Ameres saw, however, that Chebron was altogether differently constituted. He was very intelligent, and was possessed of an ardent thirst for knowledge of all kinds, but he had also his father's habit of looking at matters from all points of view, and of thinking for himself. The manner in which Ameres had himself superintended his studies and taught him to work with his understanding, and to convince himself that each rule and precept was true, before proceeding to the next, had developed his thinking powers altogether ameres saw that the doubts which filled his own mind as to the honesty or even expediency of keeping the whole people in darkness and error would probably be felt with even greater force by chebron he had determined therefore that the lad should not work up through all the grades of the priesthood to the upper rank but should after rising high enough to fit himself for official employment turn his attention to one or other of the great departments of state. End of chapter 4《Chapter 5 of The Cat of Bubastes, A Tale of Ancient Egypt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty. • Chapter 5 in lower egypt i am going on a journey ameres said to his son a few days after the return from the farm i shall take you with me chebron for i am going to view the progress of a fresh canal that is being made on our estate in goshen the officer who is superintending it has doubts whether when the sluices are opened it will altogether fulfil its purpose and i fear that some mistake must have been made in the levels i have already taught you the theory of the work it is well that you should gain some practical experience in it for there is no more useful or honourable profession than that of carrying out works by which the floods of the nile are conveyed to the thirsty soil thank you father i should like it greatly chebron replied in a tone of delight for he had never been far south of thebes and may amuba go with us yes i was thinking of taking him the high priest said jethro can also go for i take a retinue with me did i consult my own pleasure i would far rather travel without this state and ceremony but as a functionary of state i must conform to the customs and indeed even in goshen it is as well always to travel in some sort of state the people there are of a different race to ourselves although they have dwelt a long time in the land and conform to its customs still they are notoriously a stubborn and obstinate people and there is more trouble in getting the public works executed there than in any other part of the country i have heard of them father they belong to the same race as the shepherd kings who were such bitter tyrants to egypt how is it that they stayed behind when the shepherds were driven out they are of the same race but they came not with them and formed no part of their conquering armies the shepherds who as you know came from the land lying to the east of the great sea had reigned here for a long time when this people came they were relations of the joseph who as you have read in your history was chief minister of egypt he came here as a slave and was certainly brought from the country whence our oppressors came but they say that he was not of their race but that his forefathers had come into the land from a country lying far to the east 
but that i know not suffice it he gained the confidence of the king became his minister and ruled wisely as far as the king was concerned though the people have little reason to bless his memory in his days was a terrible famine and they say he foretold its coming and that his gods gave him warning of it so vast granaries were constructed and filled to overflowing and when the famine came and the people were starving the grain was served out but in return the people had to give up their land thus the whole tenure of the land in the country was changed and all became property of the state the people remaining as its tenants upon the land they formerly owned then it was that the state granted large tracts to the temples and others to the military order so that at present all tillers of land pay rent either to the king the temples or the military order thus it is that the army can always be kept up in serviceable order dwelling by its tens of thousands in the cities assigned to it thus it is that the royal treasury is always kept full and the services of the temples maintained the steppe has added to the power and dignity of the nation and has benefited the cultivators themselves by enabling vast works of irrigation to be carried out works that could never have been accomplished had the land been the property of innumerable small holders each with his own petty interests but you said father that it has not been for the good of the people nor has it in one respect chebron for it has drawn a wide chasm between the aristocratic classes and the bulk of the people who can never own land and have no stimulus to exertion but they are wholly ignorant father they are peasants and nothing more i think they might be something more chebron under other circumstances however that is not the question we are discussing this joseph brought his family out of the land at the east of the great sea and land was given to them in goshen and they settled there and throve and multiplied greatly partly because of the remembrance of the services joseph had rendered to the state partly because they were a kindred people they were held in favor as long as the shepherd kings ruled over us but when egypt rose and shook off the yoke they had groaned under so long and drove the shepherds and their followers out of the land this people for they had now so grown in numbers as to be in verity a people remained behind and they have been naturally viewed with suspicion by us they are akin to our late oppressors and lying as their land does to the east they could open the door to any fresh army of invasion happily now that our conquests have spread so far and the power of the people eastward of the great sea has been completely broken this reason for distrust has died out but joseph's people are still viewed unfavorably prejudices take long to die out among the masses and the manner in which these people cling together marrying only among themselves and keeping themselves apart from us gives a certain foundation for the dislike which exists personally i think the feeling is unfounded they are industrious and hard-working though they are i own somewhat disposed to resist authority and there is more difficulty in obtaining the quota of men from goshen for the execution of public works than from any other of the provinces of egypt do they differ from us in appearance father considerably chebron they are somewhat fairer than we are their noses are more aquiline and they are physically stronger they do not shave their heads as we do and they generally let the hair on their faces grow for a long time after their settlement i believe that they worshipped their own gods or rather their own god but they have long adopted our religion surely that must be wrong chebron said each nation has its gods and if a people forsake their own gods it is not likely that other gods would care for them as they do for their own people it is a difficult question chebron and one which it is best for you to leave alone at present you will soon enter into the lower grade of the priesthood and although if you do not pass into the upper grades you will never know the greater mysteries you will yet learn enough to enlighten you to some extent chebron was too well trained in the respect due to a parent to ask further questions but he renewed the subject with amuba as they strolled in the garden together afterward i wonder how each nation found out who were the gods who specially cared for them amuba i have no idea amuba who had never given the subject a thought replied you are always asking puzzling questions chebron well but it must have been somehow chebron insisted do you suppose that any one ever saw our gods and if not how do people know that one has the head of a dog and another of a cat or what they are like 
are some gods stronger than others because all people offer sacrifices to the gods and ask for their help before going to battle some are beaten and some are victorious some win today and lose tomorrow is it that these gods are stronger one day than another or that they do not care to help their people sometimes why do they not prevent their temples from being burned and their images from being thrown down it is all very strange it is all very strange chebron i was not long ago asking jethro nearly the same question but he could give me no answer why do you not ask your father he is one of the wisest of the egyptians i have asked my father but he will not answer me chebron said thoughtfully i think sometimes that it is because i have asked these questions that he does not wish me to become a high priest i did not mean anything disrespectful to the gods but somehow when i want to know things and he will not answer me i think he looks sadly as if he was sorry at heart that he could not tell me what i want to know have you ever asked your brother necho oh necho is different chebron said with an accent almost of disdain necho gets into passions and threatens me with all sorts of things but i can see he knows no more about it than i do for he has a bewildered look in his face when i ask him these things and once or twice he has put his hands to his ears and fairly run away as if i was saying something altogether profane and impious against the gods on the following day the high priest and his party started for goshen the first portion of the journey was performed by water the craft was a large one with a pavilion of carved wood on deck and two masts with great sails of many colors cunningly worked together persons of consequence traveling in this way were generally accompanied by at least two or three musicians playing on harps trumpets or pipes for the egyptians were passionately fond of music and no feast was thought complete without a band to discourse soft music while it was going on the instruments were of the most varied kinds stringed instruments predominated and these varied in size from tiny instruments resembling zithers to harps much larger than those used in modern times in addition to these they had trumpets of many forms reed instruments cymbals and drums the last named long and narrow in shape Ameres, however, although not averse to music after the evening meal, was of too practical a character to care for it at other times. He considered that it was too often an excuse for doing nothing and thinking of nothing, and therefore dispensed with it except on state occasions. As they floated down the river he explained to his son the various objects which they passed, told him the manner in which the fishermen in their high boats made of wooden planks bound together by rushes, or in smaller crafts shaped like punts formed entirely of papyrus bound together with bands of the same plant caught the fish pointed out the entrances to the various canals and explained the working of the gates which admitted the water gave him the history of the various temples towns and villages named the many waterfowl basking on the surface of the river and told him of their habits and how they were captured by the fowlers he pointed out the great tombs to him and told him by whom they were built the largest my son are monuments of pride and folly the greatest of the pyramids was built by a king who thought it would immortalize him but so terrible was the labor that its construction inflicted upon the people that it caused him to be execrated and he was never laid in the mausoleum he had built for himself you see our custom of judging kings after their death is not without advantages after a king is dead the people are gathered together and the question is put to them has the dead monarch ruled well if they reply with assenting shouts he is buried in a fitting tomb which he has probably prepared for himself or which his successor raises to him but if the answer is that he has reigned ill the sacred rites in his honor are omitted and the mausoleum he has raised stands empty for ever there are few indeed of our kings who have thus merited the execration of their people for as a rule the careful manner in which they are brought up surrounded by youths chosen for their piety and learning and the fact that they like the meanest of their subjects are bound to respect the laws of the land act as sufficient check upon them but there is no doubt that the knowledge that after death they must be judged by the people exercises a wholesome restraint even upon the most reckless i long to see the pyramids chebron said are they built of brick or stone for i have been told that their surface is so smooth and shiny that they look as if cut from a single piece they are built of vast blocks of stone each of which employed the labor of many hundreds of men to transport from the quarries where they were cut were they the work of slaves or of the people at large vast numbers of slaves captured in war labored at them 
the priest replied but numerous as these were they were wholly insufficient for the work and well nigh half the people of egypt were forced to leave their homes to labor at them so great was the burden and distress that even now the builders of these pyramids are never spoken of save with curses and rightly so for what might not have been done with the same labor usefully employed why the number of the canals in the country might have been doubled and the fertility of the soil vastly increased vast tracts might have been reclaimed from the marshes and shallow lakes and the produce of the land might have been doubled and what splendid temples might have been raised chebron said enthusiastically doubtless my son the priest said quietly after a slight pause but though it is meet and right that the temples of the gods shall be worthy of them still as we hold that the gods love egypt and rejoice in the prosperity of the people i think that they might have preferred so vast an improvement as the works i speak of would have effected in the condition of the people even to the raising of long avenues of sphinxes and gorgeous temples in their own honor yes one would think so chebron said thoughtfully and yet father we are always taught that our highest duty is to pay honor to the gods and that in no way can money be so well spent as in raising fresh temples and adding to the beauty of those that exist our highest duty is assuredly to pay honor to the gods chebron but how that honor can be paid most acceptably is another and deeper question which you are a great deal too young to enter upon it will be time enough for you to do that years hence there do you see that temple standing on the right bank of the river that is where we stop for the night my messenger will have prepared them for our coming and all will be in readiness for us as they approached the temple they saw a number of people gathered on the great stone steps reaching down to the water's edge and strains of music were heard on landing ameres was greeted with the greatest respect by the priests all bowing to the ground while those of inferior order knelt with their faces to the earth and did not raise them until he had passed on as soon as he entered the temple a procession was formed priests bearing sacred vessels and the symbols of the gods walked before him to the altar a band of unseen musicians struck up a processional air priestesses and maidens also carrying offerings and emblems followed ameres he naturally took the principal part in the sacrifice at the altar cutting the throat of the victim and making the offering of the parts specially set aside for the gods after the ceremonies were concluded the procession moved in order as far as the house of the chief priest here all again saluted ameres who entered followed by his son and attendants a banquet was already in readiness to this ameres sat down with the principal priests while chebron was conducted to the apartment prepared for him where food from the high table was served to him amuba and the rest of the suit of the high priest were served in another apartment as soon as chebron had finished he joined amuba let us slip away he said the feasting will go on for hours and then there will be music far on into the night my father will be heartily tired of it all for he loves plain food and thinks that the priests should eat none other still as it would not be polite for a guest to remark upon the viands set before him i know that he will go through it all i have heard him say that it is one of the greatest trials of his position that whenever he travels people seem to think that a feast must be prepared for him whereas i know he would rather sit down to a dish of boiled lentils and water than have the richest dishes set before him is it going to be like this all the journey amuba asked oh no i know that all the way down the river we shall rest at a temple for did my father not do so the priests would regard it as a slight but then we leave the boat and journey in chariots or bullock carts when we reach goshen we shall live in a little house which my father has had constructed for him and where we shall have no more fuss and ceremony than we do at our own farm then he will be occupied with the affairs of the estates and in the works of irrigation and although we shall be with him when he journeys about as i am to begin to learn the duties of a superintendent i expect we shall have plenty of time for amusement and sport they strolled for an hour or two on the bank of the river for the moon was shining brightly and many boats were passing up and down the latter drifted with the stream for the wind was so light that the sails were scarce filled the former kept close to the bank and were either propelled by long poles or towed by parties of men on the bank when they returned to the house they listened for a time to the music and then retired to their rooms 
amuba lay down upon the soft couch made of a layer of bulrushes covered with a thick woolen cloth and rested his head on a pillow of bulrushes which jethro had bound up for him for neither of the rebu had learned to adopt the egyptian fashion of using a stool for a pillow these stools were long and somewhat curved in the middle to fit the neck for the common people they were roughly made of wood smoothed where the head came but the head stools of the wealthy were constructed of ebony cedar and other scarce woods beautifully inlaid with ivory amuba had made several trials of these head stools but had not once succeeded in going to sleep with one under his head half an hour sufficing to cause such an aching of his neck that he was glad to take to the pillow of rushes to which he was accustomed indeed to sleep upon the stool pillows it was necessary to lie upon the side with an arm so placed as to raise the head to the exact level of the stool and as amuba had been accustomed to throw himself down and sleep on his back or any other position in which he first lay for he was generally thoroughly tired either in hunting or by exercise of arms he found the cramped and fixed position necessary for sleeping with a hard stool absolutely intolerable for a week the journey down the river continued and then they arrived at memphis where they remained for some days ameres passed the time in ceremonial visits and in taking part in the sacrifices in the temple chebron and amuba visited all the temples and public buildings and one day went out to inspect the great pyramids attended by jethro this surpasses anything i have seen jethro said as they stood at the foot of the great pyramid of cheops what a wonderful structure but what a frightful waste of human labor it is marvellous indeed amuba said what wealth and power a monarch must have had to raise such a colossal pile i thought you said chebron that your kings were bound by laws as well as other people if so how could this king have exacted such terrible toil and labor from his subjects as this must have cost kings should be bound by the laws chebron replied but there are some so powerful and haughty that they tyrannize over the people cheops was one of them my father has been telling me that he ground down the people to build this wonderful tomb for himself but he had his reward for at his funeral he had to be judged by the public voice and the public condemned him as a bad and tyrannous king therefore he was not allowed to be buried in the great tomb that he had built for himself i know not where his remains rest but this huge pyramid stands as an eternal monument of the failure of human ambition the greatest and costliest tomb in the world but without an occupant save that Thelien, one of his queens was buried here in a chamber near that destined for the king the people did well jethro said heartily but they would have done better still had they risen against him and cut off his head directly they understood the labor he was setting them to do on leaving memphis one more day's journey was made by water and the next morning the party started by land ameres rode in a chariot which was similar in form to those used for war except that the sides were much higher forming a sort of deep open box against which those standing in it could rest their bodies amuba and chebron travelled in a wagon drawn by two oxen the rest of the party went on foot at the end of two days they arrived at their destination the house was a small one compared to the great mansion near thebes but it was built on a similar plan a high wall surrounded an enclosure of a quarter of an acre in the centre stood the house with one large apartment for general purposes and small bedchambers opening from it on either side the garden although small was kept with scrupulous care rows of fruit trees afforded a pleasant shade in front of the house there was a small pond bordered with lilies and rushes a nubian slave and his wife kept everything in readiness for the owner whenever he should appear a larger retinue of servants was unnecessary as a cook and barber were among those who travelled in the train of ameres the overseer of the estate was in readiness to receive the high priest i have brought my son with me ameres said when the ceremonial observances and salutations were concluded he is going to commence his studies in irrigation but i shall not have time at present to instruct him i wish him to become proficient in outdoor exercises and beg you to procure men skilled in fishing fowling and hunting so that he can amuse his unoccupied hours with sport at thebes he has but rare opportunities for these matters for excepting in the preserves game has become well-nigh extinct while as for fowling there is none of it to be had in upper egypt while here in the marshes birds abound 
the superintendent promised that suitable men should be forthcoming one of each caste for in egypt men always followed the occupation of their fathers and each branch of trade was occupied by men forming distinct castes who married only in their own caste working just as their fathers had done before them and did not dream of change or elevation thus the fowler knew nothing about catching fish or the fishermen of fowling both however knew something about hunting for the slaying of the hyenas that carried off the young lambs and kids from the villages and the great river horses which came out and devastated the fields was part of the business of every villager the country where they now were was for the most part well cultivated and watered by the canals which were filled when the nile was high a day's journey to the north lay lake minzale a great shallow lagoon which stretched away to the great sea from which it was separated only by a narrow bank of sand the canals of the nile reached nearly to the edge of this and when the river rose above its usual height and threatened to inundate the country beyond the usual limits and to injure instead of benefiting the cultivators great gates at the end of these canals would be opened and the water find its way into the lagoon there were two connections between some of the lower arms of the nile and the lake so that the water although salt was less so than that of the sea the lake was the abode of innumerable waterfowl of all kinds and swarmed also with fish these lakes formed a fringe along the whole of the northern coast of egypt and it was from these and the swampy land near the mouths of the nile that the greater portion of the fowl and fish that formed important items in the food of the egyptians was drawn to the southeast lay another chain of lakes whose water was more salt than that of the sea it was said that in olden times these had been connected by water both with the great sea to the north and the southern sea and even now when the south wind blew strong and the waters of the southern sea were driven up the gulf with force the salt water flowed into lake timsa so called because it swarmed with crocodiles i shall be busy for some days to begin with ameres said to his son on the evening of their arrival and it will therefore be a good opportunity for you to see something of the various branches of sport that are to be enjoyed in this part of egypt the steward will place men at your disposal and you can take with you amuba and jethro he will see that there are slaves to carry provisions and tents for it will be necessary for much of your sport that you rise early and not improbably you may have to sleep close at hand in the morning chebron had an interview with the steward who told him that he had arranged the plan for an expedition you will find little about here my lord he said beyond such game as you would obtain near thebes but a day's journey to the north you will be near the margin of the lake and there you will get sport of all kinds and can at your will fish in its waters snare waterfowl hunt the great river horse in the swamps or chase the hyena in the low bushes on the sand hills i have ordered all to be in readiness and in an hour the slaves with the provisions will be ready to start the hunters of this part of the country will be of little use to you so i have ordered one of my chief men to accompany you he will see that when you arrive you obtain men skilled in the sport and acquainted with the locality and the habits of the wild creatures there my lord your father said you would probably be away for a week and that on your return you would from time to time have a day's hunting in these parts he thought that as your time would be more occupied then it were better that you should make this distant expedition to begin with an hour later some twenty slaves drew up before the house carrying on their heads provisions tents and other necessaries a horse was provided for chebron but he decided that he would walk with amuba there is no advantage in going on a horse he said when you have to move at the pace of footmen and possibly we may find something to shoot on the way the leader of the party upon hearing chebron's decision told him that doubtless when they left the cultivated country which extended but a few miles further north game would be found six dogs accompanied them four of them were powerful animals kept for the chase of the more formidable beasts the hyena or lion for although there were no lions in the flat country they abounded in the broken grounds at the foot of the hills to the south the other two were much more lightly built and were capable of running down a deer dogs were held in high honor in egypt in some parts of the country they were held to be sacred in all they were kept as companions and friends in the house as well as for the purposes of the chase 
the season was the cold one and the heat was so much less than they were accustomed to at thebes where the hills which enclosed the plain on which the city was built cut off much of the air and seemed to reflect the sun's rays down upon it that the walk was a pleasant one chebron and amuba carrying their bows walked along chatting gaily at the head of the party jethro and rabba the foreman came next then followed two slaves leading the dogs in leashes ready to be slipped at a moment's notice while the carriers followed in the rear occasionally they passed through scattered villages where the women came to their doors to look at the strangers and where generally offerings of milk and fruit were made to them the men were for the most part at work in the fields they are a stout-looking race stronger and more bony than our own people chebron remarked to the leader of the party they are stubborn to deal with he replied they till their ground well and pay their portion of the produce without grumbling but when any extra labor is asked of them there is sure to be trouble it is easier to manage a thousand egyptian peasants than a hundred of these israelites and if forced labor is required for the public service it is always necessary to bring down the troops before we can obtain it but indeed they are hardly treated fairly and have suffered much they arrived in egypt during the reign of usertuin the first and had land allotted to them during the reign of the king and other successors of his dynasty they were held in favor and multiplied greatly but when the theban dynasty succeeded that of memphis the kings finding this foreign people settled here and seeing that they were related by origin to the shepherd tribes who at various times had threatened our country from the east and have even conquered portions of it and occupied it for long periods regarded them with hostility and have treated them rather as prisoners of war than as a portion of the people many burdens have been laid upon them they have had to give far more than their fair share of labor toward the public works the making of bricks and the erection of royal tombs and pyramids it is strange that they do not shave their heads as do our people chebron said but i do not amuba laughed nor jethro it is different with you chebron replied you do not labor and get the dust of the soil in your hair besides you do keep it cut quite short still i think you would be more comfortable if you followed our fashion it is all a matter of habit amuba replied to us when we first came here the sight of all the poorer people going about with their heads shaven was quite repulsive and as for comfort surely one's own hair must be more comfortable than the great wigs that all of the better class wear they keep off the sun chebron said when one is out of doors and are seldom worn in the house and then when one comes in one can wash off the dust i can wash the dust out of my hair amuba said still i do think that these israelites wear their hair inconveniently long and yet the long plates that their women wear down their back are certainly graceful and the women themselves are fair and comely chebron shook his head they may be fair amuba but i should think that they would make very troublesome wives they lack altogether the subdued and submissive look of our women they would i should say have opinions of their own and not be submissive to their lords is that not so rabba the women like the men have spirit and fire the foreman answered and have much voice in all domestic matters but i do not know that they have more than with us they can certainly use their tongues for at times when soldiers have been here to take away gangs of men for public works they have had more trouble with them than with the men the latter are sullen but they know that they must submit but the women gather at a little distance and scream curses and abuse at the troops and sometimes even pelt them with stones knowing that the soldiers will not draw weapon upon them although not infrequently it is necessary in order to put a stop to the tumult to haul two or three of their leaders off to prison i thought they were viragos chebron said with a laugh i would rather hunt a lion than have the women of one of these villages set upon me in a few miles cultivation became more rare sand hills took the place of the level fields and only here and there in the hollows were patches of cultivated ground rabba now ordered the slave leading the two fleet dogs to keep close up and be in readiness to slip them we may see deer at any time now he said they abound in these sandy deserts which form their shelter and yet are within easy distance of fields where when such vegetation as is here fails them they can go for food a few minutes later a deer started from a clump of bushes the dogs were instantly let slip and started in pursuit hurry on a hundred yards and take your position on that mound rabba exclaimed to chebron while at the same time he signalled to the slaves behind to stop the dogs know their duty and you will see they will presently drive the stag within shot 
chebron called amuba to follow him and ran forward by the time they reached the mound the stag was far away with the dogs laboring in pursuit at present they seemed to have gained but little if at all upon him and all were soon hidden from sight among the sand hills in spite of the assurance of rabba the lads had doubts whether the dogs would ever drive their quarry back to the spot where they were standing and it was full a quarter of an hour before pursuers and pursued came in sight again the pace had greatly fallen off for one of the dogs was some twenty yards behind the stag the other was out on its flank at about the same distance away and was evidently aiding in turning it toward the spot where the boys were standing we will shoot together chebron said it will come within fifty yards of us they waited until the stag was abreast of them the dog on its flank had now fallen back to the side of his companion as if to leave the stag clear for the arrows of the hunters the lads fired together just as the stag was abreast but it was running faster than they had allowed for and both arrows flew behind it they uttered exclamations of disappointment but before the deer had run twenty yards it gave a sudden leap into the air and fell over jethro had crept up and taken his post behind some bushes to the left of the clump in readiness to shoot should the others miss and his arrow had brought the stag to the ground well done jethro amuba shouted it is so long since i was out hunting that i seem to have lost my skill but it matters not since we have brought him down the dogs stood quiet beside the deer that was struggling on the ground being too well trained to interfere with it jethro ran out and cut its throat the others were soon standing beside it it was of a species smaller than those to which the deer of europe belong with two long straight horns it will make a useful addition to our fare to-night rabba said although perhaps some of the other sorts are better eating do the dogs never pull them down by themselves amuba asked very seldom these two are particularly fleet but i doubt whether they would have caught it these deer can run for a long time and although they will let dogs gain upon them they can leave them if they choose still i have known this couple run down a deer when they could not succeed in driving it within bowshot but they know very well they ought not to do so for of course deer are of no use for food unless the animals are properly killed and the blood allowed to escape several other stags were startled but these all escaped the dogs being too fatigued with their first run to be able to keep up with them the other dogs were therefore unloosed and allowed to range about the country they startled several hyenas some of which they themselves killed others they brought to bay until the lads ran up and dispatched them with their arrows while others which took to flight in sufficient time got safely away for the hyena unless overtaken just at the start can run long and swiftly and tire out heavy dogs such as those the party had with them after walking some fifteen miles the lads stopped suddenly on the brow of a sand hill in front of them was a wide expanse of water bordered by a band of vegetation long rushes and aquatic plants formed a band by the water's edge while here and there huts with patches of cultivated ground dotted the country we are at the end of our journey rabba said these huts are chiefly inhabited by fowlers and fishermen we will encamp at the foot of this mound it is better for us not to go too near the margin of the water for the air is not salubrious to those unaccustomed to it the best hunting ground lies a few miles to our left for there when the river is high floods come down through a valley which is at all times wet and marshy there we may expect to find game of all kinds in abundance End of chapter 5chapter six of the cat of bubastes a tale of ancient egypt this librivox recording is in the public domain the cat of bubastes by g a henty chapter six fowling and fishing the tents which were made of light cloth intended to keep off the night dews rather than to afford warmth were soon pitched fires were lighted with fuel that had been brought with them in order to save time in searching for it and rabba went off to search for fish and fowl he returned in half an hour with a peasant carrying four ducks and several fine fish we shall do now he said with these and the stag our larder is complete everything but meat we have brought with us chebron although he had kept on bravely was fatigued with his walk and was glad to throw himself down on the sand and enjoy the prospect which to him was a new one for he had never before seen so wide an expanse of water 
when on the top of the hill he had made out a faint dark line in the distance and this rabba told him was the bank of sand that separated the lake from the great sea now from his present position this was invisible and nothing but a wide expanse of water stretching away until it seemed to touch the sky met his view here and there it was dotted with dark patches which were rabba told him clumps of waterfowl and in the shallow water near the margin which was but a quarter of a mile away he could see vast numbers of wading birds white cranes and white and black ibises while numbers of other waterfowl looking like black specks moved about briskly among them sometimes with loud cries a number would rise on the wing and either make off in a straight line across the water or circle round and settle again when they found that their alarm was groundless it is lovely is it not he exclaimed to amuba who was standing beside him leaning on his bow and looking over the water amuba did not reply immediately and chebron looking up saw that there were tears on his cheeks what is it amuba he asked anxiously it is nothing chebron but the sight of this wide water takes my thoughts homeward our city stood on a sea like this not so large as they say is this great sea we are looking at but far too large for the eye to see across and it was just such a view as this that i looked upon daily from the walls of our palace save that the shores were higher maybe you will see it again some day amuba chebron said gently amuba shook his head i fear the chances are small indeed chebron jethro and i have talked it over hundreds of times and on our route hither we had determined that if we fell into the hands of harsh masters we would at all hazards try some day to make our escape but the journey is long and would lie through countries subject to egypt the people of the land to be passed over speak languages strange to us and it would be well nigh impossible to make the journey in safety still we would have tried it as it is we are well contented with our lot and should be mad indeed to forsake it on the slender chances of finding our way back to the land of the rebu where indeed even if we reached it i might not be well received for who knows what king may now be reigning there and if you could get away and were sure of arriving there safely would you exchange all the comforts of a civilized country like egypt for a life such as you have described to me among your own people there can be no doubt chebron that your life here is far more luxurious and that you are far more civilized than the rebu by the side of your palaces our houses are but huts we are ignorant even of reading and writing a pile of rushes for our beds and a rough table and stools constitute our furniture but perhaps after all one is not really happier for all the things you have you may have more enjoyments but you have greater cares i suppose every man loves his own country best but i do not think that we can love ours as much as you do in the first place we have been settled there but a few generations large numbers of our people constantly moving west either by themselves or joining with one of the peoples who push past us from the far east beside wherever we went we should take our country with us build houses like those we left behind live by the chase or fishing in one place as another while the egyptians could nowhere find a country like egypt i suppose it is the people more than the country the familiar language and the familiar faces and ways i grant freely that the egyptians are a far greater people than we more powerful more learned the masters of many arts the owners of many comforts and luxuries and yet one longs sometimes for one's free life among the rebu one thing is amuba you were a prince there and you are not here had you been but a common man born to labor to toil or to fight at the bidding of your king you might perhaps find that the life even of an egyptian peasant is easier and more pleasant than yours was that may be amuba said thoughtfully and yet i think that the very poorest among us was far freer and more independent than the richest of your egyptian peasants he did not grovel on the ground when the king passed along it was open to him if he was braver than his fellows to rise in rank he could fish or hunt or till the ground or fashion arms as he chose his life was not tied down by usage or custom he was a man a poor one perhaps a half savage one if you will but he was a man while your egyptian peasants free as they may be in name are the very slaves of law and custom but i see that the meal is ready and i have a grand appetite so have i amuba it is almost worth while walking a long way for the sake of the appetite one gets at the end 
the meal was an excellent one one of the slaves who had been brought was an adept at cooking and fish birds and venison were alike excellent and for once the vegetables that formed so large a portion of the ordinary egyptian repast were neglected what are we going to do tomorrow, Raba? Chebron asked after the meal was concluded. I have arranged for tomorrow, if such is your pleasure, my lord, that you shall go fowling. A boat will take you along the lake to a point about three miles off where the best sport is to be had. Then when the day is over it will carry you on another eight miles to the place I spoke to you of, where good sport was to be obtained. I shall meet you on your landing there, and will have everything in readiness for you that will do well chebron said amuba and jethro you will of course come with me as soon as it was daylight rabba led chebron down to the lake and the lad with amuba and jethro entered the boat which was constructed of rushes covered with pitch and drew only two or three inches of water two men with long poles were already in the boat they were fowlers by profession and skilled in all the various devices by which the waterfowl were captured they had during the night been preparing the boat for the expedition by fastening rushes all round it the lower ends of these dipped into the water the upper ends were six feet above it and the rushes were so thickly placed together as to form an impenetrable screen the boat was square at the stern and here only was there an opening a few inches wide in the rushes to enable the boatman standing there to propel the boat with his pole one of the men took his station here the other at the bow where he peered through a little opening between the rushes and directed his comrade in the stern as to the course he should take in the bottom of the boat lay two cats who knowing that their part was presently to come watched all that was being done with an air of intelligent interest a basket well stored with provisions and a jar of wine were placed on board and the boat then pushed noiselessly off Parting the reeds with their fingers and peeping out, the boys saw that the boat was not making out into the deeper part of the lake, but was skirting the edge, keeping only a few yards out from the band of rushes at its margin. "'Do you keep this distance all the way?' Chebron asked the man with the pole. The man nodded. "'As long as we are close to the rushes the waterfowl do not notice our approach, while were we to push out into the middle they might take the alarm. Although we often do capture them in that way, but in that case we get to windward of the flock we want to reach, and then drift down slowly upon them. But we shall get more sport now by keeping close in. The birds are numerous, and you will soon be at work.' In five minutes the man at the bow motioned his passengers that they were approaching a flock of waterfowl. Each of them took up his bow and arrows and stood in readiness, while the man in the stern used his pole even more quickly and silently than before. Presently, at a signal from his comrades, he ceased poling. All round the boat there were slight sounds, low contented quackings and flutterings of wings, as the birds raised themselves and shook the water from their backs. Parting the rushes in front of them, the two lads and Jethro peeped through them. They were right in the middle of a flock of wild fowl who were feeding without a thought of danger from the clump of rushes in their midst. The arrows were already in their notches, the rushes were parted a little further, and the three shafts were loosed. The twangs of the bows startled the ducks, and stopping feeding they gazed at the rushes with heads on one side. Three more arrows glanced out, but this time one of the birds aimed at was wounded only, and uttering a cry of pain and terror it flapped along the surface of the water. Instantly, with wild cries of alarm, the whole flock arose, but before they had fairly settled in their flight, two more fell pierced with arrows. The cats had been standing on the alert, and as the cry of alarm was given leaped overboard from the stern, and proceeded to pick up the dead ducks, among which were included that which had at first flown away, for it had dropped in the water about fifty yards from the boat. A dozen times the same scene was repeated until some three-score ducks and geese lay in the bottom of the boat. By this time the party had had enough of sport, and had indeed lost the greater part of their arrows, as all which failed to strike the bird aimed at went far down into the deep mud at the bottom and could not be recovered. "'Now let the men show us their skill with their throwing sticks,' Chebron said. "'You will see they will do better with them than we with our arrows.' The men at once turned the boat's head toward a patch of rushes growing from the shallow water a hundred yards out in the lake. Numbers of ducks and geese were feeding round it, and the whole rushes were in movement from those swimming and feeding among them, for the plants were just at that time in seed. The birds were too much occupied to mark the approach of this fresh clump of rushes. 
the men had removed the screen from the side of the boat furthest from the birds and now stood in readiness each holding half a dozen sticks about two feet long made of curved and crooked wood when close to the birds the boat was swung round and at once with deafening cries the birds rose but as they did so the men with great rapidity hurled their sticks one after another among them the last being directed at the birds which feeding among the rushes were not able to rise as rapidly as their companions the lads were astonished at the effect produced by these simple missiles so closely packed were the birds that each stick after striking one whirled and twisted among the others one missile frequently bringing down three or four birds the cats were in an instant at work the flapping and noise was prodigious for although many of the birds were killed outright others struck in the wing or leg were but slightly injured some made off along the surface of the water others succeeded in getting up and flying away but the greater part were either killed by the cats or knocked on the head by the poles of the two fowlers altogether twenty-seven birds were added to the store in the boat that puts our arrows to shame altogether amuba chebron said i have always heard that the fowlers on these lakes were very skilled with these throwing sticks of theirs but i could not have believed it possible that two men should in so short a space have effected such a slaughter but then i had no idea of the enormous quantities of birds on these lakes jethro was examining the sticks which as well as the ducks had been retrieved by the cats they are curious things he said to amuba i was thinking before the men used them that straight sticks would be much better and was wondering why they chose curved wood but i have no doubt now the shape has something to do with it you see as the men threw they gave them a strong spinning motion that seems the secret of their action it was wonderful to see how they whirled about among the fowl striking one on the head another on the leg another on the wing until they happened to hit one plump on the body that seemed to stop them i am sure one of those sticks that i kept my eyes fixed on must have knocked down six birds i will practice with these things and if i ever get back home i will teach their use to our people there are almost as many waterfowl on our sea as there are here i have seen it almost black with them down at the southern end where it is bordered by swamps and reed-covered marshes how do they catch them there jethro chebron asked they net them in decoys and sometimes wade out among them with their heads hidden among floating boughs and so get near enough to seize them by the legs and pull them under water in that way a man will catch a score of them before their comrades are any the wiser we catch them the same way here one of the fowlers who had been listening remarked we weave little bowers just large enough for our heads and shoulders to go into and leave three or four of them floating about for some days near the spot where we mean to work the wild fowl get accustomed to them and after that we can easily go among them and capture numbers i should think fowling must be a good trade chebron said it is good enough at times the man replied but the ducks are not here all the year the long-legged birds are always to be found here in numbers but the ducks are uncertain so are the geese at certain times in the year they leave us all together some say they go across the great sea to the north others that they go far south into nubia then even when they are here they are uncertain sometimes they are thick here then again there is scarce one to be seen and we hear they are swarming on the lakes further to the west of course the wading birds are of no use for food so you see when the ducks and geese are scarce we have a hard time of it then again even when we have got a boat load we have a long way to take it to market and when the weather is hot all may get spoiled before we can sell them and the price is so low in these parts when the flocks are here that it is hard to lay by enough money to keep us and our families during the slack time if the great cities thebes and memphis lay near to us it would be different they could consume all we could catch and we should get better prices but unless under very favorable circumstances there is no hope of the fowl keeping good during the long passage up the river to thebes in fact were it not for our decoys we should starve in these of course we take them alive and send them in baskets to thebes and in that way get a fair price for them what sort of decoys do you use jethro asked many kinds the man replied sometimes we arch over the rushes tie them together at the top so as to form long passages over little channels among the rushes then we strew corn over the water and place near the entrance ducks which are trained to swim about outside until a flock comes near 
then they enter the passage feeding and the others follow there is a sort of door which they can push aside easily as they pass up but cannot open on their return that is the sort of decoy they use in our country jethro said another way the fowler went on is to choose a spot where the rushes form a thick screen twenty yards deep along the bank then a light net two or three hundred feet long is pegged down on to the shore behind them and thrown over the tops of the rushes reaching to within a foot or two of the water here it is rolled up so that when it is shaken out it will go down into the water then two men stand among the rushes at the end of the net while another goes out far on to the lake in a boat when he sees a flock of ducks swimming near the shore he pulls the boat toward them not so rapidly as to frighten them into taking flight but enough so to attract their attention and cause uneasiness he goes backward and forward gradually approaching the shore and of course managing so as to drive them toward the point where the net is when they are opposite this he closes in faster and the ducks all swim in among the rushes directly they are in the men at the ends of the net shake down the rolled up part and then the whole flock are prisoners after that the fowlers have only to enter the rushes and take them as they try to fly upward and are stopped by the net with luck two or three catches can be made in a day and a thousand ducks and sometimes double that number can be captured then they are put into flat baskets just high enough for them to stand in with their heads out through the openings at the top and so put on board the boat and taken up the nile yes i have often seen the baskets taken out of the boats chebron said and thought how cruel it was to pack them so closely but how do they feed them for they must often be a fortnight on the way the trader who has bought them of us and other fowlers waits until he has got enough together to freight a large craft for it would not pay to work upon a small scale accompanies them up the river and feeds them regularly with little balls made of moistened flour just in the same way that they do at the establishments in upper egypt where they raise fowl and stuff them for the markets if the boat is a large one and is taking up forty or fifty thousand fowl of course he takes two or three boys to help him for it is no light matter to feed such a Number, and each must have a little water as well as the meal it seems strange to us here where fowl are so abundant that people should raise and feed them just as if they were bullocks but i suppose it is true it is quite true chebron replied amuba and i went to one of the great breeding farms two or three months ago there are two sorts one where they hatch the other where they fat them the one we went to embraced both branches but this is unusual from the hatching places collectors go round to all the people who keep fowls for miles round and bring in eggs and besides these they buy them from others at a greater distance the eggs are placed on sand laid on the floor of a low chamber and this is heated by means of flues from a fire underneath it requires great care to keep the temperature exactly right but of course men who pass their lives at this work can regulate it exactly and know by the field just what is the heat at which the eggs should be kept there are eight or ten such chambers in the place we visited so that every two or three days one or other of them hatches out and is ready for fresh eggs to be put down the people who send the eggs come in at the proper time and receive each a number of chickens in proportion to the eggs they have sent one chicken being given for each two eggs some hatchers give more some less what remain over are payment for their work so you see they have to be very careful about the hatching if they can hatch ninety chickens out of every hundred eggs it pays them very well but if owing to the heat being too great or too little only twenty or thirty out of every hundred are raised they have to make good the loss of course they always put in a great many of the eggs they have themselves bought they are thus able to give the right number to their customers even if the eggs have not turned out well those that remain after the proper number has been given to the farmers the breeders sell to them or to others it being no part of their business to bring up the chickens the fattening business is quite different at these places there are long rows of little boxes piled up on each other into a wall five feet high the door of each of these boxes has a hole in it through which the fowl can put its head with a little sort of shutter that closes down on it a fowl is placed in each bow then the attendants go around two together one carries a basket filled with little balls of meal the other lifts the shutter and as the fowl puts its head out catches it by the neck makes it open its beak and with his other hand pushes the ball of meal down its throat they are so skilful that the operation takes scarce a moment then they go on to the next and so on down the long rows until they have fed the last of those under their charge then they begin again afresh why do they keep them in the dark the fowler asked 
They told us that they did it because in the dark they were not restless, and slept all the time between their meals. Then each time the flap is lifted they think it is daylight, and pop out their heads at once to see. In about ten days they get quite fat and plump, and are ready for market. It seems a wonderful deal of trouble, the fowler said, but I suppose as they have a fine market close at hand, and can get good prices it pays them. It seems more reasonable to me than the hatching business. Why they should not let the fowls hatch their own eggs is more than I can imagine. Fowls will lay a vastly greater number of eggs than they will hatch, Chebron said. A well-fed fowl should lay two hundred and fifty eggs in the year, and left to herself she will not hatch more than two broods of fifteen eggs in each. Thus you see, as it pays the peasants much better to rear fowls than to sell eggs, it is to their profit to send their eggs to the hatching places, and so get a hundred and twenty-five chickens a year instead of thirty i suppose it does the fowler agreed but here we are my lord at the end of our journey there is the point where we are to land and your servant who hired us is standing there in readiness for you i hope that you are satisfied with your day's sport chebron said that they had been greatly pleased and in a few minutes the boat reached the landing place where rabba was awaiting them one of the fowlers carrying a dozen of the finest fowl they had killed accompanied them to the spot rabba had chosen for the encampment like the last, it stood at the foot of the sand hills, a few hundred yards from the lake. Is the place where we are going to hunt near here? was Chebron's first question. No, my lord, it is two miles away. But in accordance with your order last night, I have arranged for you to fish tomorrow. In the afternoon, I will move the tents a mile nearer to the country where you will hunt, but it is best not to go too close, for near the edge of these great swamps, the air is unhealthy to those who are not accustomed to it i long to get at the hunting chebron said but it is better as you say to have the day's fishing first for the work would seem tame after the excitement of hunting the river horse we shall be glad of our dinner as soon as we can get it for although we have done justice to the food you put on board we are quite ready again twelve hours of this fresh air from the sea gives one the appetite of a hyena everything is already in readiness my lord i thought it better not to wait for the game you brought home which will do well to-morrow and so purchased fish and fowl from the peasants as we have seen your boat for the last two or three hours we were able to calculate the time of your arrival and thus have everything in readiness the dinner was similar to that on the previous day except that a hare took the place of the venison a change for the better as the hare was a delicacy much appreciated by the egyptians the following day was spent in fishing for this purpose a long net was used and the method was precisely similar to that in use in modern times one end of the net was fastened to the shore the net itself being coiled up in the boat this was rowed out into the lake the fishermen paying out the net as it went a circuit was then made back to the shore where the men seized the two ends of the net and hauled it to land capturing the fish enclosed within its sweep after seeing two or three hauls made the lads went with jethro on board the boat they were provided by the fishermen with long two-pronged spears the boat was then quietly rowed along the edge of the rushes where the water was deeper than usual it was however so clear that they could see to the bottom and with their spears they struck at the fish swimming there at first they were uniformly unsuccessful as they were ignorant that allowance must be made for diffraction and were puzzled at finding that their spears instead of going straight down at the fish they struck at seemed to bend off at an angle at the water's edge the fishermen however explained to them that an allowance must be made for this the allowance being all the greater the greater the distance the fish was from the boat and that it was only when it lay precisely under them that they could strike directly at it but even after being instructed in the matter they succeeded but poorly and presently laid down their spears and contented themselves with watching their boatmen who rarely failed in striking and bringing up the prey they aimed at presently their attention was attracted to four boats each containing from six to eight men two had come from either direction and when they neared each other volleys of abuse were exchanged between their occupants what is all this about chebron asked as the two fishermen laid by their spears and with faces full of excitement turned round to watch the boats 
the boats come from two villages my lord between which at present there is a feud arising out of some fishing nets that were carried away they sent a regular challenge to each other a few days since as is the custom here and their champions are going to fight it out you see the number of men on one side are equal to those on the other and the boats are about the same size amuba and jethro looked on with great interest for they had seen painted on the walls representations of these fights between boatmen which were of common occurrence the egyptians being a very combative race and fierce feuds being often carried on for a long time between neighboring villages the men were armed with poles some ten feet in length and about an inch and a half in diameter their favorite weapons on occasions of this kind the boats had now come in close contact and a furious battle at once commenced the clattering of the sticks the heavy thuds of the blows and the shouts of the combatants creating a clamor that caused all the waterfowl within a circle of half a mile to fly screaming away across the lake the men all used their heavy weapons with considerable ability the greater part of the blows being warded off many however took effect some of the combatants being knocked into the water others fell prostrate in their boats while some dropped their long staves after a disabling blow on the arm it is marvellous that they do not all kill each other jethro said surely this shaving of the head amuba which has always struck us as being very peculiar has its uses for it must tend to thicken the skull for surely the heads of no other men could have borne such blows without being crushed like water jars that there was certainly some ground for jethro's supposition is proved by the fact that herodotus long afterward writing of the desperate conflicts between the villagers of egypt asserted that their skulls were thicker than those of any other people most of the men who fell into the water scrambled back into the boats and renewed the fight but some sank immediately and were seen no more at last when fully half the men on each side had been put hors de combat four or five having been killed or drowned the boats separated no advantage resting with either party and still shouting defiance and jeers at each other the men pulled in the direction of their respective villages are such desperate fights as these common chebron asked the fisherman yes there are often quarrels one of them replied quietly resuming his fishing as if nothing out of the ordinary way had taken place if they are waterside villages their champions fight in boats as you have seen if not equal parties meet at a spot halfway between the villages and decide it on foot sometimes they fight with short sticks the hand being protected by a basket hilt while on the left arm a piece of wood extending from the elbow to the tips of the fingers is fastened on by straps serving as a shield but more usually they fight with the long pole which we call the neboot it is a fine weapon jethro said and they guard their heads with it admirably sliding their hands far apart if i were back again amuba i should like to organize a regiment of men armed with those weapons it would need that the part used as a guard should be covered with light iron to prevent a sword or axe from cutting through it but with that addition they would make splendid weapons and footmen armed with sword and shield would find it hard indeed to repel an assault by them the drawback would be amuba observed that each man would require so much room to wield his weapon that they must stand far apart and each would be opposed to three or four swordsmen in the enemy's line that is true amuba and you have certainly hit upon the weak point in the use of such a weapon but for single combat or the fighting of broken ranks they would be grand when we get back to thebes if i can find any peasant who can instruct me in the use of these neboots i will certainly learn it you ought to make a fine player one of the fishermen said looking at jethro's powerful figure i should not like a crack on the head from a neboot in your hands but the sun is getting low and we had best be moving to the point where you are to disembark we have had another capital day rabba chebron said when they reached their new encampment i hope that the rest will turn out as successful i think that i can promise you that they will my lord i have been making inquiries among the villagers and find that the swamp in the river bed abounds with hippopotami how do you hunt them on foot no my lord there is enough water in the river bed for the flat boats made of bundles of rushes to pass up while in many places are deep pools in which the animals lie during the heat of the day are they ferocious animals 
amuba asked i have never yet seen one for though they say that they are common in the upper nile as well as found in swamps like this at its mouth there are none anywhere in the neighborhood of thebes i suppose that there is too much traffic for them and that they are afraid of showing themselves in such water there would be no food for them rabba said they are found only in swamps like this or in places on the upper nile where the river is shallow and bordered with aquatic plants on whose roots they principally live they are timid creatures and are found only in little frequented places when struck they generally try to make their escape for although occasionally they will rush with their enormous mouth open at a boat tear it in pieces and kill the hunter this very seldom happens as a rule they try only to fly they must be cowardly beasts jethro said scornfully i would rather hunt an animal be it ever so small that will make a fight for its life however we shall see upon the following morning they started for the scene of action an exclamation of surprise broke from them simultaneously when on ascending a sand hill they saw before them a plain a mile wide extending at their feet it was covered with rushes and other aquatic plants and extended south as far as the eye could see for one month in the year rabba said this is a river for eleven it is little more than a swamp though the shallower boats can make their way up it many miles but a little water always finds its way down either from the nile itself or from the canals it is one of the few places of northern egypt where the river horse is still found and none are allowed to hunt them unless they are of sufficient rank to obtain the permission of the governor of the province the steward wrote for and obtained this as soon as he knew by letter from your father that you were accompanying him and would desire to have some sport are there crocodiles there amuba asked many rabba replied although few are now found in the lakes the people here are not like those of the theban zone who hold them in high respect here they regard them as dangerous enemies and kill them without mercy end of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Cat of Bubastes: A Tale of Ancient Egypt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty. Chapter Seven: Hippopotamus and Crocodile. Guided by Raba, the party now descended to the edge of the swamp. Here, in the shallow water, lay three boats, or rather rafts, constructed of bundles of bulrushes. They were turned up in front so as to form a sort of swan-necked bow, and in outline were exactly similar to the iron of modern skates. Upon each stood a native with a pole for pushing the rafts along, and three or four spears. These were of unusual shape, and the lads examined them with curiosity. They had broad short blades, and these were loosely attached to the shafts, so that when the animal was struck the shaft would drop out, leaving the head embedded in its flesh. To the head was attached a cord which was wound up on a spindle passing through a handle. "'Those rafts do not look as if they would carry three, Chebron said. "'They will do so at a push,' the man replied, "'but they are better with two only.' i will stop on shore with your permission chebron jethro said i see there are a number of men here with ropes i suppose they have something to do with the business and i will accompany them the ropes are for hauling the beasts ashore after we have struck them well i will go and help pull them i can do my share at that and should be of no use on one of those little rafts indeed i think that my weight would bury it under the water we have been out this morning my lord the boatman said addressing chebron and have found out that there is a river horse lying in a pool a mile up the river i think he is a large one and will give us good sport chebron and amuba now took their places on the two rafts and the men laying down the spears and taking the poles pushed off from the shore noiselessly they made their way among the rushes sometimes the channels were so narrow that the reeds almost brushed the rafts on both sides then they opened out into wide pools and here the water deepened so much that the poles could scarce touch the bottom not a word was spoken as the men had warned them that the slightest noise would scare the hippopotami and cause them to sink to the bottom of the pools where they would be difficult to capture after half an hour's poling they reached a pool larger than any they had hitherto passed and extending on one side almost to the bank of the river 
the man on his raft now signed to chebron to take up one of the spears but the lad shook his head and motioned him to undertake the attack for he felt that ignorant as he was of the habits of the animal it would be folly for him to engage in such an adventure the man nodded for he had indeed been doubting as to the course which the affair would take for it needed a thrust with a very powerful arm to drive the spear through the thick hide of the hippopotamus amuba imitated chebron's example preferring to be a spectator instead of an actor in this unknown sport for three or four minutes the boats lay motionless then a blowing sound was heard and the boatman pointed to what seemed to the boys two lumps of black mud projecting an inch or two above the water near the margin of the rushes they could not have believed that these formed part of an animal but that slight ripples widening out on the glassy water showed that there had been a movement on the spot indicated with a noiseless push chebron's hunter sent the boat in that direction and then handed the end of the pole to chebron signing to him to push the boat back when he gave the signal when within ten yards of the two little black patches there was a sudden movement they widened into an enormous head and a huge beast rose to his feet startled at the discovery he had just made that men were close at hand in an instant the hunter hurled his spear with all his force tough as was the animal's hide the sharp head cut its way through with a roar the beast plunged into the rushes the shaft of the spear falling out of its socket as it did so and the strong cord ran out rapidly from the reel held by the hunter presently the strain ceased he has laid down again in shelter the hunter said we will now follow him and give him a second spear pushing the rushes aside the boat was forced along until they again caught sight of the hippopotamus that was standing up to its belly in water is he going to charge chebron asked grasping a spear no there is little chance of that should he do so and upset the boat throw yourself among the rushes and lie there with only your face above water i will divert his attention and come back and get you into the boat when he has made off another spear was thrown with good effect there was a roar and a great splash chebron thought that the animal was upon them but he turned off and dashed back to the pool where he had been first lying i thought that was what he would do the hunter said they always seek shelter in the bottom of the deep pools and here you see the water is not deep enough to cover him the boat again followed the hippopotamus amuba was still on his raft on the pool what has become of him chebron asked as they passed beyond the rushes he has sunk to the bottom of the pool amuba replied he gave me a start i can tell you we heard him bursting through the rushes and then he rushed out with his mouth open a mouth like a cavern and then just as i thought he was going to charge us he turned off and sank to the bottom of the pool how long will he lie there chebron asked the hunter a long time if he is left to himself but we are going to stir him up so saying he directed the boat toward the rushes nearest to the bank and pushed the boat through them oh here you are jethro chebron said seeing the rebu and the men he had accompanied standing on the bank what has happened chebron have you killed one of them we heard a sort of roar and a great splashing we have not killed him but there are two spearheads sticking into him the hunter handed the cords to the men and told them to pull steadily but not hard enough to break the cords then he took from them the end of the rope they carried and pulled back into the pool those cords are not strong enough to pull the great beast to the shore are they chebron asked oh no they would not move him but by pulling on them it causes the spearheads to give him pain he gets uneasy and rises to the surface in anger then you see i throw this noose over his head and they can pull upon that in two or three minutes the animal's head appeared above the water the instant it did so the hunter threw the noose the aim was correct and with a jerk he tightened it round the neck now pull he shouted the peasants pulled and gradually the hippopotamus was drawn toward the bank although struggling to swim in the opposite direction as soon however as he reached the shallow water and his feet touched the ground he threw his whole weight upon the rope the peasants were thrown to the ground and the rope dragged through their fingers as the hippopotamus again made his way to the bottom of the pool the peasants regained their feet and pulled on the rope and cords again the hippopotamus rose and was dragged to the shallow only to break away again for eight or ten times this happened he is getting tired now the hunter said next time or the time after they will get him on shore we will land then and attack him with spears and arrows the hippopotamus was indeed exhausted and allowed itself to be dragged ashore at the next effort without opposition 
as soon as it did so he was attacked with spears by the hunters jethro and the boys the latter found that they were unable to drive their weapons through the thick skin and betook themselves to their bows and arrows the hunters however knew the points at which the skin was thinnest and drove their spears deep into the animal just behind the foreleg while the boys shot their arrows at its mouth another noose had been thrown over its head as it issued from the water and the peasants pulling on the ropes prevented it from charging three or four more thrusts were given from the hunters then one of the spears touched a vital part the hippopotamus sank on its knees and rolled over dead the peasants sent up a shout of joy for the flesh of the hippopotamus is by no means bad eating and here was a store of food sufficient for the whole neighborhood shall we search for another my lord the hunter asked chebron no i think i have had enough of this there is no fun in killing an animal that has not spirit to defend itself what do you think amuba i quite agree with you chebron one might almost as well slaughter a cow what is that he exclaimed suddenly as a loud scream was heard at a short distance away it is a woman's voice chebron darted off in full speed in the direction of the sound closely followed by amuba and jethro they ran about a hundred yards along the bank when they saw the cause of the outcry an immense crocodile was making his way toward the river dragging along with it the figure of a woman in spite of his reverence for the crocodile chebron did not hesitate a moment but rushing forward smote the crocodile on the nose with all his strength with the shaft of his spear the crocodile dropped its victim and turned upon its assailant but jethro and amuba were close behind and these also attacked him the crocodile seeing this accession of enemies now set out for the river snapping its jaws together mind its tail one of the hunters exclaimed running up but the warning was too late for the next moment amuba received a tremendous blow which sent him to the ground the hunter at the same moment plunged his spear into the animal through the soft skin at the back of its leg jethro followed his example on the other side the animal checked its flight and turning round and round lashed with its tail in all directions keep clear of it the hunter shouted it is mortally wounded and will need no more blows in fact the crocodile had received its death wound its movements became more languid it ceased to lash its tail though it still snapped at those nearest to it but gradually this action also ceased its head sank and it was dead jethro as soon as he had delivered his blow ran to amuba are you hurt he asked anxiously no i don't think so amuba gasped the brute has knocked all the breath out of my body but that's better than if he had hit me in the leg for i think he would have broken it had he done so how is the woman is she dead i have not had time to see jethro replied let me help you to your feet and let us see if any of your ribs are broken i will see about her afterward amuba on getting up declared that he did not think he was seriously hurt although unable for the time to stand upright i expect i am only bruised jethro it was certainly a tremendous whack he gave me and i expect i shall not be able to take part in any sporting for the next few days the crocodile was worth a dozen hippopotami there was some courage about him they now walked across to chebron who was stooping over the figure of the crocodile's victim why she is but a girl amuba exclaimed she is no older than your sister chebron do you think she is dead chebron asked in hushed tones i think she has only fainted jethro replied here he shouted to one of the peasants who were gathered round the crocodile one of you run down to the water and bring up a gourd full i don't think she is dead amuba said it seemed to me that the crocodile had seized her by the leg we must carry her somewhere jethro said and get some woman to attend to her i will see if there is a hut near he sprang up to the top of some rising ground and looked round there is a cottage close at hand he said as he returned i dare say she belongs there bidding two of the peasants run to fetch some women he lifted up the slight figure and carried her up the slope the two lads following on turning round the foot of a sand-hill they saw a cottage lying nestled behind it it was neater and better kept than the majority of the huts of the peasants the walls of baked clay had been whitewashed and were half covered with bright flowers a patch of carefully cultivated ground lay around it jethro entered the cottage on a settle at the further end a man was sitting he was apparently of great age his hair and long beard were snowy white 
what is it he exclaimed as jethro entered has the god of our fathers again smitten me in my old age and taken from me my pet lamb i heard her cry but my limbs have lost their power and i could not rise to come to her aid i trust that the child is not severely injured jethro said we had just killed a hippopotamus when we heard her scream and running up found a great crocodile dragging her to the river but we soon made him drop her i trust that she is not severely hurt the beast seemed to us to have seized her by the leg we have sent to fetch some women doubtless they will be here immediately ah here's the water he laid the girl down upon a couch in the corner of the room and taking the gourd from the peasant who had brought it sprinkled some water on her face while amuba by his direction rubbed her hands it was some minutes before she opened her eyes and just as she did so two women entered the hut leaving the girl to their care jethro and the boys left the cottage i trust that the little maid is not greatly hurt amuba said by her dress it seems to me that she is an israelite though i thought we had left their land behind us on the other side of the desert still her dress resembles those of the women we saw in the village as we passed and it is well for her it does so for they wear more and thicker garments than the egyptian peasant women and the brute's teeth may not have torn her severely in a few minutes one of the women came out and told them that the maid had now recovered and that she was almost unhurt the crocodile seems to have seized her by her garments rather than her flesh and although the teeth have bruised her the skin is unbroken her grandfather would fain thank you for the service you have rendered him they re-entered the cottage the girl was sitting on the ground at her grandfather's feet holding one of his hands in hers while with his other he was stroking her head as they entered the women seeing that their services were no longer required left the cottage who are those to whom i owe the life of my grandchild the old man asked i am chebron the son of ameres the high priest of the temple of osiris at thebes these are my friends amuba and jethro two of the rebu nation who were brought to egypt and now live in my father's household we are his servants amuba said though he is good enough to call us his friends tis strange the old man said that the son of a priest of osiris should thus come to gladden the last few hours of one who has always withstood the egyptian gods and yet had the crocodile carried off my ruth it would have been better for her seeing that ere the sun has risen and set many times she will be alone in the world the girl uttered a little cry and rising on her knees threw her arms round the old man's neck it must be so my ruth i have lived a hundred and ten years in this land of the heathen and my course is run and were it not for your sake i should be glad that it is so for my life has been sorrow and bitterness i call her my grandchild but she is in truth the daughter of my grandchild and all who stood between her and me have passed away before me and left us alone together but she trusts in the god of abraham and he will raise up a protector for her chebron who had learned something of the traditions of the israelites dwelling in egypt saw by the old man's words that jethro's surmises were correct and that he belonged to that race you are an israelite he said gently how is it that you are not dwelling among your people instead of alone among strangers i left them thirty years back when ruth's mother was but a tottering child they would not suffer me to dwell in peace among them but drove me out because i testified against them because you testified against them chebron repeated in surprise yes my father was already an old man when i was born and he was one of the few who still clung to the faith of our fathers he taught me that there was but one god the god of abraham of isaac and of jacob and that all other gods were but images of wood and stone to that faith i clung though after a while i alone of all our people held to the belief the others had forgotten their god and worshipped the gods of the egyptians when i would speak to them they treated my words as ravings and as casting dishonor on the gods they served my sons went with the rest but my daughter learned the true faith from my lips and clung to it 
she taught her daughter after her and ten years ago when she too lay dying she sent ruth by a messenger to me praying me to bring her up in the faith of our fathers and saying that though she knew i was of a great age she doubted not that when my time came god would raise up protectors for the child so for ten years we have dwelt here together tilling and watering our ground and living on its fruit and by the sale of baskets that we weave and exchange for fish with our neighbors the child worships the god of our fathers and has grown and thriven here for ten years but my heart is heavy at the thought that my hours are numbered and that i see no way after me but that ruth shall return to our people who will assuredly in time wean her from her faith never grandfather the girl said firmly they may beat me and persecute me but i will never deny my god they are hard people the israelites the old man said shaking his head and they are stubborn and must needs prevail against one so tender however all matters are in the hands of god who will again reveal himself in his due time to his people who have forgotten him amuba looking at the girl thought that she had more power of resistance than the old man gave her credit for her face was of the same style of beauty as that of some of the young women he had seen in the villages of the israelites but of a higher and finer type her face was almost oval with soft black hair and delicately marked eyebrows running almost in a straight line below her forehead her eyes were large and soft with long lashes veiling them but there was a firmness about the lips and chin that spoke of a determined will and gave strength to her declaration never there was silence a moment and then chebron said almost timidly my father although high priest of osiris is not a bigot in his religion he is wise and learned and views all things temperately as my friends here can tell you he knows of your religion for i have heard him say that when they first came into this land the israelites worshipped one god only i have a sister who is of about the same age as ruth and is gentle and kind i am sure that if i ask my father he will take your grandchild into his household to be a friend and companion to misa and i am certain that he would never try to shake her religion but would let her worship as she chooses the old man looked fixedly at chebron your speech is pleasant and kind young sir and your voice has an honest ring a few years back i would have said that i would rather the maiden were dead than a handmaid in the house of an egyptian but as death approaches we see things differently and it may be that she would be better there than among those who once having known the true god have forgotten him and taken to the worship of idols i have always prayed and believed that god would raise up protectors for ruth and it seems to me now that the way you have been brought hither in these latter days of my life is the answer to my prayer ruth my child you have heard the offer and it is for you to decide will you go with this young egyptian lord and serve his sister as a handmaiden or will you return to the villages of our people ruth had risen to her feet now and was looking earnestly at chebron then her eyes turned to the faces of amuba and jethro and then slowly went back again to chebron i believe that god has chosen for me she said at last and has sent them here not only to save my life but to be protectors to me their faces are all honest and good if the father of this youth will receive me i will when you leave me go and be the handmaid of his daughter it is well the old man said now i am ready to depart for my prayers have been heard may god deal with you and yours egyptian even as you deal with my child may it be so chebron replied reverently i can tell you jethro said to the old man that in no household in egypt could your daughter be happier than in that of ameres he is the lord and master of amuba and myself and yet as you see his son treats us not as servants but as friends ameres is one of the kindest of men and as to his daughter misa whose special attendant i am i would lay down my life to shield her from harm your grandchild could not be in better hands as to her religion although ameres has often questioned amuba and myself respecting the gods of our people he has never once shown the slightest desire that we should abandon them for those of egypt and now chebron said we will leave you for doubtless the excitement has wearied you and ruth needs rest and quiet after her fright we are encamped a mile away near the lake and will come and see you to-morrow not a word was spoken for some time after they left the house, and then Chebron said, 
it really would almost seem as if what that old man said was true and that his god had sent us there that a protector might be found for his daughter it was certainly strange that we should happen to be within sound of her voice when she was seized by that crocodile and be able to rescue her just in time it needed you see first that we should be there then that the crocodile should seize her at that moment and lastly that we should be just in time to save her being dragged into the river a crocodile might have carried her away ten thousand times without any one being within reach to save her and the chances were enormously against any one who did save her being in a position to offer her a suitable home at her grandfather's death it is certainly strange you do not think that your father will have any objection to take her amuba asked oh no he may say that he does not want any more servants in the house but i am sure that when he sees her he will be pleased to have such a companion for misa if it was my mother i do not know most likely she would say no but when she hears that it has all been settled she will not trouble one way or the other about it i will write my father a letter telling him all about it and send off one of the slaves with it at once he can get back to-morrow and it will gladden the old man's heart to know that it is all arranged i wish to tell my father too of my trouble what trouble amuba asked in surprise you have told me nothing about anything troubling you do you not understand amuba i am in trouble because i struck the crocodile it is an impious action and yet what could i do amuba repressed an inclination to smile you could do nothing else chebron for there was no time to mince matters he was going too fast for you to explain to him that he was doing wrong in carrying off a girl and you therefore took the only means in your power of stopping him besides the blow you dealt him did him no injury whatever it was jethro and the hunter who killed him but had i not delayed his flight they could not have done so that is true enough chebron but in that case he would have reached the water with his burden and devoured her at his leisure unless you think that his life is of much more importance than hers i cannot see that you have anything to reproach yourself with you do not understand me amuba chebron said pettishly of course i do not think that the life of an ordinary animal is of as much importance as that of a human being but the crocodiles are sacred and misfortune falls upon those who injure them then in that case chebron misfortune must fall very heavily on the inhabitants of those districts where the crocodile is killed wherever he is found i have not heard that pestilence and famine visit those parts of egypt with more frequency than they do the districts where the crocodile is venerated chebron made no answer what amuba said was doubtless true but upon the other hand he had always been taught that the crocodile was sacred and if so he could not account for the impunity with which these creatures were destroyed in other parts of egypt it was another of the puzzles that he so constantly met with after a long pause he replied it may seem to be as you say but you see amuba there are some gods specially worshipped in one district others in another in the district that a god specially protects he would naturally be indignant were the animals sacred to him to be slain while he might pay no heed to the doings in those parts in which he is little concerned in that case chebron you can clearly set your mind at rest let us allow that it is wrong to kill a crocodile in the district in which he is sacred and where a god is concerned about his welfare but that no evil consequences can follow the slaying of him in districts in which he is not sacred and where his god as you say feels little interest in him i hope that it is so amuba and that as the crocodile is not a sacred animal here no harm may come from my striking one though i would give much that i had not been obliged to do so i hope that my father will regard the matter in the same light i have no doubt that he will do so chebron especially as we agreed that you did no real harm to the beast is it not strange jethro amuba said when chebron had gone into the tent that wise and learned people like the egyptians should be so silly regarding animals it is strange amuba and it was hard to keep from laughing to hear you so gravely arguing the question with chebron if all the people held the same belief i should not be surprised but as almost every animal worshipped in one of the districts is hated and slain in another and that without any evil consequences arising one would have thought that they could not but see for themselves the folly of their belief what are we going to do to-morrow i do not think that it is settled we have had one day at each of the sports rabba said that to-morrow we could either go out and see new modes of fishing or accompany the fowlers and watch them catching birds in the clap nets or go out into the desert and hunt ibex chebron did not decide but i suppose when he has finished his letter we shall hear what he intends to do 
after chebron had finished his letter which was a long one he called rabba and asked him to dispatch it at once by the fleetest footed of the slaves he will get there he said before my father retires to rest if he does not reply at once he will probably answer in the morning and at any rate the man ought to be back before midday at dinner amuba asked chebron whether he had decided what they should do the next day we might go and look at the men with the clap nets chebron answered they have several sorts in use and take numbers of pigeons and other birds i think that will be enough for tomorrow we have had four days hard work and a quiet day will be pleasant and if we find the time goes slowly we can take a boat across the lake and look at the great sea beyond the sand hills that divide the lake from it beside i hope we shall get my father's answer and i should like some further talk with that old israelite it is interesting to learn about the religion that his forefathers believed in and in which it seems that he and his grandchild are now the last who have faith it will suit me very well to have a quiet day chebron for in any case i do not think i could have accompanied you my ribs are sore from the whack the crocodile gave me with his tail and i doubt whether i shall be able to walk to-morrow indeed the next morning amuba was so stiff and sore that he was unable to rise from his couch soon after breakfast the messenger returned bringing a letter from ameres it was as follows it seems to me chebron that mysa has no occasion for further attendance but as your story of this old israelite and his daughter interests me and the girl is of mysa's age and might be a pleasant companion for her i have no objection to her entering our household i should have liked to talk with the old man himself and to have heard from him more about the religion that joseph and his people brought to egypt it is recorded in some of the scrolls that these people were monotheists but although i have many times questioned israelites all have professed to be acquainted with no religion but that of egypt if you have further opportunity find out as much as you can from this old man upon the subject assure him from me that his daughter shall be kindly treated in my household and that no attempt whatever will be made to turn her from the religion she professes as to your adventure with the crocodile i do not think that your conscience need trouble you it would certainly be unfortunate to meet in upper egypt a crocodile carrying off a peasant and i am not called upon to give an opinion as to what would be the proper course to pursue under the circumstances but as you are at present in a district where the crocodile instead of being respected is held in detestation and as the people with you would probably have overtaken and slain him even without your intervention i do not think that you need trouble yourself about the knock that you gave him across his snout had i found myself in the position you did i should probably have taken the same course with respect to the girl you had best give them instructions that when the old man dies she shall travel by boat to thebes arrived there she will find no difficulty in learning which is my house and on presenting herself there she will be well received i will write at once to mysa telling her that you have found a little israelite handmaiden as her special attendant and that should the girl arrive before my return she is at once to assume that position it would not do for her to come here were her grandfather to die before we leave for home in the first place she would be in the way and in the second her features and dress would proclaim her to be an israelite the people in the villages she passed through might detain her and insist on her remaining with them or should she arrive here the fact of her departing with us might be made a subject of complaint and the israelites would not improbably declare that i had carried off a young woman of their tribe as a slave therefore in all respects it is better that she should proceed up the river to thebes as they are poor you had best leave a sum of money with them to pay for her passage by boat and for her support during the voyage i find that i shall have finished with the steward earlier than i had expected and shall be starting in about three days to inspect the canals and lay out plans for some fresh ones therefore if by that time you have had enough sport to satisfy you you had best journey back my father has consented chebron said joyously as he finished the letter i felt sure that he would still i was anxious till i got the letter for it would have been a great disappointment to the old man could it not have been managed i will go off and tell him at once i shall not want you this morning jethro so you can either stay here with amuba or do some fishing or fowling on the lake the boat is all in readiness you know chebron went off to the cottage ruth was in the garden tending the vegetables and he stopped to speak to her before entering 
i have not heard yet he said how it came about that you were seized by the crocodile i hardly know how it was she said i am in the habit of going down many times a day to fetch up water for the garden and i always keep a lookout for these creatures before i fill my jar but yesterday i had just gone round the corner of the sand hill when i was struck down with a tremendous blow and a moment afterward the creature seized me i gave a scream but i thought i was lost for there are no neighbors within the sound of the voice and my grandfather has not been able to walk for months then i prayed as well as i could for the pain and god heard me and sent you to deliver me it is not often that they go up so far from the river is it not often but yesterday we had a portion of a kid from a neighbor and were cooking it and perhaps the smell attracted the crocodile for they say that they are quick at smell and they have been known to go into cottages and carry off meat from before the fire i see you walk very lame still yes grandfather would have me keep still for a day or two but i think that as soon as the bruises die out and the pain ceases i shall be as well as ever beside what would the garden do without water my grandfather will be glad to see you my lord but he is rather more feeble than usual this morning the excitement of yesterday has shaken him she led the way into the cottage your granddaughter has told me you are not very strong to-day chebron began at my age the old man said even a little thing upsets one and the affair of yesterday was no little thing i wonder much that the agitation did not kill me i have satisfactory news to give you chebron said i yesterday dispatched a message to my father and have just received the answer and taking out the scroll he read aloud the portion in which ameres stated his readiness to receive ruth in his household and his promise that no pressure whatever should be put upon her to abandon her religion the lord be praised the old man exclaimed the very animals are the instruments of his will and the crocodile that threatened death to the child was in truth the answer sent to my prayer i thank you my young lord and as you and yours deal with my child so may the god of my fathers deal with you but she may stay on with me for the little time that remains may she not surely we should not think of taking her now my father sends instructions as to what she is to do and money to pay for her journey up the nile to thebes this is what he says and he read the portion of the scroll relating to the journey and now he said let me read to you what my father says about your religion he is ever a searcher after truth and would fain that i should hear from your lips and repeat to him all that you can tell me relating to this god whom you worship that will i with gladness my young lord the story is easily told for it is simple and not like that of your religion with its many deities chebron took a seat upon a pile of rushes and prepared to listen to the old man's story of the god of the israelites End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of the Cat of Bubastes, A Tale of Ancient Egypt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty. Chapter Eight: The Conspiracy in the Temple. For two days longer, the party lingered by the side of the lake, fishing and fowling, and then returned across the desert to the headquarters of Ameres. Two months were spent in examining canals and watercourses, seeing that the dikes were strengthened where needed, and that the gates and channels were in good repair. Levels were taken for the construction of several fresh branches, which would considerably extend the margin of cultivation. The natives were called upon to furnish a supply of labor for their formation, but the quota was not furnished without considerable grumbling on the part of the Israelites, although Ameres announced that payment would be given them for their work. At last, having seen that everything was in train, Ameres left one of his subordinates to carry out the work, and then started with his son for Thebes. A fortnight after his return home he was informed that a young female, who said her name was Ruth, wished to see him. He bade the servant conduct her to him, and at the same time summoned Chebron from his studies. The lad arrived first, and as Ruth entered presented her to his father. "'Welcome, child, to this house,' the high priest said. "'I suppose by your coming that the old man, your great-grandfather, of whom my son has spoken to me, is no more?' he died a month since my lord ruth replied but it was two weeks before i could find a passage in a boat coming hither 
chebron tell misa to come here ameres said and the lad at once fetched misa who had already heard that an israelite girl was coming to be her special attendant and had been much interested in chebron's account of her and her rescue from the crocodile this is ruth misa ameres said when she entered who has come to be with you she has lost her last friend and i need not tell you my child to be kind and considerate with her you know what you would suffer were you to be placed among strangers and how lonely you would be at first she will be a little strange to our ways but you will soon make her at home i hope i will try and make her happy misa replied looking at her new companion although the girls were about the same age ruth looked the elder of the two misa was still little more than a child full of fun and life ruth was broken down by the death of her grandfather and by the journey she had made but in any case she would have looked older than misa the difference being in manner rather than in face or figure ruth had long had many responsibilities on her shoulders there was the care and nursing of the old man the cultivation of the garden on which their livelihood depended the exchange of its products for other articles the preparation of the meals her grandfather had been in the habit of talking to her as a grown-up person and there was an expression of thoughtfulness and gravity in her eyes misa on the contrary was still but a happy child who had never known the necessity for work or exertion her life had been like a summer day free from all care and anxiety naturally then she felt as she looked at ruth that she was a graver and more serious personage than she had expected to see i think i shall like you she said when her examination was finished when we know each other a little better and i hope you will like me because as my father says we are to be together i am sure we shall ruth replied looking admiringly at misa's bright face i have never had anything to do with girls of my own age and you will find me clumsy at first but i will do my best to please you for your father and brother have been very good to me there take her away misa i have told your mother about her coming and want to go on with my reading ameres said show her your garden and animals and where she is to sleep and give her in charge of old molly who will see that she has all she wants and get suitable garments and all that is requisite before many days were over ruth had become quite at home in her new abode her position was a pleasant one she was at once companion and attendant to misa accompanying her in her walks under the escort of jethro playing with her in the garden helping her to feed the animals and amusing her when she preferred to sit quiet by telling her about her life near the lake by the great sea about the fowling and fishing there and especially about the river course close to the cottage with its hippopotami and crocodiles ruth brightened up greatly in her new surroundings which to her were marvellous and beautiful and she soon caught something of the cheerfulness of her young mistress and the laughter of the two girls was often heard rising from misa's enclosure at the further end of the quiet garden shortly after the return from their visit to lower egypt an important event took place chebron being initiated into the lowest grade of the priesthood his duties at first were slight for aspirants to the higher order who were with scarce an exception the sons of the superior priesthood were not expected to perform any of the drudgery that belonged properly to the work of the lower class of the order it was necessary to ascend step by step but until they arrived at the grade beyond which study and intelligence alone led to promotion their progress was rapid and they were expected only to take part in such services and ceremonies of the temple as required the attendance of all attached to it his duties therefore interfered but little with his studies or ordinary mode of life and he was almost as much at home as before he could now however enter the temple at all hours and had access to the inner courts and chambers the apartments where the sacred animals were kept and other places where none but the priests were permitted to enter he availed himself of this privilege chiefly of an evening all the great courts were open to the sky and chebron loved to roam through them in the bright moonlight when they were deserted by the crowd of worshippers and all was still and silent at that time the massive columns the majestic architecture the strange figures of the gods exercised an influence upon his imagination which was wanting in the daytime upon the altars before the chief gods fire ever burned and in the light of the flickering flames the faces assumed life and expression 
now and then a priest in his white linen robe moved through the deserted courts but for the most part chebron had undisturbed possession and was free to meditate without interruption he found that his mind was then attuned to a pitch of reverence and devotion to the gods that it failed to attain when the sun was blazing down upon the marble floor and the courts were alive with worshippers then strive as he would he could not enter as he wanted into the spirit of the scene when he walked in the solemn procession carrying a sacred vessel or one of the sacred emblems doubts whether there could be anything in common between the graven image and the god it represented would occur to him he would wonder whether the god was really gratified by these processions whether he felt any real pleasure in the carrying about of sacred vessels emblems and offerings of flowers he was shocked at his own doubts and did his best to banish them from his mind at times it seemed to him that some heavy punishment must fall upon him for permitting himself to reason on matters so far beyond his comprehension and he now rejoiced at what he before was inclined to regret that his father had decided against his devoting his whole life to the service of the temple sometimes he thought of speaking to his father and confessing to him that his mind was troubled with doubts but the thought of the horror with which such a confession would be received deterred him from doing so even to amuba he was silent on the subject for amuba he thought would not understand him his friend believed firmly in the gods of his own country but accepted the fact that the egyptian deities were as powerful for good or evil to the egyptians as were his own to the rebu and indeed the fact that the egyptians were so great and powerful and prevailed over other nations was he was inclined to think due to the superior power of their gods the majesty of the temples the splendor of the processions and the devoutness with which the people worshipped their gods alike impressed him and although the strangeness of the images struck him as singular he was ready to admit that the gods might take any shape they pleased thus then chebron could look for no sympathy from him and shrank from opening his mind to him nevertheless he sometimes took amuba with him in his visits to the temple the doors at all times stood open, and any could enter who chose, and had they in the inner courts met with any of the priests, Amuba would have passed unnoticed as being one of the attendants of the temple in company with Chebron. But few words were exchanged between the lads during these rambles, for the awful grandeur of the silent temple and its weird aspect in the moonlight affected Amuba as strongly as it did Chebron. At times he wondered to himself whether if he ever returned home and were to introduce the worship of these terrible gods of Egypt, they would extend their protection to the Rebu. Near the house of Ameres stood that of Tylus, a priest who occupied a position in the temple of Osiris, next in dignity to that of the high priest. Between the two priests there was little cordiality, for they differed alike in disposition and manner of thought. Tylus was narrow and bigoted in his religion, precise in every observance of ceremonial, austere and haughty in manner, professing to despise all learning beyond that relating to religion, but secretly devoured with jealousy at the esteem in which Ameres was held by the court, and his reputation as one of the first engineers, astronomers, and statesmen of Egypt. He had been one of the fiercest in the opposition raised to the innovations proposed by Ameres, and had at the time exerted himself to the utmost, to excite such a feeling against him as would render it necessary for him to resign his position in the temple. His disappointment had been intense when, owing in no slight degree to the influence of the king himself, who regarded Ameres with too much trust and affection to allow himself to be shaken in his confidence even by what he held to be the erroneous views of the high priest of Osiris, his intrigue came to nothing, but he had ever since kept an unceasing watch upon the conduct of his colleague, without, however, being able to find the slightest pretense for a complaint against him. For Ameres was no visionary, and having failed in obtaining a favorable decision as to the views he entertained, he had not striven against the tide, knowing that by doing so he would only involve himself and his family in ruin and disgrace, without forwarding in the smallest degree the opinions he held. He was thus as exact as ever in his ministration in the temple, differing only from the other performers of the sacred rites inasmuch as while they offered their sacrifices to Osiris himself, he in his heart dedicated his offerings to the great god of whom Osiris was but a feeble type or image. 
a certain amount of intimacy was kept up between the two families although there was no more liking between the wives of the two priests than between their husbands they were of similar dispositions both were fond of show and gaiety both were ambitious and although in society both exhibited to perfection the somewhat gentle and indolent manner which was considered to mark high breeding among the women of egypt the slaves of both knew to their cost that in their own homes their bearing was very different in their entertainments and feasts there was constant rivalry between them although the wife of the high priest considered it nothing short of insolence that the wife of one inferior to her husband's rank should venture to compete with her while upon the other hand the little airs of calm superiority her rival assumed when visiting her excited the deepest indignation and bitterness in the heart of the wife of tylus she too was aware of the enmity that her husband bore to Ameres, and did her best to second him by shaking her head and affecting an air of mystery whenever his name was mentioned, leaving her friends to suppose that did she choose she could tell terrible tales to his disadvantage. Ameres on his part had never alluded at home either to his views concerning religion or to his difference of opinion with his colleagues there was but little in common between him and his wife he allowed her liberty to do as she chose to give frequent entertainments to her female friends and to spend money as she liked so long as his own mode of life was not interfered with he kept in his own hands too the regulation of the studies of chebron and misa one day when he was in his study his wife entered he looked up with an expression of remonstrance for it was an understood thing that when occupied with his books he was on no account to be disturbed except upon business of importance you must not mind my disturbing you for once Ameres, but an important thing has happened nicotis the wife of tylus has been here this afternoon and what do you think she was the bearer of a proposal from her husband and herself that their son plexo should marry our misa Ameres uttered an exclamation of surprise and anger she is a child at present the thing is ridiculous not so much a child Ameres. after all she is nearer fifteen than fourteen and betrothal often takes place a year earlier i have been thinking for some time of talking the matter over with you for it is fully time that we thought of her future Ameres was silent what his wife said was perfectly true and misa had reached the age at which the egyptian maidens were generally betrothed it came upon him however as an unpleasant surprise he had regarded misa as still a child and his affections were centred in her and chebron for his eldest son who resembled his mother in spirit he had but little affection or sympathy very well he said at last in a tone of irritation very unusual to him if misa has reached the age when we must begin to think whom she is to marry we will think of it but there is no occasion whatever for haste as to plexo i have marked him often when he has been here with chebron and i do not like his disposition he is arrogant and overbearing and at the same time shallow and foolish such is not the kind of youth to whom i shall give misa the answer did not quite satisfy his wife she agreed with him in objecting to the proposed alliance but on entirely different grounds she had looked forward to misa making a brilliant match which would add to her own consequence and standing on ceremonial occasions as the wife of the high priest and herself a priestess of osiris she was present at all the court banquets but the abstemious tastes and habits of ameres prevented her from taking the part she desired in other festivities and she considered that were misa to marry some great general or perhaps even one of the princes of the blood she would then be able to take that position in society to which she aspired and considered indeed that she ought to fill as the wife of ameres high priest of osiris and one of the most trusted counsellors of the king such result would certainly not flow from misa's marriage to the son of one of less rank in the temple than her husband and far inferior in public estimation being content however that her husband objected to the match on other grounds she abstained from pressing her own view of the subject being perfectly aware that it was one with which ameres would by no means sympathize she therefore only said i am glad that you object to the match ameres and am quite in accord with you in your opinion of the son of tylus but what reason shall i give nicotis for declining the connection 
the true one of course ameres said in surprise what other reason could there be in respect to position no objection could arise nor upon that of wealth he is an only son and although tylus may not have so large an income as myself for i have had much state employment he can certainly afford to place his son in at least as good a position as we can expect for misa were we to decline the proposal without giving a reason tylus would have good ground for offence i do not suppose amense he will be pleased at fault being found with his son but that we cannot help parents cannot expect others to see their offspring with the same eyes that they do i should certainly feel no offence were i to propose for a wife for chebron to receive as an answer that he lacked some of the virtues the parents required in a husband for their daughter i might consider that chebron had those virtues but if they thought otherwise why should i be offended it is not every one who sees matters as you do ameres and no one likes having his children slighted still if it is your wish that i should tell nicotis that you have a personal objection to her son of course i will do so do not put it in that light amense it is not that i have a personal objection to him i certainly do not like him but that fact has nothing to do with my decision i might like him very much and yet consider that he would not make misa a good husband or on the other hand i might dislike him personally and yet feel that i could safely entrust misa's happiness to him you will say then to nicotis that from what i have seen of plexo and from what i have learned of his character it does not appear to me that a union between him and misa would be likely to conduce to her happiness and that therefore i decline altogether to enter into negotiations for the bringing about of such a marriage amense was well pleased for she felt that this message given in her husband's name would be a great rebuff for her rival and would far more than counterbalance the many triumphs she had gained over her by the recital of the number of banquets and entertainments in which she had taken part had amense been present when nicotis informed tylus of the refusal of their proposal for the hand of misa she might have felt that even the satisfaction of mortifying a rival may be dearly purchased you know the woman tylus and can picture to yourself the air of insolence with which she declined our proposal i wished at the moment we had been peasants wives instead of ladies of quality i would have given her cause to regret her insolence for a long time as it was it was as much as i could do to restrain myself and to smile and say that perhaps after all the young people were not as well suited for each other as could be wished and that we had only yielded to the wishes of plexo having in our mind another alliance which would in every respect be more advantageous of course she replied that she was glad to hear it but she could not but know that i was lying for the lotus flower i was holding in my hand trembled with the rage that devoured me and it was as you say against plexo personally that the objection was made tylus said gloomily so she seemed to say of course she would not tell me that she had set her mind on her daughter marrying one of the royal princes though it is like enough that such is her thought for the woman is pushing and ambitious enough for anything she only said in a formal sort of way that while the alliance between the two families would naturally be most agreeable to them her husband was of opinion that the dispositions of the young people were wholly dissimilar and that he feared such a union would not be for the happiness of either and that having perhaps peculiar ideas as to the necessity for husband and wife being of one mind in all matters he thought it better that the idea should be abandoned i had a mind to tell her that ameres did not seem to have acted upon those ideas in his own case for every one knows that he and amense have not a thought in common that she goes her way and he goes his let them both beware tylus said they shall learn that we are not to be insulted with impunity this ameres whom the people regard as so holy is at heart a despiser of the gods had he not been a favorite of thotmes he would ere now have been disgraced and degraded and i should be high priest in his place for his son necho is too young for such a dignity but he is ascending in the scale and every year that his father lives and holds office he will come more and more to be looked upon as his natural successor a few more years and my chance will be extinguished then nicotis said decidedly ameres must not hold office for many more years we have talked the matter over and over again and you have always promised me that some day i should be the wife of the high priest and that plexo should stand first in the succession of the office it is high time that you carried your promises into effect 
it is time nicotis this man has too long insulted the gods by ministering at their services when in his heart he was false to them it shall be so no longer this last insult to us decides me had he agreed to our proposal i would have laid aside my own claims and with my influence could have secured that plexo as his son-in-law should succeed rather than that shallow-brained fool necco he has refused the offer and he must bear the consequences i have been too patient i will be so no longer but will act i have a strong party among the upper priesthood who have long been of my opinion that ameres is a disgrace to our caste and a danger to our religion they will join me heart and soul for they feel with me that his position as high priest is an outrage to the gods ask me no questions nicotis but be assured that my promises shall be kept i will be high priest plexo shall marry this child he fancies for his doing so will not only strengthen my position but render his own succession secure by silencing those who might at my death seek to bring back the succession to necco that is well tylus i have long wondered that you were content to be lorded over by ameres if i can aid you in any way be sure that i will do so by the way amense invited us to a banquet she is about to give next week shall we accept the invitation certainly we must not show that we are in any way offended at what has passed as far as ameres himself is concerned it matters not for the man has so good an opinion of himself that nothing could persuade him that he has enemies but it would not do in view of what i have resolved upon that any other should entertain the slightest suspicion that there exists any ill feeling between us great preparations were made by amense for the banquet on the following week for she had resolved that this should completely eclipse the entertainments of nicotis ameres had as usual left everything in her hands and she spared no expense for a day or two previous large supplies of food arrived from the farm and from the markets in the city and early on the morning of the entertainment a host of professional cooks arrived to prepare the dinner the head cooks superintended their labors the meat consisted of beef and goose ibex gazelle and oryx for although large flocks of sheep were kept for their wool the flesh was not eaten by the egyptians there were besides great numbers of ducks quails and other small fowl the chief cooks superintended the cutting up of the meat and the selection of the different joints for boiling or roasting one servant worked with his feet a bellows raising the fire to the required heat another skimmed the boiling cauldrons with a spoon and a third pounded salt pepper and other ingredients in a large mortar bakers and confectioners made light bread and pastry the former being made in the form of rolls sprinkled at the top with caraway and other seeds the confectionery was made of fruit and other ingredients mixed with dough and this was formed by a skilful workman into various artistic shapes such as recumbent oxen vases temples and other forms besides the meats there was an abundance of the most delicate kinds of fish when the hour of noon approached ameres and amense took their seats on two chairs at the upper end of the chief apartment and as the guests arrived each came up to them to receive their welcome when all had arrived the women took their places on chairs at the one side of the hall the men on the other then servants brought in tables piled up with dishes containing the viands and in some cases filled with fruits and decorated with flowers and ranged them down the centre of the room cups of wine were then handed round to the guests lotus flowers presented to them to hold in their hands and garlands of flowers placed round their necks stands each containing a number of jars of wine stoppered with heads of wheat and decked with garlands were ranged about the room many small tables were now brought in and round these the guests took their seats upon low stools and chairs the women occupying those on one side of the room the men those on the other the servants now placed the dishes on the small tables male attendants waiting on the men while the women were served by females egyptians were unacquainted with the use of knives and forks the joints being cut up by the attendants into small pieces and the guests helping themselves from the dishes with the aid of pieces of bread held between the fingers vegetables formed a large part of the meal the meats being mixed with them to serve as flavoring for in so hot a climate a vegetable diet is far more healthy than one composed principally of meat while the meal was proceeding a party of female musicians seated on the ground in one corner of the room played and sang the banquet lasted for a long time the number of dishes served being very large 
when it was half over the figure of a mummy of about three feet in length was brought round and presented to each guest in succession as a reminder of the uncertainty of existence but as all present were accustomed to this ceremony it had but little effect and the sound of conversation and laughter although checked for a moment broke out again as soon as the figure was removed wine of many kinds was served during the dinner the women as well as the men partaking of it when all was concluded servants brought round golden basins with perfumed water and napkins and the guests removed from their fingers the gravy that even with the daintiest care in feeding could not be altogether escaped then the small tables and stools were removed and the guests took their places on the chairs along the sides of the room then parties of male and female dancers by turn came in and performed female acrobats and tumblers then entered and went through a variety of performances and jugglers showed feats of dexterity with balls and other tricks while the musicians of various nationalities played in turns upon the instruments in use in their own countries all this time the attendants moved about among the guests serving them with wine and keeping them supplied with fresh flowers a bard recited an ode in honor of the glories of king thotmes and it was not until late in the evening that the entertainment came to an end it has gone off splendidly amense said to ameres when all was over and the last guest had been helped away by his servants for there were many who were unable to walk steadily unaided nothing could have been better it will be the talk of the whole town and i could see nicotis was devoured by envy and vexation i do think great credit is due to me ameres for you have really done nothing toward the preparations i am perfectly willing that you should have all the credit amense ameres said wearily and i am glad that you are satisfied to me the whole thing is tedious and tiresome to a degree all this superabundance of food this too lavish use of wine and the postures and antics of the actors and dancers is simply disgusting however if every one else was pleased of course i am content you are the most unsatisfactory husband a woman ever had amense said angrily i do believe you would be perfectly happy shut up in your study with your rolls of manuscript all your life without seeing another human being save a black slave to bring you in bread and fruit and water twice a day i think i should my dear ameres replied calmly at any rate i should prefer it vastly to such a waste of time and that in a form to me so disagreeable as that i have had to endure to-day end of chapter eight chapter nine of the cat of bubastes a tale of ancient egypt this librivox recording is in the public domain the cat of bubastes by g a henty chapter nine a startling event it was some days later that chebron and amuba again paid a visit to the temple by moonlight it was well nigh a month since they had been there for save when the moon was up the darkness and gloom of the courts lighted only by the lamps of the altars was so great that the place offered no attractions amuba free from the superstitions which influenced his companion would have gone with him had he proposed it although he too felt the influence of the darkness and the dim weird figures of the gods seen but faintly by the lights that burned at their feet but to chebron more imaginative and easily affected there was something absolutely terrible in the gloomy darkness and nothing would have induced him to wander in the silent courts save when the moon threw her light upon them on entering one of the inner courts they found a massive door in the wall standing ajar where does this lead to amuba asked i do not know i have never seen it open before i think it must have been left unclosed by accident we will see where it leads to opening it they saw in front of them a flight of stairs in the thickness of the wall it leads up to the roof chebron said in surprise i knew not there were any stairs to the roof for when repairs are needed the workmen mount by ladders let us go up chebron it will be curious to look down upon the courts yes but we must be careful amuba for did any below catch sight of us they might spread an alarm we need only stay there a minute or two amuba urged there are so few about that we are not likely to be seen for if we walk noiselessly none are likely to cast their eyes so far upward so saying amuba led the way up the stairs and chebron somewhat reluctantly followed him 
they felt their way as they went and after mounting for a considerable distance found that the stairs ended in a narrow passage at the end of which was an opening scarce three feet high and just wide enough for a man to pass through this evidently opened into the outer air as sufficient light passed through to enable them to see where they were standing amuba crept out through the opening at the end beyond was a ledge a foot wide beyond that rose a dome some six feet high and eight or ten feet along the ledge come on chebron there is plenty of room for both of us he said looking backward chebron at once joined him where can we be amuba asked there is the sky overhead we are twenty feet from the top of the wall and where this ledge ends just before it gets to the sides of this stone it seems to go straight down chebron looked round him this must be the head of one of the statues he said after a pause what a curious place i wonder what it can have been made for see there is a hole here just in front of them was an opening of some six inches in diameter in the stone amuba pushed his hand down it seems to go a long way down he said but it is narrowing and removing his arm he looked down the hole there is an opening at the other end he said a small narrow slit it must have been made to enable any one standing here to see down though i don't think they could see much through so small a hole i should think chebron if this is really the top of the head of one of the great figures that slit must be where his lips are don't you think so chebron agreed that it was probable in that case amuba went on i should say that this hole must be made to allow the priests to give answers through the mouth of the image to supplications made to it i have heard that the images sometimes give answers to the worshippers perhaps this is the secret of it chebron was silent the idea was a painful one to him for if this were so it was evident that trickery was practised i think we had better go he said at last we have done wrong in coming up here let me peep over the side first amuba said it seems to me that i can hear voices below but the projection of the head prevented his seeing anything beyond returning he put his foot in the hole and raised himself sufficiently to get on the top of the stone which was here so much flattened that there was no risk of falling off leaning forward he looked over the edge as amuba had guessed would be the case he found himself on the head of the principal idol in the temple gathered round the altar at its foot were seven or eight men all of whom he knew by the whiteness of their garment to be priests listening intently he could distinctly hear their words after waiting a minute he crawled back come up here chebron there is something important going on chebron joined him and the two lying close together looked down at the court i tell you we must do away with him one of the group below said in tones louder than had been hitherto used you know as well as i do that his heart is not in the worship of the gods he has already shown himself desirous of all sorts of innovations and unless we take matters into our hands there is no saying to what lengths he may go he might shatter the very worship of the gods it is no use to try to overthrow him openly for he has the support of the king and the efforts that have been made have not in any way shaken his position therefore he must die it will be easy to put him out of the way there are plenty of small chambers and recesses which he might be induced to enter on some pretext or other and then be slain without difficulty and his body taken away by night and thrown into some of the disused catacombs it would be a nine days wonder when he was missed but no one could ever learn the truth of his disappearance i am ready to kill him with my own hands and should regard the deed as one most pleasing to the gods therefore if you are ready to undertake the other arrangements and two of you will join me in seeing that the deed is carried out without noise or outcry i will take the matter in hand i hate him with his airs of holiness and his pretended love for the people besides the good of our religion requires that he shall die there was a chorus of approbation from the others leave me to determine the time and place the speaker went on and the excuse on which we will lead him to his doom those who will not be actually engaged with me in the business must be in the precincts of the place and see that no one comes that way and make some excuse or other should a cry by chance be heard and must afterward set on foot all sorts of rumors to account for his actions we can settle nothing to-night but there is no occasion for haste and on the third night hence we will again gather here chebron touched amuba and the two crept back to where they had been standing on the ledge 
the villains are planning a murder in the very temple chebron said i will give them a fright and applying his mouth to the orifice he cried beware, beware sacrilegious, sacrilegious wretches, wretches. Your, your plots, plots shall, shall fail, fail and ruin fall, fall upon you, you. come on chebron amuba exclaimed pulling his garment some of the fellows may know the secret of this statue and in that case they will kill us without mercy if they find us here passing through the opening they groped their way to the top of the stairs hurried down these as fast as they could in the darkness and issued out from the door i hear footsteps amuba exclaimed as they did so run for your life chebron just as they left the court they heard the noise of angry voices and hurried footsteps close by at full speed they ran through several courts and apartments we had better hide amuba it will be no use trying to do that they will guard the entrance gates give the alarm and set all the priests on duty in the temple in search no come along quickly they cannot be sure that it is we who spoke to them and will probably wait until one has ascended the stairs to see that no one is lurking there i think we are safe for the moment but there are no good hiding places i think you had better walk straight to the entrance chebron your presence here is natural enough and those they post at the gates would let you pass out without suspicion i will try and find myself a hiding place i certainly will not do that amuba i am not going to run away and leave you in the scrape especially as it was i who got us into it by my rashness is there any place where workmen are engaged on the walls amuba asked suddenly yes in the third court on the right after entering chebron replied they are repainting the figures on the upper part of the wall i was watching them at work yesterday then in that case there must be some ladders with them we might get away safely let us make for the court at once but tread noiselessly and if you hear a footstep approaching hide in the shadow behind the statue listen they are giving the alarm they know that their number would be altogether insufficient to search this great temple thoroughly shouts were indeed heard and the lads pressed on toward the court chebron had spoken of the temple now was echoing with sounds for the priests on duty who had been asleep as usual when not engaged in attending to the lights had now been roused by one of their number who ran in and told them some sacrilegious persons had made their way into the temple here is the place chebron said stopping at the foot of the wall here two or three long light ladders were standing some of these reached part of the distance only up the walls but the top of one could be seen against the skyline mount chebron there is no time to lose they may be here at any moment chebron mounted followed closely by his companion just as he gained the top of the wall several men carrying torches ran into the court and began to search along the side lying in shadow just as amuba joined chebron one of the searchers caught sight of them and with a shout ran toward the ladder pull chebron amuba exclaimed as he tried to haul up the ladder chebron at once assisted him and the foot of the ladder was already many feet above the ground before the men reached it the height of the wall was some fifty feet and light as was the construction of the ladder it was as much as the lads could do to pull it up to the top the wall was fully twelve feet in thickness and as soon as the ladder was up amuba said keep away from the edge chebron or it is possible that in this bright moonlight we may be recognized we must be going on at once they will tie the short ladders together and be after us directly which way shall we go toward the outer wall as far as possible from the gate bring the ladder along taking it upon their shoulders they hurried along critical as the position was amuba could not help remarking on the singularity of the scene the massive walls were all topped with white cement and stretched like broad ribbons crossing and recrossing each other in regular parallelograms on a black ground five minutes running took them to the outer wall and the ladder was again lowered and they descended and then stood at its foot for a moment to listen everything was still and silent it is lucky they did not think of sending men to watch outside the walls when they first caught sight of us or we should have been captured i expect they thought of nothing but getting down the other ladders and fastening them together let us make straight out and get well away from the temple and then we will return to your house at our leisure we had better get out of sight if we can before our pursuers find the top of the ladder then as they will have no idea in which direction we have gone they will give up the chase after an hour's walking they reached home on the way they had discussed whether or not chebron should tell ameres what had taken place and had agreed that it would be best to be silent 
your father would not like to know that you have discovered the secret of the image chebron if it was not for that i should say you had best have told him but i do not see that it would do any good now we do not know who the men were who were plotting or whom they were plotting against but one thing is pretty certain they will not try to carry out their plans now for they cannot tell how much of their conversation was overheard and their fear of discovery will put an end for the present to this scheme of theirs chebron agreed with amuba's views and it was decided to say nothing about the affair unless circumstances occurred which might alter their intentions they entered the house quietly and reached their apartment without disturbing any of the inmates on the following morning one of the priests of the temple arrived at an early hour and demanded to see ameres i have evil tidings to give you my lord he said your son neko has this morning been killed neko killed ameres repeated it is alas but too true my lord he left the house where he lives with two other priests but a short distance from the gate of the temple at his usual hour it was his turn to offer the sacrifices at dawn and it must have been still dark when he left the house as he did not arrive at the proper time a messenger was sent to fetch him and he found him lying dead but a few paces from his own door stabbed to the heart Ameres waved his hand to signify that he would be alone, and sat down half stunned by the sudden shock. Between himself and his eldest son there was no great affection. Neko was of a cold and formal disposition, and although Ameres would in his own house have gladly relaxed in his case, as he had done in that of Chebron, the rigid respect and deference demanded by Egyptian custom on the part of sons toward their father, Neko had never responded to his advances and had been punctilious in all the observances practiced at the time except when absolutely commanded to do so he had never taken a seat in his father's presence had never addressed him unless spoken to had made his appearance only at stated times to pay his respects to him and when dismissed had gladly hurried away to the priest who acted as his tutor as he grew up the gap had widened instead of closing Ameres saw with regret that his mind was narrow and his understanding shallow, that in matters of religion he was bigoted, while at the same time he perceived that his extreme zeal in the services of the temple, his absorption in ceremonial observances of all kinds, were due in no slight degree to ambition, and that he was endeavoring to obtain reputation for distinguished piety, with a view to succeeding some day to the office of high priest he guessed that the eagerness with which neko embraced the first opportunity of withdrawing himself from his home and joining two other young priests in their establishment was due to a desire to dissociate himself from his father and thus to make an unspoken protest against the latitude of opinion that had raised up a party hostile to ameres although living so close it was very seldom that he had after once leaving the house again entered it generally choosing a time when his father was absent and so paying his visits only to his mother still the news of his sudden death was a great shock and ameres sat without moving for some minutes until a sudden outburst of cries in the house betokened that the messenger had told his tidings to the servants and that these had carried them to their mistress ameres at once went to his wife's apartment and endeavored to console her but wholly without success amense was frantic with grief although herself much addicted to the pleasures of the world she had the highest respect for religion and the ardor of neko in the discharge of his religious duties had been a source of pride and gratification to her not only was it pleasant to hear her son spoken of as one of the most rising of the young priesthood but she saw that he would make his way rapidly and would ere long become the recognized successor to his father's office chebron and mysa bore the news of their brother's death with much more resignation for the last three years they had scarcely seen him and even when living at home there had been nothing in common between him and them they were indeed more awed by the suddenness of his death than grieved at his loss when he left them ameres went at once to the house of neko to make further inquiries into the matter there he could learn nothing that could afford any clue neko had been late at the temple and had not returned until long after the rest of the household were in bed and none had seen him before he left in the morning no sound of a struggle or cry for help had been heard his death had apparently been instantaneous he had been stabbed in the back by someone who had probably been lurking close to the door awaiting his coming out 
the general opinion there and in the temple was that he must have fallen victim to a feeling of revenge on the part of some attendant in the building who on his report had undergone disgrace and punishment for some fault of carelessness or inattention in the service or in the care of the sacred animals as a score of attendants had at one time or other been so reported by necho for he was constantly on the lookout for small irregularities it was impossible to fix the crime on one more than another the magistrates who arrived soon after ameres to investigate the matter called the whole of those who could be suspected of harboring ill will against necho to be brought before them and questioned as to their doings during the night all stoutly asserted that they had been in bed at the time of the murder and nothing occurred to throw a suspicion upon one more than another as soon as the investigation was concluded ameres ordered the corpse to be brought to his own house covered by white cloths it was placed on a sort of sledge this was drawn by six of the attendants of the temple ameres and chebron followed behind and after them came a procession of priests when it arrived at the house amense and misa with their hair unbound and falling around them received the body uttering loud cries of lamentation in which they were joined by all the women of the house it was carried into an inner apartment and there until evening a loud wailing was kept up many female relatives and friends coming in and joining in the outcry late in the evening the body was taken out placed upon another sledge and followed by the male relatives and friends and by all the attendants and slaves of the house was carried to the establishment of chigron the embalmer during the forty days occupied by the process the strictest mourning was observed in the house no meat or wheaten bread was eaten nor wine served at the table even the luxury of the bath was abandoned all the males shaved their eyebrows and sounds of loud lamentation on the part of the women echoed through the house at the end of that time the mummy was brought back in great state and placed in the room which was in all large egyptian houses set apart for the reception of the dead the mummy case was placed upright against the wall here sacrifices similar to those offered at the temple were made ameres himself and a number of the priests of the rank of those decorated with leopard skins took part in the services incense and libation were offered amense and misa were present at the ceremony and wailed with their hair in disorder over their shoulders and dust sprinkled on their heads oil was poured over the head of the mummy and after the ceremony was over amense and misa embraced the mummied body bathing its feet with their tears and uttering expressions of grief and praises of the deceased in the evening a feast was held in honor of the dead on this occasion the signs of grief were laid aside and the joyful aspect of the departure of the dead to a happy existence prevailed a large number of friends and relatives were present the guests were anointed and decked with flowers as was usual at these parties and after the meal the mummy was drawn through the room in token that his spirit was still present among them amense would fain have kept the mummy for some time in the house as was often the practice but ameres preferred that the funeral should take place at once three days later the procession assembled and started from the house first came servants bearing tables laden with fruit cakes flowers vases of ointment wine some young geese in a crate for sacrifice chairs wooden tables napkins and other things then came others carrying small closets containing the images of the gods they also carried daggers bows sandals and fans and each bore a napkin upon his shoulder then came a table with offerings and a chariot drawn by a pair of horses the charioteer driving them as he walked behind the chariot then came the bearers of a sacred boat and the mysterious eye of horus the god of stability others carried small images of blue pottery representing the deceased under the form of osiris and the bird emblematic of the soul then eight women of the class of paid mourners came along beating their breasts throwing dust upon their heads and uttering loud lamentations ameres clad in a leopard skin and having in his hands the censer and vase of libation accompanied by his attendants bearing the various implements used in the services and followed by a number of priests also clad in leopard skins now came along immediately behind them followed the consecrated boat placed upon a sledge and containing the mummy case in a large exterior case covered with paintings it was drawn by four oxen and seven men in the boat amense and misa were seated 
the sledge was decked with flowers and was followed by chebron and other relatives and friends of the deceased beating their breasts and lamenting loudly when they arrived at the sacred lake which was a large piece of artificial water the coffin was taken from the small boat in which it had been conveyed and placed in the baris or consecrated boat of the dead this was a gorgeously painted boat with a lofty cabin amense misa and chebron took their places here it was towed by a large boat with sails and oars the members of the procession then took their places in other richly decorated sailing boats and all crossed the lake together the procession was then reformed and went in the same order to the tomb here the mummy case was placed on the slab prepared for it and a sacrifice with libation and incense offered the door of the tomb was then closed but not fastened as sacrificial services would be held there periodically for many years the procession then returned on foot to the house during all this time no certain clue had been obtained as to the authors of the murder upon going up to the temple on the day of necho's death chebron found all sorts of rumors current the affair of the previous night had been greatly magnified and it was generally believed that a strong party of men had entered the temple with the intention of carrying off the sacred vessels but that they had been disturbed just as they were going to break into the subterranean apartments where these were kept and had then fled to the ladders and escaped over the wall before a sufficient force could be collected to detain them it was generally supposed that this affair was in some way connected with the death of necho upon chebron's return with this news he and amuba agreed that it was necessary to inform ameres at once of their doings on the previous night after the evening meal was over ameres called chebron into his study have you heard aught in the temple chebron as to this strange affair that took place there last night i cannot see how it can have any connection with your brother's death still it is strange have you heard who first discovered these thieves last night some say that it was tylus though what he should be doing there at that hour i know not four or five others are named by priests as having aroused them but curiously not one of these is in the temple to-day i have received a letter from tylus saying that he has been suddenly called to visit some relations living on the seashore near the mouths of the nile the others sent similar excuses i have sent to their houses but all appear to have left at an early hour this morning this is most strange for none notified to me yesterday that they had occasion to be absent what can be their motive in thus running away when naturally they would obtain praise and honor for having saved the vessels of the temple have you heard anything that would seem to throw any light upon the subject i have heard nothing father but i can tell you much i should have spoken to you the first thing this morning had it not been for the news about necho chebron then related to ameres how he and amuba had the night before visited the temple ascended the stairs behind the image of the god and overheard a plot to murder some unknown person this is an extraordinary tale chebron ameres said when he had brought his story to a conclusion you certainly would have been slain had you been overtaken how the door that led to the staircase came to be open i cannot imagine the place is only used on very rare occasions when it is deemed absolutely necessary that we should influence in one direction or another the course of events i can only suppose that when last used which is now some months since the door must have been carelessly fastened and that it only now opened of itself still that is a minor matter and it is fortunate that it is you who made the discovery as to this conspiracy you say you overheard it is much more serious to my mind the sudden absence of tylus and the others would seem to show that they were conscious of guilt their presence in the temple so late was in itself singular and as you say they cannot know how much of their conversation was overheard against whom their plot was directed i can form no idea though doubtless it was a personage of high importance you do not think father chebron said hesitatingly that the plot could have been to murder necho this is what amuba and i thought when we talked it over this afternoon i do not think so ameres said after a pause it is hardly likely that four or five persons would plot together to carry out the murder of one in his position it must be some one of far greater importance necho may not have been liked but he was certainly held in esteem by all the priests in the temple you see father chebron said that tylus is an ambitious man and may have hoped at some time or other to become high priest 
neko would have stood in his way for as the office is hereditary if the eldest son is fitted to undertake it neko would almost certainly be selected that is true chebron but i have no reason to credit tylus with such wickedness beside he would hardly take other people into his confidence did he entertain such a scheme moreover knowing that they were overheard last night although they cannot tell how much may have been gathered by the listener they would assuredly not have carried the plan into execution besides which as you say no plan was arrived at and after the whole temple was disturbed they would hardly have met afterward and arranged this fresh scheme of murder no if neko was killed by them it must have been that they suspected that he was one of those who overheard them his figure is not unlike yours they may probably have obtained a glimpse of you on the walls and have noticed your priest's attire he was in the temple late and probably left just before you were discovered believing then that they were overheard and thinking that one of the listeners was neko they decided for their own safety to remove him of course it is mere assumption that tylus was one of those you overheard last night his absence to-day is the only thing we have against him and that alone is wholly insufficient to enable us to move in the matter the whole affair is a terrible mystery be assured i will do my best to unravel it at present in any case we can do nothing tylus and the four priests who are absent will doubtless return when they find that no accusation is laid against them they will suppose that the other person who overheard them whoever he was is either afraid to come forward or perhaps heard only a few words and is ignorant of the identity of the speakers indeed he would be a bold man who would venture to prefer so terrible an accusation against five of the priests of the temple i do not blame you in the matter for you could not have foreseen the events that have happened it was the will of the gods that you should have learned what you have learned perhaps they intend some day that you shall be their instrument for bringing the guilty to justice as to the conspiracy no doubt as you say the plot against whomsoever it was directed will be abandoned for they will never be sure as to how much is known of what passed between them and whether those who overheard them may not be waiting for the commission of the crown to denounce them in the meantime you will on no account renew your visit to the temple or enter it at any time except when called upon to do so by your duties the very day after neko's funeral mysa and her mother were thrown into a flutter of excitement by a message which arrived from bubastes some months before the sacred cat of the great temple there a cat held in as high honor in lower egypt as the bull apis in the thebaid had fallen sick and in spite of the care and attendance lavished upon it had died the task of finding its successor was an important and arduous one and like the bull of apis it was necessary not only that the cat should be distinguished for its size and beauty but that it should bear certain markings without these particular markings no cat could be elevated to the sacred post even if it remained vacant for years therefore as soon as the cat was dead a party of priests set out from bubastes to visit all the cities of egypt in search of its successor the whole country was agitated with the question of the sacred cat and at each town they visited lists were brought to the priests of all the cats which from size shape and color could be considered as candidates for the office as soon as one of the parties of the priests had reached thebes amense had sent to them a description of misa's great cat paukis hitherto amense had evinced no interest whatever in her daughter's pets seldom going out into the garden except to sit under the shade of the trees near the fountain for a short time in the afternoon when the sun had lost its power in Parkes, indeed she had taken some slight interest because in the first place it was only becoming that the mistress of the house should busy herself as to the welfare of animals deemed so sacred and in the second because all who saw Parkes agreed that it was remarkable alike in size and beauty and the presence of such a creature in the house was in itself a source of pride and dignity thus then she lost no time in sending a message to the priests inviting them to call and visit her and inspect the cat although as a rule the competitors for the post of sacred cat of bubastes were brought in baskets by their owners for inspection the priests were willing enough to pay a visit in person to the wife of so important a man as the high priest of osiris Amense received them with much honor, presented Misa to them as the owner of the cat, and herself accompanied the priests in their visit to the home of Misa's pets. Their report was most favorable. 
they had since they left bubastes seen no cat approaching paucis in size and beauty and although her markings were not precisely correct they yet approximated very closely to the standard they could say no more than this because the decision could not be made until the return of all the parties of searchers to bubastes their reports would then be compared and unless any one animal appeared exactly to suit all requirements a visit would be made by the high priest of the temple himself to three or four of the cats most highly reported upon if he found one of them worthy of the honor it would be selected for the vacant position if none of them came up to the lofty standard the post would remain unfilled for a year or two when it might be hoped that among the rising generation of cats a worthy successor to the departed one might be found for themselves they must continue their search in thebes and its neighborhood as all claimants must be examined but they assured amense that they thought it most improbable that a cat equal to paucis would be found some months had passed and it was not until a week after the funeral of necho that a message arrived saying that the report concerning paucis by the priests who had visited thebes was so much more favorable than that given by any of the other searchers of the animals they had seen that it had been decided by the high priest that it alone was worthy of the honor the messenger stated that in the course of a fortnight a deputation consisting of the high priest and several leading functionaries of the temple with a retinue of the lower clergy and attendants would set out from bubastes by water in order to receive the sacred cat and to conduct her with all due ceremony to the shrine of bubastes misa was delighted at the honor which had befallen her cat privately she was less fond of paucis than of some of the less stately cats for paucis from the time it grew up had none of the playfulness of the tribe but deported itself with a placid dignity which would do honor to its new position but which rendered it less amusing to misa than its humbler but more active companions amense was vastly gratified at the news it was considered the highest honor that could befall an egyptian for one of his animals to be chosen to fill the chief post in one of the temples and next in dignity to apis himself was the sacred cat of the great goddess known as basti bubastes or pasht as soon as the news was known all the friends and acquaintances of the family flocked in to offer their congratulations and so many visits were paid to misa's enclosure that even the tranquillity of paucis was disturbed by the succession of admirers and amense declaring that she felt herself responsible for the animal being in perfect health when the priest arrived for it permitted only the callers whom she particularly desired to honor to pay a visit of inspection to it end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Cat of Bubastes: A Tale of Ancient Egypt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty. Chapter Ten: The Cat of Bubastes. For several days, upon paying their morning visit to the birds and other pets in the enclosure in the garden, Chebron and Misa had observed an unusual timidity among them the wild fowl instead of advancing to meet them with demonstrations of welcome remained close among the reeds and even the ibis did not respond at once to their call they must have been alarmed at something chebron said the third morning some bird of prey must have been swooping down upon them see here there are several feathers scattered about and some of them are stained with blood look at that pretty drake that was brought to us by the merchants in trade with the far east its mate is missing it may be a hawk or some creature of the weasel tribe at any rate we must try to put a stop to it this is the third morning that we have noticed the change in the behavior of the birds doubtless three of them have been carried off amuba and i will watch to-morrow with our bows and arrows and see if we cannot put an end to the marauder if this goes on we shall lose all our pets upon the following morning chebron and amuba went down to the enclosure soon after daybreak and concealing themselves in some shrubs waited for the appearance of the intruder the ducks were splashing about in the pond evidently forgetful of their fright of the day before and as soon as the sun was up the dogs came out of their house and threw themselves down on a spot where his rays could fall upon them while the cats sat and cleaned themselves on a ledge behind a lattice for they were only allowed to run about in the enclosure when someone was there to prevent their interference with the birds 
for an hour there was no sign of an enemy then one of the birds gave a sudden cry of alarm and there was a sudden flutter as all rushed to shelter among the reeds but before the last could get within cover a dark object shot down from above there was a frightened cry and a violent flapping as a large hawk suddenly seized one of the waterfowl and struck it to the ground in an instant the watchers rose to their feet and as the hawk rose with its prey in its talons they shot their arrows almost simultaneously amuba's arrow struck the hawk between the wings and the creature fell dead still clutching its prey chebron's arrow was equally well aimed but it struck a twig which deflected its course and it flew wide of the mark amuba gave a shout of triumph and leaped out from among the bushes but he paused and turned as an exclamation of alarm broke from chebron to his astonishment he saw a look of horror on his companion's face his bow was still outstretched and he stood as if petrified what's the matter chebron amuba exclaimed what has happened has a deadly snake bit you what is it chebron do you not see chebron said in a low voice i see nothing amuba replied looking round and at the same time putting another arrow into his bowstring ready to repel the attack of some dangerous creature where is it i can see nothing my arrow it glanced off a twig and entered there i saw one of the cats fall i must have killed it two years before amuba would have laughed at the horror which chebron's face expressed at the accident of shooting a cat but he had been long enough in egypt to know how serious were the consequences of such an act better by far that chebron's arrow had lodged in the heart of a man in that case an explanation of the matter in which the accident had occurred a compensation to the relatives of the slain and an expiatory offering at one of the temples would have been deemed sufficient to purge him from the offence but to kill a cat even by accident was the most unpardonable offence an egyptian could commit and the offender would assuredly be torn to pieces by the mob knowing this he realized at once the terrible import of chebron's words for a moment he felt almost as much stunned as chebron himself but he quickly recovered his presence of mind there is only one thing to be done chebron we must dig a hole and bury it at once i will run and fetch a hoe throwing down his bow and arrows he ran to the little shed at the other end of the garden where the implements were kept bidding a careless good morning to the men who were already at work there he soon rejoined chebron who had not moved from the spot from which he had shot the unlucky arrow do you think this is best amuba don't you think i had better go and tell my father i do not think so chebron upon any other matter it would be right at once to confer with him but as high priest it would be a fearful burden to place upon his shoulders it would be his duty at once to denounce you and did he keep it secret and the matter be ever found out it would involve him in our danger let us therefore bear the brunt of it by ourselves i dare not go in chebron said in awestruck tones it is too terrible oh i will manage that amuba said lightly you know to me a cat is a cat and nothing more and i would just as soon bury one as that rascally hawk which has been the cause of all this mischief so saying he crossed the open space and entering a thick bush beyond the cat house dug a deep hole then he went into the house although having no belief whatever in the sacredness of one animal more than another he had yet been long enough among the egyptians to feel a sensation akin to awe as he entered and saw lying upon the ground the largest of the cats pierced through by chebron's arrow drawing out the shaft he lifted the animal and putting it under his garment went out again and entering the bushes buried it in the hole he had dug he leveled the soil carefully over it and scattered a few dead leaves on the top there no one would notice that he said to himself when he had finished but it's awfully unlucky it's that cat of all others then he went in carefully erased the marks of blood upon the floor and brought out the shaft took it down to the pond and carefully washed the blood from it and then returned to chebron is it the latter asked as he approached he did not say more but amuba understood him i am sorry to say it is he replied it is horribly unlucky for one of the others might not have been missed there is no hoping that now chebron seemed paralyzed at the news come chebron amuba said it will not do to give way to fear we must brave it out i will leave the door of the cat house open and when it is missed it will be thought that it has escaped and wandered away at any rate there is no reason why suspicion should fall upon us 
if we do but put a bold face upon the matter but we must not let our looks betray us if the worst comes to the worst and we find that suspicions are entertained we must get out of the way but there will be plenty of time to think of that all that you have got to do now is to try and look as if nothing has happened but how can i chebron said in broken tones to you as you say it is only a cat to me it is a creature sacred above all others that i have slain it is ten thousand times worse than if i had killed a man a cat is a cat amuba repeated i can understand what you feel about it though to my mind it is ridiculous there are thousands of cats in thebes let them choose another one for the temple but i grant the danger of what has happened and i know that if it is found out there is no hope for us you had nothing to do with it chebron said there is no reason why you should take all this risk with me we were both in the matter chebron and that twig might just as well have turned my arrow from its course as yours we went to kill a hawk together and we have shot a cat and it is a terrible business there is no doubt and it makes no difference whatever whether i think the cat was only a cat if the people of thebes considered it is a god if it is found out it is certain death and we shall need all our wits to save our lives but unless you pluck up courage and look a little more like yourself we may as well go at once and say what has happened and take the consequences only if you don't value your life i do mine so if you mean to let your looks betray us say so and stop here for a few hours till i get a good start i will tell my father chebron said suddenly and abide by what he says if he thinks it is his duty to denounce me so be it in that case you will run no risk but i don't mind running the risk chebron i am quite ready to share the peril with you no i will tell my father chebron repeated and abide by what he says i am sure i can never face this out by myself and that my looks will betray us i have committed the most terrible crime an egyptian can commit and i dare not keep such a secret to myself very well chebron i will not try to dissuade you and i will go and see jethro of course to him as to me the shooting of a cat is a matter not worth a second thought but he will understand the consequences and if we fly will accompany us you do not mind my speaking to him you could trust your life to him as to me chebron nodded and moved away toward the house for pity's sake chebron amuba exclaimed do not walk like that if the men at work get sight of you they cannot but see that something strange has happened and it will be recalled against you when the creature is missed chebron made an effort to walk with his usual gait amuba stood watching him for a minute and then turned away with a gesture of impatience chebron is clever and learned in many things and i do not think that he lacks courage but these egyptians seem to have no iron in their composition when a pinch comes chebron walks as if all his bones had turned to jelly of course he is in a horrible scrape still if he would but face it out with sense and pluck it would be easier for us all however i do not think that it is more the idea that he has committed an act of horrible sacrilege than the fear of death that weighs him down if it were not so serious a matter one could almost laugh at any one being crushed to the earth because he had accidentally killed a cat upon entering the house chebron made his way to the room where his father was engaged in study dropping the heavy curtains over the door behind him he advanced a few paces then fell on his knees and touched the ground with his forehead chebron ameres exclaimed laying down the roll of papyrus on which he was engaged and rising to his feet what is it my son why do you thus kneel before me in an attitude of supplication rise and tell me what has happened chebron raised his head but still continued on his knees ameres was startled at the expression of his son's face the look of health and life had gone from it the color beneath the bronze skin had faded away drops of perspiration stood on his forehead his lips were parched and drawn what is it my son ameres repeated now thoroughly alarmed i have forfeited my life father worse i have offended the gods beyond forgiveness this morning i went with amuba with our bows and arrows to shoot a hawk which has for some time been slaying the waterfowl it came down and we shot together amuba killed the hawk but my arrow struck a tree and flew wide of the mark and entering the cat's house killed pokis who was chosen only two days to take the place of the sacred cat in the temple of bubastes an exclamation of horror broke from the high priest and he recoiled a pace from his son 
unhappy boy he said your life is indeed forfeited the king himself could not save his son from the fury of the populace had he perpetrated such a deed it is not my life i am thinking of father chebron said but first of the horrible sacrilege and then that i alone cannot bear the consequences but that some of these must fall upon you and my mother and sister for even to be related to one who has committed such a crime is a terrible disgrace ameres walked up and down the room several times before he spoke as to our share of the consequences chebron we must bear it as best we can he said at last in a calmer tone than he had before used it is of you we must first think it is a terrible affair and yet as you say it was but an accident and you are guiltless of any intentional sacrilege but that plea will be as nothing death is the punishment for slaying a cat and the one you have slain having been chosen to succeed the cat of bubastes is of all others the one most sacred the question is what is to be done you must fly and that instantly though i fear that flight will be vain for as soon as the news is known it will spread from one end of egypt to the other and every man's hand will be against you and even by this time the discovery may have been made that will hardly be father for amuba has buried the cat among the bushes and has left the door of the house open so that it may be supposed for a time that it has wandered away he proposed to me to fly with him at once for he declares that he is determined to share my fate since we were both concerned in the attempt to kill the hawk but in that of course he is wrong for it is i not he who has done this thing amuba has done rightly ameres said we have at least time to reflect but i do not want to fly father of what good will life be to me with this awful sin upon my head i wonder that you suffer me to remain a moment in your presence that you do not cast me out as a wretch who has mortally offended the gods ameres waved his hand impatiently that is not troubling me now chebron i do not view things in the same way as most men and should it be that you have to fly for your life i will tell you more suffice for you that i do not blame you still less regard you with horror the great thing for us to think of at present is as to the best steps to be taken were you to fly now you might get several days start and might even get out of the country before an alarm was spread but upon the other hand your disappearance would at once be connected with that of the cat as soon as it became known that she is missing whereas if you stay here quietly it is possible that no one will connect you in any way with the fact that the cat is gone that something has happened to it will speedily be guessed for a cat does not stray away far from the place where it has been bred up besides a cat of such a size and appearance is remarkable and were it anywhere in the neighborhood it would speedily be noticed but now go and join amuba in your room and remain there for the morning as usual i will give orders that your instructor be told that you will not want him to-day as you are not well i will see you presently when i have thought the matter fully out and determined what had best be done keep up a brave heart my boy the danger may yet pass over chebron retired overwhelmed with surprise at the kindness with which his father had spoken to him when he had expected that he would be so filled with horror at the terrible act of sacrilege that he would not have suffered him to remain in the house for a moment after the tale was told and yet he had seemed to think chiefly of the danger to his life and to be but little affected by what to chebron himself was by far the most terrible part of the affair the religious aspect of the deed on entering the room where he pursued his studies he found jethro as well as amuba there i am sorry for you young master jethro said as he entered of course to me the idea of any fuss being made over the accidental killing of a cat is ridiculous but i know how you view it and the danger in which it has placed you i only came in here with amuba to say that you can rely upon me and that if you decide on flight i am ready at once to accompany you thanks jethro jebron replied should i fly it will indeed be a comfort to have you with me as well as amuba who has already promised to go with me but at present nothing is determined i have seen my father and told him everything and he will decide for me then he will not denounce you amuba said i thought that he would not no and he has spoken so kindly that i am amazed it did not seem possible to me that an egyptian would have heard of such a dreadful occurrence without feeling horror and detestation of the person who did it even were he his own son still more would one expect it from a man who like my father is a high priest to the gods 
your father is a wise as well as a learned man jethro said and he knows that the gods cannot be altogether offended at an affair for which fate and not the slayer is responsible the real slayer of the cat is the twig which turned the arrow and i do not see that you are any more to blame or anything like so much to blame as is the hawk at whom you shot this however was no consolation to chebron who threw himself down on a couch in a state of complete prostration it seemed to him that even could this terrible thing be hidden he must denounce himself and bear the penalty how could he exist with the knowledge that he was under the ban of the gods his life would be a curse rather than a gift under such circumstances physically chebron was not a coward but he had not the toughness of mental fibre which enables some men to bear almost unmoved misfortunes which would crush others to the ground as to the comforting assurances of amuba and jethro they failed to give him the slightest consolation he loved amuba as a brother and in all other matters his opinion would have weighed greatly with him but amuba knew nothing of the gods of egypt and could not feel in the slightest the terrible nature of the act of sacrilege and therefore on this point his opinion could have no weight jethro amuba said you told me you were going to escort mysa one day or other to the very top of the hills in order that she could thence look down upon the whole city put it into her head to go this morning or at least persuade her to go into the city if she goes into the garden she will at once notice that the cat is lost whereas if you can keep her away for the day it will give us so much more time but if ameres decides that you had best fly i might on my return find that you have both gone should he do so jethro he will tell you the route we have taken and arrange for some point at which you can join us he would certainly wish you to go with us for he would know that your experience and strong arm would be above all things needful then i will go at once jethro agreed there are two or three excursions she has been wanting to make and i think i can promise that she shall go on one of them to-day if she says anything about wanting to go to see her pets before starting i can say that you have both been there this morning and seen after them i do not mean to fly chebron said starting up unless it be that my father commands me to do so rather a thousand worlds i stay here and meet my fate jethro would have spoken but amuba signed to him to go at once and crossing the room took chebron's hand it was hot and feverish and there was a patch of color in his cheek do not let us talk about it chebron he said you have put the matter in your father's hands and you may be sure that he will decide wisely therefore the burden is off your shoulders for the present you could have no better counsellor in all egypt and the fact that he holds so high and sacred an office will add to the weight of his words if he believes that your crime against the gods is so great that you have no hope of happiness in life he will tell you so if he considers that as it seems to me the gods cannot resent an accident as they might do a crime against them done willfully and that you may hope by a life of piety to win their forgiveness then he will bid you fly he is learned in the deepest of the mysteries of your religion and will view matters in a different light to that in which they are looked at by the ignorant rabble at any rate as the matter is in his hands it is useless for you to excite yourself as far as personal danger goes i am willing to share it with you to take half the fault of this unfortunate accident and to avow that as we were engaged together in the act that led to it we are equally culpable of the crime unfortunately i cannot share your greater trouble your feeling of horror at what you regard as sacrilege for we rebu hold the life of one animal no more sacred than the life of another and have no more hesitation in shooting a cat than a deer surely your gods cannot be so powerful in egypt and impotent elsewhere and yet if they are as powerful how is it that their vengeance has not fallen upon other peoples who slay without hesitation the animals so dear to them that is what i have often wondered chebron said falling readily into the snare for he and amuba had had many conversations on such subjects and points were constantly presenting themselves which he was unable to solve an hour later when a servant entered and told chebron and amuba that ameres wished to speak to them the former had recovered to some extent from the nervous excitement under which he had first suffered the two lads bowed respectfully to the high priest and then standing submissively before him waited for him to address them i have sent for you both he said after a pause because it seems to me that although amuba was not himself concerned in this sad business it is probable that as he was engaged with you at the time the popular fury might not nicely discriminate between you 
he paused as if expecting a reply and amuba said quietly that is what i have been saying to chebron my lord i consider myself fully as guilty as he is it was a mere accident that his arrow and not mine was turned aside from the mark we aimed at and i am ready to share his lot whether you decide that the truth shall be published at once or whether we should attempt to fly ameres bowed his head gravely and then looked at his son ay father although i am ready to yield my wishes to your will and to obey you in this as in all other matters would beseech you to allow me to denounce myself and to bear my fate i feel that i would infinitely rather die than live with this terrible weight and guilt upon my head i expected as much of you chebron and applaud your decision ameres said gravely chebron's face brightened while that of amuba fell ameres after a pause went on did i think as you do chebron that the accidental killing of a cat is a deadly offence against the gods i should say denounce yourself at once but i do not so consider it chebron gazed at his father as if he could scarce credit his sense of hearing while even amuba looked surprised you have frequently asked me questions chebron which i have either turned aside or refused to answer it was indeed from seeing that you had inherited from me the spirit of inquiry that i deemed it best that you should not ascend to the highest order of the priesthood for if so the knowledge you would acquire would render you as it has rendered me dissatisfied with the state of things around you had it not been for this most unfortunate accident i should never have spoken to you further on the subject but as it is i feel that it is my duty to tell you more i have had a hard struggle with myself and have since you left me thought over from every point of view what i ought to do on the one hand i should have to tell you things known only to an inner circle things which were it known i had whispered to any one my life would be forfeited on the other hand if i keep silent i should doom you to a life of misery i have resolved to take the former alternative i may first tell you what you do not know that i have long been viewed with suspicion by those of the higher priesthood who know my views which are that the knowledge we possess should not be confined to ourselves but should be disseminated at least among that class of educated egyptians capable of appreciating it what i am about to tell you is not as a whole fully understood perhaps by any it is the outcome of my own reflections founded upon the light thrown upon things by the knowledge i have gained you asked me one day chebron how we knew about the gods how they first revealed themselves seeing that they are not things that belong to the world i replied to you at the time that these things are mysteries a convenient answer with which we close the mouths of questioners listen now and i will tell you how religion first began upon earth not only in egypt but in all lands man felt his own powerlessness looking at the operations of nature the course of the heavenly bodies the issues of birth and life and death he concluded and rightly that there was a god over all things but this god was too mighty for his imagination to grasp he was everywhere and nowhere he animated all things and yet was nowhere to be found he gave fertility and he caused famine he gave life and he gave death he gave light and heat he sent storms and tempests he was too infinite and too various for the untutored mind of the early man to comprehend and so they tried to approach him piecemeal they worshipped him as the sun the giver of heat and life and fertility they worshipped him as a destructive god they invoked his aid as a beneficent being they offered sacrifices to appease his wrath as a terrible one and so in time they came to regard all these attributes of his all his sides and lights under which they viewed him as being distinct and different instead of all being the qualities of one god as being each the quality or attribute of separate gods so there came to be a god of life and a god of death one who sends fertility and one who causes famine all sorts of inanimate objects were defined as possessing some fancied attribute either for good or evil and the one almighty god became hidden and lost in the crowd of minor deities in some nations the fancies of man went one way in another another the lower the intelligence of the people the lower their gods in some countries serpents are sacred doubtless because originally they were considered to typify at once the subtleness and the destructive power of a god in others trees are worshipped there are peoples who make the sun their god others the moon our forefathers in egypt being a wiser people than the savages around them worshipped the attributes of gods under many different names 
first eight great deities were chosen to typify the chief characteristics of the mighty one Jnumus or neuf typified the idea of the spirit of god that spirit which pervades all creation ameura the intellect of god osiris the goodness of god ta typified at once the working power and the truthfulness of god kim represents the productive power the god who presides over the multiplication of all species man beast fish and vegetable and so with the rest of the great gods and of the minor divinities which are reckoned by the score in time certain animals birds and other creatures whose qualities are considered to resemble one or other of the deities are in the first place regarded as typical of them then are held as sacred to them then in some sort of way become mixed up with the gods and to be held almost as the gods themselves this is i think the history of the religions of all countries the highest intelligences the men of education and learning never quite lose sight of the original truths and recognize that the gods represent only the various attributes of the one almighty god the rest of the population lose sight of the truth and really worship as gods these various creations that are really but types and shadows it is perhaps necessary that it should be so it is easier for the grosser and more ignorant classes to worship things that they can see and understand to strive to please those whose statues and temples they behold to fear and draw upon themselves the vengeance of those represented to them as destructive powers than to worship an inconceivable god without form or shape so mighty the imagination cannot picture him so beneficent so all-providing so equable and serene that the human mind cannot grasp even a notion of him man is material and must worship the material in a form which he thinks he can comprehend it and so he creates gods for himself with figures likenesses passions and feelings like those of the many animals he sees around him the israelite maid whom we brought hither and with whom i have frequently conversed tells me that her people before coming to this land worshipped but one god like unto him of whom i have told you save that they belittled him by deeming that he was their own special god caring for them above all the peoples of the earth but in all other respects he corresponded with the almighty one whom we who have gained glimpses of the truth which existed ere the pantheon of egypt came into existence worship in our hearts and it seems to me as if this little handful of men who came to egypt hundreds of years ago were the only people in the world who kept the worship of the one god clear and undefiled chebron and amuba listened in awestruck silence to the words of the high priest amuba's face lit up with pleasure and enthusiasm as he listened to words which seemed to clear away all the doubts and difficulties that had been in his mind to chebron the revelation though a joyful one came as a great shock his mind too had long been unsatisfied he had wondered and questioned but the destruction at one blow of all the teachings of his youth of all he had held sacred came at first as a terrible shock neither spoke when the priest concluded and after a pause he resumed you will understand chebron that what i have told you is not in its entirety held even by the most enlightened and that the sketch i have given you of the formation of all religions is in fact the idea which i myself have formed as the result of all i have learned both as one initiated in all the learning of the ancient egyptians and from my own studies both of our oldest records and the traditions of all the peoples with whom egypt has come in contact but that all our gods merely represent attributes of the one deity and have no personal existence as represented in our temples is acknowledged more or less completely by all those most deeply initiated in the mysteries of our religion when we offer sacrifices we offer them not to the images behind our altar but to god the creator god the preserver god the fertilizer to god the ruler to god the omnipotent over good and evil thus you see there is no mockery in our services although to us they bear an inner meaning not understood by others they worship a personality endowed with principle we the principle itself they see in the mystic figure the representation of a deity we see in it the type of an attribute of a higher deity you may think that in telling you all this i have told you things which should be told only to those whose privilege it is to have learned the inner mysteries of their religion that maybe i am untrue to my vows these lads are matters for my own conscience personally i have long been impressed with the conviction that it were better that the circles of initiates should be very widely extended 
and that all capable by education and intellect of appreciating the mightiness of the truth should no longer be left in darkness i have been overruled and should never have spoken had not this accident taken place but when i see that the whole happiness of your life is at stake that should the secret ever be discovered you will either be put to death despairing and hopeless or have to fly and live despairing and hopeless in some foreign country i have considered the balance of duty lay on the side of lightening your mind by a revelation of what was within my own and it is not as i have told you so much the outcome of the teaching i have received as of my own studies and a conviction i have arrived at as to the nature of god thus then my son you can lay aside the horror which you have felt at the thought that by the accidental slaying of a cat you offended the gods beyond forgiveness the cat is but typical of the qualities attributed to basti basti herself is but typical of one of the qualities of the one god oh my father chebron exclaimed throwing himself on his knees beside ameres and kissing his hand how good you are what a weight you have lifted from my mind what a wonderful future have you opened to me if i escape the danger that threatens me now if i have to die i can do so like one who fears not the future after death if i live i shall no longer be oppressed with the doubts and difficulties which have so long weighed upon me though till now you have given me no glimpse of the great truth i have at times felt not only that the answers you gave me failed to satisfy me but it seemed to me also that you yourself with all your learning and wisdom were yet unable to set me right in these matters as you did in all others upon which i questioned you my father you have given me life and more than life you have given me a power over fate i am ready now to fly should you think it best or to remain here and risk whatever may happen i do not think you should fly chebron in the first place flight would be an acknowledgment of guilt in the second i do not see where you could fly to-morrow at latest the fact that the creature is missing will be discovered and as soon as it was known that you had gone a hot pursuit would be set up if you went straight down to the sea you would probably be overtaken long before you got there and even did you reach a port before your pursuers you might have to wait days before a ship sailed then again did you hide in any secluded neighborhood you would surely be found sooner or later for the news will go from end to end of egypt and it will be every one's duty to search for and denounce you messengers will be sent to all countries under egyptian government and even if you passed our frontiers by land or sea your peril would be as great as it is here lastly did you surmount all these difficulties and reach some land beyond the sway of egypt you would be an exile for life therefore i say that flight is your last resource to be undertaken only if a discovery is made but we may hope that no evil fortune will lead the searchers to the conclusion that the cat was killed here when it is missed there will be search high and low in which every one will join when the conclusion is at last arrived at that it is irrecoverably disappeared all sorts of hypotheses will be started to account for it some will think that it probably wandered to the hills and became the prey of hyenas or other wild beasts some will assert that it has been killed and hidden away others that it has made its way down to the nile and has been carried off by a crocodile thus there is no reason why suspicion should fall upon you more than upon others but you will have to play your part carefully End of chapter 10